Section 1 of England Since Waterloo. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 1. Introductory. Part 1. England emerged from the Great War the most powerful nation in the world. Compelled by the action of the French Republic to take up arms in 1793, she had sustained the struggle almost without pause for a quarter of a century, not seldom single-handed. Again and again she had been deserted by her allies. Again and again they had been encouraged, partly by her liberal subsidies, partly by her dogged resolution, partly by her unbroken supremacy at sea, to recombine to resist the domination of the new Charlemagne. Her steadfastness, courage, and endurance at last reaped the appropriate reward. Impotent to assail English power at sea, foiled in his attempt to ruin her commerce, baffled by the national spirit which he had himself aroused in Germany and Spain, overwhelmed under Russian snows, and finally conquered by the genius of Wellington, Napoleon was at last driven into exile and Europe was at peace. The task of the soldiers ended, that of the diplomatists began. Over the settlement which they effected at Paris and Vienna, England naturally exercised a powerful influence. Her own material acquisitions seem, however, at first sight to be in commensurate with the sacrifices she had made in the common cause. Russia reaped a rich harvest in Poland and on the Baltic littoral. Austria exchanged her embarrassing heritage in the Netherlands for much coveted provinces in northern Italy. Prussia underwent a territorial readjustment which definitely determined her political destiny. Sweden was partially consoled for her losses on the Baltic, by the acquisition of Norway. The Dutch Stadtholder absorbed Belgium, and the King of Sardinia annexed Genoa. Compared with the substantial gains of her principal allies, compensations obtained by Great Britain might appear inadequate. In reality, as will presently appear, they were scarcely less pregnant with future possibilities than those of Russia, Prussia, or Austria. Her attitude in the negotiations which preceded the peace was consistent with her unselfish activities throughout the war. Her first anxiety was to secure a settlement which should be at once equitable and permanent. Captious critics are apt to assume that neither result was actually attained. It is commonly asserted that the diplomatists were inspired solely by the spirit of reaction— that they ignored the new and vital forces generated during the last twenty years, that they paid excessive deference to the convenience of rulers and too little to the rights of subjects, that they were solicitous for the principle of equilibrium, but careless as to that of nationality, in fine, that they erected a flimsy structure with unstable foundations. Criticism in the light of after events is easy. The task of the diplomatists was exceptionally difficult. Their first and most obvious duty was to erect the strongest possible barrier against a recurrence of the devastating flood from which Europe had so lately emerged. It is not pretended that they were entirely successful. The ill-assorted union of Belgium and Holland lasted only fifteen years. The territorial partition of Italy and the constitutional settlement of Germany were not destined to much greater permanence. But at least it may be claimed that the peace of Europe was not again seriously disturbed for more than a generation. Great Britain had not much personal interest in the territorial reconstruction in Europe. She retained the island of Malta as an additional guarantee for her naval supremacy in the Mediterranean, she accepted the protectorate of the Ionian Isles, which Bonaparte had intended to use as stepping stones to the east. In the northern seas she acquired Heligoland, and she employed her dominant influence to induce France to bind herself without loss of time 
to concert with the British government the most effectual measures for the entire and definitive abolition of a commerce so odious and so strongly condemned by the laws of religion and nature as the slave trade. For the rest, England sought her compensations further afield. British India, doubled in extent under the rule of Lord Wellesley, 1798 to 1805, was beginning to exert a powerful influence upon the policy of the homeland. The retention in 1815 of the Mauritius, of Ceylon, and above all of Cape Colony, was significant of this new influence. These acquisitions, although valuable in themselves, were primarily important as stages on the highway to India. The West Indies were in 1815 regarded as hardly less important than the East, and not without reason. Out of a total exports of 58,624,550 pounds, no less than 7,218,057 pounds, or a little less than one-eighth, went to the West Indies. The retention, therefore, of Trinidad, Santa Lucia, Demerara, and Essequibo meant more than the present generation is wont to realize. Substantial in amount and significant in direction, as these acquisitions undoubtedly were, no one can pretend that they afforded excessive compensation for the sacrifices which Great Britain had made during the prolonged contest with France. To many they seemed ridiculously inadequate. But be this as it may, it is at least incontestable that the war left England with prestige enormously enhanced, with power unbroken and empire extended. These things were not bought without price. If England reached in 1815 the zenith of political and military prestige, she touched the nadir of industrial dislocation and social discontentment. That a great war is invariably followed by a period of economic recoil has become a commonplace of historical generalization, but the recoil of 1815 was unprecedentedly severe and unusually prolonged. For this, there are many reasons which will demand detailed investigation later on. For the moment, it must suffice summarily to point out that the period of the Great War was coincident with that of the Industrial Revolution. Thanks to a series of remarkable mechanical inventions, England, which had for centuries been a granary and a sheepfold, was suddenly transformed into the workshop of the world. Parallel to the manufacturing revolution and practically coincident with it, there had taken place in agricultural methods changes which revolutionized the rural economy of England. Down to the outbreak of the war, more than half the parishes in the country were cultivated on the open field system, and the results as regards aggregate yield were by general consent disastrous. During the reign of George III, no less than 3,200 enclosure acts were passed and more than 6 million acres were enclosed. Improved methods of cultivation and stock breeding were introduced, farms were consolidated, capital was embarked in agriculture, and science was called in to reinforce the old rule of thumb. Thanks to this agricultural revolution, England was able not merely to feed a rapidly increasing population at home, but to export her produce to the continental countries rendered sterile and desolate by the ravages of war. Hardly less important than the revolution in manufacturing and agricultural methods was the immense development during the same period in means of communication. While Turnip Townsend and Coke of Holcomb, Elman of Glynd, Bakewell and Arthur Young, multiplied a hundredfold the productiveness of the soil, while Kay and Hargreaves, Arkwright and Crompton, Cartwright and Watt, revolutionized the textile industry. Brindley and the Duke of Bridgewater, Telford and McAdam, gave to labor a new mobility and facilitated enormously the exchange of commodities. Down to the accession of George III, 
England, in regard to means of transport, was the most backward country in Western Europe. The first Canal Act was not passed until 1755, and the roads were scandalously bad. At the date of the accession of Queen Victoria, England possessed 4,000 miles of navigable waterway. The trunk roads were improved out of recognition. Steam navigation had begun, and two lines of rail had been laid down. With the economic, social, and political results of these changes, this volume must be largely concerned. The stupendous increase of aggregate wealth, the rapid growth of population, and the significant changes in its distribution, the rise of new industries and the growth of cities, the development of means of communication, the expansion of oversea trade, these things suggest some at least of the clues which may enable the student to track the maze presented by the history of the 19th century. For the historian of this period is confronted by a task different in kind from that which impedes the student of the Middle Ages. He is baffled not by paucity, but by redundance of material. His function consequently is selective rather than accumulative. It may be well, therefore, to indicate at the outset the more important lines of development upon which, in this complicated period, attention should be concentrated. The 19th century may be summarily described as the period of democracy and empire, science and industry. It witnessed a fourfold revolution, political, social, economic, and intellectual. From the political standpoint, the period falls naturally into three great divisions, corresponding to three striking changes in the center of political gravity. The years between 1815 and 1832 witnessed the close of the rule of the aristocratic oligarchy which had governed England, and in the main with conspicuous success, for a century and a half. The Reform Act of 1832 dethroned the landed aristocracy and committed supreme power to the commercial classes. The full effect of the change was not, however, discernible for a generation. Until the death of Lord Palmerston in 1865, England continued to be governed despite an extended franchise and a radical redistribution of constituencies by a knot of great families who had ruled it since 1688. But by 1865, the era of middle-class rule was itself drawing to an end. In 1867, a second shifting of the center of political gravity occurs. By Disraeli's famous Leap in the Dark, 1867, the mass of the town artisans were admitted to the parliamentary franchise. By Gladstone's Act of 1884, the same privilege was conferred upon the rural laborers. Again, however, it will be seen that a generation had to elapse before the newly enfranchised classes found their political feet and inaugurated the era of democracy. Not until the beginning of a new reign and a new century did political supremacy effectually pass from the bourgeoisie to the manual worker nor must the importance of the press and the platform in this connection be ignored. The growth of the democratic principle was not, however, confined to the imperial government of Great Britain. A similar development is observable in the local government of the motherland and in that of the more important colonies. The reform of municipal corporations in 1835 the reintroduction of the elective principle into county government in 1888 and into district and parish government in 1894 mark the main stages in the first case, the attainment of responsible government by Canada, 1840, by the several Australasian colonies, 1850 to 1890, by the Cape Colony, 1872, and by Natal, 1893, are the most important examples of the latter. 
the advent of democracy must therefore be regarded as one of the primary interests of the period under review hardly less significant is the shifting of the centre of social and economic gravity the act of eighteen thirty two administered the coup de grace to the political ascendancy of the landed gentry the legislation of sir robert peel between eighteen forty one and eighteen forty six combined with the immense development of facilities for transport similarly put an end to their economic supremacy ascendancy passed from the owners of land to the owners of capital as it is now in turn passing from the owners of capital to the possessors of business brains and skilled hands both changes are accurately reflected in the history of legislation the owners of capital asked nothing of the state but abstention from interference a fair field and freedom from restraint but the philosophical ascendancy of bentham and the political supremacy of the manchester school were of comparatively short duration the introduction of machinery the supersession of the hand worker the development of the factory system the concentration of population in unregulated towns in a word the industrial revolution raised problems that were both new and puzzling to solve them the interference of the state was invoked and the result is seen in a long series of parliamentary statutes acts for the restraint and supervision of child labor and female labor in factories and workshops for the improvement of the sanitary conditions under which the poor live for the education of their children and for their own protection from accidents may be cited as characteristic illustrations of this tendency to the same industrial revolution we must look also for the genesis of new economic problems if as is claimed the revolution solved the problem of production it must be admitted that it accentuated if it did not create the problem of distribution so long as the household was largely self-sufficing so long as industry was organized on the domestic system so long as there was little differentiation of economic functions and the machinery of exchange was crude the problem of distribution was held in abeyance but when the landowner was parted from the capitalist the manufacturer from the farmer and both from the hand worker disputes naturally arose as to the share of the total product which each could equitably claim in such a contest the individual workman had little chance against the capitalist employer hence the necessity for the organization of labor and the initiation of collective bargaining until eighteen twenty four and in a modified degree until eighteen seventy one the law was steadily opposed to combination but economic pressure gradually wore down the resistance of legislative restraint and the legalization of trade unions forms one of the most significant chapters in the economic history of the nineteenth century trade unions however though effective as a palliative offer no permanent solution of the problem of distribution and no sound basis for industrial peace the cooperative movement has a wider scope the idea of cooperation was born in the fertile brain of robert owen but it was first embodied in successful experiment by a working-class society at rochdale in eighteen forty four as a distributive agency the cooperative movement has attained gigantic proportions and has proved an unqualified success but it has done more than provide the working classes with sound commodities at reasonable prices by its democratic system of control it has initiated thousands of working men into the mysteries of business management and has taught them the importance of the functions of capital by its automatic machinery for saving it has inculcated not merely the virtues but the possibilities of thrift but it has not solved and it cannot solve the problem of wealth distribution 
The same principle applied in a variety of forms to the difficult art of production has made a gallant effort in this direction. It were idle to pretend that it has attained in this sphere a complete or even a very large measure of success. There have been many experiments watched with sympathy by all who realize the gravity of the problem and many failures. In the simpler form of profit-sharing, some success has indeed been achieved, and even in the more complex and elaborate form of labor co-partnership, there has been more success than is commonly supposed. But progress has unfortunately been retarded by the singular reluctance of cooperators to recognize the market value of business brains. Signs are not wanting that lessons learnt in the hard school of experience are being taken to heart, that co-operators are beginning to appreciate the increasingly important part which direction plays in modern industry and to face the fact that efficient direction cannot be obtained unless the market price is paid. As soon as this truth permeates the cooperative body, we may look for rapid progress in the domain of production. Thus far, the recognition of the economic importance of the entrepreneur has been tardy, and meanwhile, a third solution of the problem has obtained increased support among the working classes, of this as of other countries. Robert Owen was the father not only of cooperation, but of English socialism. The modern socialist, however, impatiently brushes aside both cooperation and trade unionism as mere palliatives. In his view, the panacea for all social and economic ills is to be found in the nationalization of all the instruments of production, transport, distribution, and exchange. Private ownership of land, of capital, of warehouses, of machinery, of railways, steamships, canals, tramways, etc., is to cease, and industry is to be organized exclusively by the state. It would be out of place to attempt here a critical examination of this or any other proposed solution of the economic problem of the 19th century. But no history of the period can ignore either the insistent nature of the problem itself or the marked effect upon legislation and administration of the persistent effort to discover a solution. The abandonment of the dogmas of the Benthamite school the breakdown of the principle of laissez-faire, the multiplication of governmental functions, and the intrusion of the state into domains hitherto deemed sacred to the individual, this has been, for good or evil, a marked feature of the latter portion of the period under review. End of section 1. Section 2 of England since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 1 Introductory Part 2. The 19th century will, however, stand out not merely as the age of industry, but as the age of science. With the purely intellectual achievements of science, this work cannot concern itself, but no attempt, however summary, to estimate the forces which have gone to mould the destinies of modern England can fail to take account of the growth of the scientific spirit and the application of the scientific method. Science has not only permeated thought, it has influenced legislation and has revolutionized the arts of production. The whole mental outlook of the world has been profoundly modified by scientific generalizations. The results of laboratory research are applied in the workshop, and the steed of science is harnessed to the car of industry. From science it is happily an easy transition to religion. The ecclesiastical movement of the century seems to have followed three distinct but ultimately convergent directions. It is expressed first in the successful agitation for the abolition of religious tests. These tests were mainly the work of Elizabethan and Caroline statesmen, 
and their object was to associate the state with the Anglican establishment and to identify active citizenship with adherence to the Church of England. One of the most characteristic features of the legislation of the century has been the removal of the limitations thus imposed. In illustration of this tendency, it is sufficient to cite the repeal of the Test and Corporation Acts, 1828, the Catholic Relief Act, 1829, the admission of Jews to Parliament, 1858, the Education Act of 1870 with its Conscience Clause, and the Act for the Abolition of University Tests, 1871. It is not without significance that the surrender of a privileged political position by the Church of England has been coincident with a period of remarkable activity within the borders of the Church itself. The earliest years of the century witnessed a great evangelical revival which derived its chief inspiration from Cambridge. The middle period was remarkable for the neo-Catholic or Tractarian movement, which is particularly associated with Oxford. And later still, the liberal or latitudinarian view found distinguished exponents in such men as F. D. Morris, Arnold of Rugby, Dean Stanley, and Jowett. Closely connected with the last movement is the attempt, now common to all schools of theology, to apply the scientific and historical method to biblical interpretation and exegesis. Not less noteworthy is the fact that the age which witnessed the abolition of ecclesiastical tests witnessed also a complete change in the attitude of the state towards the education of the poor. Down to 1833, this was regarded as the exclusive concern of the churches. Not until that year did the state vouchsafe any assistance to the two great voluntary societies which were attempting to cope with this increasingly difficult problem. In 1839, a committee of the Privy Council was appointed to supervise the work of these societies. Not, however, for another generation did the state itself seriously undertake the function of educating the children of the poor, and by that time its educational conscience had been aroused in other directions. The appointment in 1850 of two royal commissions to inquire into the state, discipline, studies, and revenues of the universities of Oxford and Cambridge marks the real beginning of state interference with higher education, the appointment of the Public Schools Commission in 1861, and of Lord Talton's Commission in 1864, indicated similar concern as to secondary education. These topics by no means exhaust the interest and significance of the Victorian era. Constitutional, economic, social, Educational and ecclesiastical reforms must necessarily fill a large space in any volume devoted to the history of the 19th century, but they must not be permitted to engage exclusive attention nor to obscure the importance of the part played by Great Britain upon the stage of European and world politics. The Revolution of 1688 marked an important crisis in the relations of England and the continent, and during the whole of the succeeding century, 1688 to 1815, this country played a conspicuous, if not a dominating part. The accession of the Dutch Stadtholder to the English throne, the resounding victories of Marlborough and Rook, the command of the Mediterranean first asserted after the capture of Gibraltar and Menorca, active participation in the so-called wars of succession, Spanish and Austrian, a long series of defeats inflicted upon France in three several continents, above all, the leadership of many coalitions in the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, contributed to give to this country a preeminent position among the powers of Europe. 
but the essential significance of English activity during the period was missed by contemporary observers and for many generations by historical critics. It may be an hyperbole to declare with Sir John Seeley that we conquered half the world in a fit of absence of mind. Nevertheless, Seeley performed a real historical service in teaching us to scrutinize motives and estimate broad results. He reduced to order the chaos of the 18th century by showing that in the apparently disconnected and meaningless contests of that period, there was a profound and consistent tendency, and that events seemingly miscellaneous and unrelated were in reality making towards a definite and important goal. That goal was colonial empire, supremacy in India and the New World. Since 1815, the political focus has been consciously adjusted. Great Britain has tended to withdraw from interference in matters which concern Europe only, and has concentrated her attention upon questions of world politics. She has, in fact, exchanged a foreign for a colonial policy. Not one of the innumerable wars in which, since 1815, she has been engaged was really European in significance and scope. The one apparent exception, the Crimean War, is an exception which strictly proves the rule. She has fought in India, in Afghanistan, in China, in South Africa, in Egypt, in New Zealand, in Canada, in every quarter of the globe, except in Europe. If the actual fighting in the Crimean War took place on European soil, it was the Asiatic, not the European interests of Great Britain which were immediately involved. The moral of a bare recital such as this is unmistakable. The center of political gravity for the British Empire has during the 19th century unquestionably shifted. Great Britain can no longer be regarded primarily as a European power, but as the mother of a bevy of daughter lands, the president of an informal federation of free nations scattered throughout the world. The pages that follow will disclose the growth of that empire. Its history falls to an extent not generally realized within the period allotted to this volume. The Great Disruption of 1783 left us without any English colony save Newfoundland and some of the West Indian islands. The history of British Canada dates from the immigration of Loyalists from the United States in 1783, but for many years the progress of the new colony was slow, and in 1815 Englishmen and Frenchmen together numbered less than 350,000 souls. Cape Colony had become by 1815 a British possession, but not until 1820 did it begin to be a British colony. Australia, rediscovered by Captain Cook in 1768, was utilized after the loss of the 13 colonies as a penal settlement, but not until 1821 was any part of it open to free immigration. In India, the foundation of a British empire had been laid broad and deep by Clive and Warren Hastings in the 18th century, and by 1815 much of the superstructure had been raised by Cornwallis and Wellesley. But India, though an imperial asset of supreme value, never has been and never can be a British colony, a field for the expansion and multiplication of the British race. Intimately connected with British domination in India is the position which this country has been compelled to assume in Egypt. British statesmen were, however, characteristically slow to realize the connection. France perceived it long ago. So far back as 1738, a brilliant French diplomatist, D'Argenson, published a project for the reorganization of the Ottoman Empire, which included inter alia the acquisition of Egypt by France and the cutting of a canal from the Levant to the Red Sea, which should belong in common to the whole world. 
more than a century was to elapse before the idea of d'Argenson was embodied in the great enterprise of Lesseps. It is, however, worthy of note that when, in 1788, the Emperor Joseph II and the Tsarina Catherine II were meditating a partition of Eastern Europe, they suggested that Egypt should be thrown in as a sop to France. At the close of the century, Napoleon determined that the acquisition of the sop should no longer be delayed. In his campaign against Great Britain, he realized from the outset that Egypt was a vital point. Really, to destroy England, we must make ourselves master of Egypt. But England was curiously lethargic in awakening to the fact which loomed so large before the eyes of Frenchmen. In 1840, and again in 1853, Nicholas I of Russia pressed the question upon the attention of the English court and the English cabinet. In his statesmanlike diagnosis of the Eastern problem, he invariably insisted that England's interests must be safeguarded by the acquisition of Egypt. But neither in 1840 nor in 1853 would England listen to the Russian proposals based upon the recognition of this fact. The opening of the Suez Canal in 1869 revolutionized the situation. The Mediterranean, which for 400 years had been a mere backwater of commerce, rapidly regained the position it had lost. But the canal was the work not of England, but of France. In 1875, Disraeli secured for England a controlling influence in the canal by the purchase of the Khedive's shares. It was a masterstroke of policy, imperfectly appreciated at the moment, and was followed up in 1878 by the acquisition of Cyprus. At last, England was awaking from her lethargy in regard to Egypt. The critical moment arrived in 1882. France declined to share in the task of the restoration of order, the dual control was virtually abolished, and the suppression of Araby's rebellion was followed by the establishment of a thinly veiled British protectorate in 1883. In the same year, troubles broke out in the Sudan, which, after many vicissitudes and more than one tragedy, was finally conquered in 1898, apparently against the will and palpably against the initial inclination of the conqueror. Great Britain has thus been compelled, greatly to her own advantage and not less to the advantage of the people whom she rules, to assume a dominant position in Egypt and the Sudan. There remains one other topic which will demand detailed treatment in this volume. The Irish question is never very far from the surface of English politics. Ministries come and ministries go, but the Irish problem confronts them impartially. When Wellington won his victory at Waterloo, Ireland was just midway between the Union and Catholic emancipation. The Catholic agitation was crowned with success in 1829, and for ten years O'Connell gave his Whig allies their chance. They failed to take it, and in 1841, the repeal agitation was inaugurated. This culminated in the Young Ireland Rebellion of 1848. But the central fact of Irish history in the 19th century is the Great Famine of 1845 to 1846. It changed the face of the country and accentuated many problems which are still in process of solution. Among these, the most insistent is the agrarian problem, which, with rare and short intervals, occupied the attention of the imperial legislature from 1850 until the close of the century. During the 60s, the agrarian movement was complicated by the Fenian outbreak and by the successful agitation for the disestablishment and disendowment of the Anglican Church in Ireland. During the late 70s and throughout the 80s, it was closely intertwined with the Parnellite movement and the demand for legislative independence. In 
it is not pretended that the preceding analysis is in any sense exhaustive but in a period so crowded with detail it may perhaps conduce to lucidity if some emphasis is laid at the outset upon the main points to which in the pages that follow the reader's attention must be primarily directed perhaps we are as yet too near the events of the nineteenth century to see them in their true perspective or to assign to them the precise significance which in the eyes of posterity they will ultimately assume provisionally however we may hazard the conjecture that the characteristic differentia of english history since waterloo will be found in the conjoined ascendancy of science and industry in the advent of democracy and in the extension of empire end of section two Section 3 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 2. Peace Without Plenty, Political, Economic, and Social Dislocation, 1815 to 1822, Part 1. When Wellington won his victory at Waterloo, the Prince of Wales had been for nearly five years regent of Great Britain and Ireland. After more than one temporary lapse into insanity, George III had finally been bereft of reason in 1810, and since then had lived in complete retirement at Windsor under the guardianship of his devoted wife. His eldest son, now Prince Regent, was perhaps the least reputable member of a family whose common stock of virtue was not superabundant. By no means devoid of ability, not lacking in dignity, and possessed of considerable personal charm, he had nevertheless deservedly forfeited the affection and even the respect of his people. For the vindictiveness with which he pursued his wife there may have been reason, but nothing can excuse his undutiful behavior to his father or his harshness toward his only legitimate child. A shameless voluptuary, a reckless spendthrift, a hard drinker, and a confirmed gambler, his conduct was a constant embarrassment to his ministers and a terrible example to his subjects, but his correspondence with the leading statesman of the time proves that he had an ample measure of political sagacity and no little shrewdness in his judgment of men. He had received the Allied Sovereigns in 1814 with a dignity and hospitality worthy of a unique occasion, and his visits to Ireland in 1821 and Scotland in 1822 afforded evidence of his power to conciliate goodwill when he chose to exert himself to that end. But it cannot be denied that the crown lost both political power and social prestige during his reign as regent and king. The prince's early attachment to the Whigs had sensibly cooled since his accession to a position of greater responsibility and although he had opened negotiations with their aristocratic leaders in 1812, he was probably relieved when the overtures proved sterile. On Spencer Percival's death in 1812, the premiership, together with the leadership of the Tory party, had passed to Lord Liverpool. Robert Banks Jenkinson, 2nd Earl of Liverpool, belongs to a class of statesmen whom we are pleased to regard as typically English. Born in 1770 and educated at the Charter House in Christchurch, he entered Parliament as member for Rye in 1790. He served his official apprenticeship under Pitt, and his administrative experience was exceptionally large and various. Before his accession to the Premiership, he had filled all three secretaryships of state. At the Foreign Office under Addington, he was responsible for the Treaty of Amiens. He was at the Home Office under Pitt from 1804 to 1806, and again 
under the Duke of Portland from 1807 to 1809, and as secretary for the colonies and war from 1809 to 1812, he was immediately responsible for the conduct of the war in the peninsula. He was not included in the Ministry of All the Talents, but he was regarded, particularly by the King, as more than a possible candidate for the Premiership in 1807, and again when Percival was preferred to him in 1809. After Percival's assassination, there were prolonged negotiations with Wellesley and Canning on the one side, and with the Whig leaders Grenville Grey and Moira on the other. Ultimately, however, Lord Liverpool formed a government which differed little in personnel from that of his predecessor. Selected as a safe compromise in 1812, Lord Liverpool succeeded in retaining office with satisfaction to his friends and the goodwill of his opponents for no less than fifteen years. That he was ever in the front rank of English statesmen no one will affirm, but he was an admirable administrator. He filled the highest offices in the state with dignity and efficiency. He spoke with lucidity and good sense. He was conciliatory to his opponents, and he held together his own party as no one else at that time could have done. Of Lord Liverpool's colleagues, the most prominent were the Lord Chancellor and the Secretaries of State for Foreign and Home Affairs. John Scott, first Earl of Eldon, was throughout his political life a consistent and unbending Tory of the deepest hue. The younger of two remarkable brothers, he entered the House of Commons through the good offices of Lord Thurlow in 1782. He became Solicitor General in Pitt's administration in 1788, Attorney in 1793, Chief Justice of the Common Pleas in 1799, and Lord Chancellor under Addington in 1801. He held that office until after Pitt's death in 1806. To the grief of the king, he refused to be associated with all the talents, but he returned to the Woolsack under Portland in 1807 and for twenty years never quitted it. Despite former differences, he enjoyed the confidence of the regent, not less completely than that of George III, and to the end of his life was the typical representative of that school of Toryism which detested the idea of change or reform. Far inferior to the Chancellor in ability, but belonging to the same school of Toryism, was the Home Secretary Lord Sidmouth. Canning's merciless lampoons have tended to obscure the substantial merits of Dr. Addington. An admirable speaker of the House of Commons, Addington was dragged in 1801 from a position he adorned to occupy one to which he was manifestly unequal. But though he could not fill Pitt's shoes as premier, Addington was by no means the fool that contemporary satire would suggest. As Home Secretary during the critical years, 1812 to 1821, he must at least have the credit of having performed an exceedingly unpopular duty with unflinching courage and exemplary firmness. Whether he was statesman enough to comprehend causes as well as to deal vigorously with effects is a matter of dispute on which something must presently be said. Incomparably more interesting as a personality than either Sidmouth or Eldon was the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs, Robert Stewart, Viscount Castlereagh. That contemporaries should have undervalued his merits and achievements is not perhaps remarkable, for Castlereagh, with all his splendid endowments of character and intellect, was entirely lacking in personal magnetism. Stately in quiet, high-bred self-esteem, fair as the loveless of a lady's dream. Lord Lytton's lines do no more than justice to his remarkable dignity. But he had none of the arts which make for general popularity. 
himself devoid of enthusiasm and too honest to affect a quality he did not possess, he naturally failed to evoke it among his followers. He is, said Cornwallis, so cold that nothing can warm him. The very qualities which gave him his ascendancy in the councils of Europe militated against his success in the British Senate. His calm, unruffled, and passionless judgment commanded the respect of continental diplomatists. His curious lack of oratorical skill invited the sarcasm of his parliamentary opponents. But his special misfortune was that throughout his career he should have been overshadowed in popular estimation by the brilliant gifts of his great rival Canning, and posterity has been slow to correct the misapprehension of contemporaries. For a quarter of a century, Castlereagh played an important part in English politics. For ten years, he was the real ruler of England and one of the arbiters of Europe. As Chief Secretary for Ireland, he was largely responsible for the suppression of the rebellion and mainly instrumental in carrying the Act of Union. He was Secretary of State for the Colonies and War under Pitt in 1805 and again under Portland from 1807 to 1809. But his real work was done at the Foreign Office and it is by his ten years' administration of that great department that his reputation must stand or fall. Coming into office at a moment, 1812, when Napoleon's power, though threatened, was still unbroken, it was his task to maintain the European coalition during the most critical years of the whole war and to represent Great Britain in the negotiations for peace. He reached the zenith of his fame as a statesman in the year of Waterloo. The last seven years of his life, with which alone we are concerned in this volume, were not only an anticlimax in his career, they added much to his contemporary unpopularity, and they detracted seriously, though perhaps unjustly, from his posthumous fame. Such were the men to whom, at a critical time, the destinies of the country were confided. The task before them was one of appalling complexity. They were called upon immediately and simultaneously to restore equilibrium to the national finances, to relieve the pressure of taxation, to enter upon the gigantic task of liquidating the national debt, to alleviate distress and to maintain social order. And all this at a moment of slackening trade and diminishing revenue. Rarely indeed, if ever, in our history has social discontent been more pronounced or economic distress more general than in the years immediately following upon the peace of 1815. For this there were many reasons. A proverbial aphorism associates peace with plenty. Experience teaches, on the contrary, that the conclusion of a great war is invariably followed by a period of suffering and want. But never has the economic recoil of peace been so marked as in the years between 1815 and 1822. For this fact, the duration and severity of the struggle which ended at Waterloo would alone be sufficient to account. But all the effects of protracted war were, in this case, accentuated by the coincidence of an economic revolution without parallel or precedent in magnitude and scope. During the long war a new England had come into being, and it is hardly matter for surprise that rulers and ruled were alike distracted by the phenomenon, that they were slow to diagnose the unfamiliar diseases of the body politic, and slower still to devise appropriate remedies. When the French Republic declared war upon Great Britain in 1793, it had at its back a population of over 26 million souls. To oppose to this, 
the United Kingdom could command perhaps 14 million people, of whom a discontented Ireland claimed between 3 and 4 million. By 1815, the population of the United Kingdom, despite the drain of the war, had leaped up to 19 million, an increase of 35 percent in 22 years. Such an increase was without precedent in this country. Before 1751, it is believed that the largest decennial increase of population was about 3%. Between 1791 and 1801, it was 11%. Between 1801 and 1811, 14%. And between 1811 and 1821, no less than 18%. Well might the benevolent Malthus be alarmed. This phenomenal increase in population was due to the coincidence of prolonged war and economic revolution. There was a simultaneous demand for men, for the arts of war, and the arts of commerce. Artificial stimulus was followed by corresponding depression. With the peace came a secession of demand both for men and for commodities, and the market was suddenly glutted. This phenomenon was neither unnatural nor unprecedented, but in this case industrial dislocation was intensified by the peculiar conditions of the recent war. For the last twenty years, England had been the only country in Western Europe free from the devastating effects of military operations. She had consequently been called upon to supply the commercial needs of the whole world, and thanks to the recent improvements in agriculture and in manufacturing industry, she was in a position to do so. The result was seen in a totally unprecedented expansion of foreign trade. In 1792, the total imports amounted to 19,659,358 pounds, and the exports to 18,336,851 pounds. In the last year of war, imports rose to 32,987,396 pounds, while the exports reached the amazing total of 58,624,550 pounds. But England had not merely secured a virtual monopoly of manufactures, she had also become the carrier of the world. Since Napoleon's famous Berlin Decree and the British retort embodied in the orders in council, no ship could sail the seas except under the British flag. The extent to which England had become the entrepot of international trade may be gauged by the statistics of foreign and colonial produce re-exported from this country. Re-exports, which in the last year of the peace, 1792, amounted to 6,568,349 pounds, rose in the last year of war to nineteen million one hundred and fifty seven thousand eight hundred and eighteen pounds. The national resources kept pace with the expansion of trade and the growth of population. The revenue collected by Pitt in seventeen ninety two amounted to no more than nineteen million eight hundred and fifty nine thousand one hundred and twenty three pounds. The same taxes produced in the last year of the war no less than 45 million pounds. But these taxes were, of course, wholly inadequate to the service of the state. During the 23 years between 1793 and 1815, over 65 million pounds a year was, on the average, raised for public purposes, and during the last two years, the expenditure reached the appalling total of 105,943,727 pounds for 1813 and 106,832,260 pounds for 1814. An heroic effort was made 
to meet expenses as far as possible out of revenue. Thus, while in 1793 the tax revenue was, we have seen, about £20 million, by 1815 it had risen to £72,210,512, the largest sum ever raised by taxation in Great Britain until the Crimean War. But no modern state could have carried on the Napoleonic War, still less have sustained by lavish subsidies an European coalition without recourse to loans. Hence the charge for debt, interest, and management, which in 1793 amounted to less than £9,500,000, had swollen by 1815 to over £31 million. The capital sum of the debt had increased in an even more appalling degree, from £239,663,421 in the former year to £831,171,132 in the latter. Opinions differ as to the policy of Pitt and his successors at the Treasury in raising the loans required in stock of a low denomination, but on the whole, the system is generally condemned. Between 1793 and 1801, the average rate at which 3% stock was issued was £57, 7 shillings, 6 pence per 100 pounds of stock. Between 1803 and 1815, the average price obtained was £60, 7 shillings, 6 pence. Had the financiers of that day had the courage to raise money at something more nearly approaching the market price, say 5%, the burden upon the shoulders of posterity would have been sensibly lightened, and the sacrifices demanded of contemporaries not appreciably increased. Those sacrifices could not, under any circumstances, have been otherwise than heavy. Nevertheless, during the greater part of the war, they were sustained with remarkable cheerfulness. Employment was abundant, trade was advancing by leaps and bounds, High prices diffused an air of general, if delusive, prosperity, but during the last five years of the struggle the economic outlook darkened ominously. The rigors of the continental system and the British retaliations began to tell. War with the United States from 1812 to 1814 still further dislocated trade, while in Great Britain itself several bad harvests caused the price of wheat to fluctuate violently. Between 1803 and 1813, the average price of wheat was over five pounds a quarter, and in the summer of 1813, it touched 171 shillings. Before Christmas of the same year, it had dropped to 75 shillings. Among many causes which contributed to high prices and still more to violent fluctuations, one deserves special mention. Since the crisis of 1797, cash payments had been suspended at the Bank of England, and an enforced paper currency had been in circulation. As a consequence, innumerable country banks had sprung up, some of them reared upon very unstable foundations. Between 1797 and 1814, more than 700 such banks came into existence, but more than a third of them stopped payment in the critical years 1814 and 1815. Inflation of the paper currency naturally followed upon the suspension of cash payments and the multiplication of banks, but until the closing years of the war the effects were less marked than might have been anticipated. In 1810, there were 25 million pounds of notes in circulation, and the premium on gold rose to 8 pounds 7 shillings 8 pence per cent. In 1813, it rose to 29 pounds 4 shillings 1 pence, and the gold value of a 5 pound note fell to 3 pounds 10 shillings. In 1815, the premium fell to 13 pounds 9 shillings 6 pence and the gold value of a five-pound note rose, consequently, to four pounds six shillings. In 
in the face of such violent fluctuations no prudence could avert commercial ruin trade was reduced to a mere gamble and violent oscillations in prices inflicted dire hardship alike upon producer retailer and consumer it may be doubted however whether amongst all the factors which contributed to the prevailing misery there was any single one so potent as the mistaken kindness which inspired the administrators of the poor law the first half of the eighteenth century is one of the bright periods in the history of english pauperism when george the third came to the throne the total sum expended on the relief of the poor amounted to no more than one million two hundred and fifty thousand pounds or three shillings seven pence per head of the population the last twenty years of the century witnessed the legislative abolition of the workhouse test and a sensible slackening in the strictness of administration the example of the berkshire magistrates who in seventeen ninety five decided to supplement wages out of the rates was so generally followed throughout the south of england as to elevate the resolution of a local bench to the dignity of an act of parliament the notorious Speenhamland Act contained an elaborate schedule by which income was to be apportioned to family. The policy embodied in this Act has been vigorously assailed and cannot on economic grounds be defended. It stimulated population, it encouraged idleness, it depressed wages, and it rendered still harder the hard lot of the thrifty and independent laborer the seed flung carelessly broadcast at the close of the eighteenth century produced an abundant harvest of demoralization and misery in the second and third decades of the nineteenth the cost of poor relief had risen to eight shillings eleven pence per head in eighteen o three and thirteen shillings one pence in eighteen eleven the annual expenditure on poor relief which in the first year of George III's reign was £1,250,000, averaged, during the last five years of the reign, over £7 million, and the economic burden was perhaps the least of the evils this expenditure entailed. Such were the outstanding features of the situation by which the rulers of England were confronted after the conclusion of the Great War a labor market congested and dislocated, trade suddenly arrested after a period of abnormal inflation, a gigantic debt, a falling revenue, a disordered currency, a peasantry demoralized by reckless administration of relief, a populace discontented and ripe for disturbance, all classes involved in a common ruin, landlord and tenant farmer, capitalist and manufacturer banker and merchant skilled artisan and agricultural laborer to those who can attribute all the prevailing misery to the fatuous policy of a selfish oligarchy the above analysis will seem superfluously elaborate to those who refuse to accept this facile explanation and desire to trace surface effects to underlying causes it may be helpful. Certain it is that without a clear apprehension of the social and economic situation in 1815, there can be no fair criticism of the policy pursued by the government of the day and no real clue to the complex problems by which they were confronted. Under these circumstances, it was singularly unfortunate that Lord Liverpool should have committed the exchequer to Van Sittert. Despite some financial experience and much personal amiability, he was obviously unequal to the office at a time of almost unparalleled responsibility. He had neither a strong grip on economic principles nor sufficient business ability to atone for the lack of it muddle-headed as a thinker he was blundering as an administrator the leading dogma of his economic creed was a blind belief in the virtues of irredeemable paper money 
the chief plank in his financial program was the maintenance of the sinking fund even at the cost of fresh loans in the budget of eighteen sixteen van sittert had to provide for an expenditure of over sixty six million pounds apart from the property tax which stood at two shillings in the pound and yielded about fifteen million pounds a year he could reckon on receipts of over fifty eight million pounds he proposed therefore to reduce the property tax to one shilling but the opposition regarded this as a very imperfect fulfilment of repeated pledges and raised a strong protest broom whose brilliant parliamentary career dates from this time led the attack upon van sittert with extraordinary persistency and skill like his nominal leaders ponsonby and tierney broom refused the proffered remission of one shilling and demanded that as the war was over the war tax should be altogether abandoned the government was beaten by a majority of thirty-seven and van sittert deprived of his expected seven million five hundred thousand pounds was faced with a large deficit defeated on the property tax he decided to surrender as well the war malt tax an additional two shillings per bushel on malt imposed in eighteen o four this concession cost him an additional two million seven hundred thousand pounds even under these circumstances the sinking fund was sacrosanct and van sittert solved his problems by borrowing eleven million five hundred thousand pounds with one hand while he paid fifteen million pounds into the sinking fund with the other such scrupulosity might be magnificent but it was not sound finance the year eighteen sixteen is nevertheless memorable for a financial transaction of permanent significance ireland had become to all intents and purposes insolvent and it was decided that the only permanent solution of her difficulties was to be found in the consolidation of the British and Irish exchequers. This natural sequel to Pitt's political union was actually consummated in January 1817 and conferred an immense, though unappreciated, boon upon the poorer country. For Great Britain as a whole, the outlook was exceedingly gloomy, but the clouds were momentarily dispelled by the auspicious marriage of the Princess Charlotte and the success which attended the naval expedition to Algiers. On May 2nd, 1816, the Princess Charlotte Augusta, heiress to the throne, and the only legitimate grandchild of George III, was married to Prince Leopold Georg Frederick, younger brother of the reigning Duke of saxe coburg Her refusal to marry William, Prince of Orange, foiled Castlereagh's favorite project. But it did not diminish her general popularity, and her marriage to Prince Leopold was heartily acclaimed by those who hoped at no distant date to be her subjects. The House of Commons voted £60,000 for the Princess's trousseau and settled £60,000 a year upon her. In August, Lord Exmouth was dispatched in command of a large naval force to chastise the day of Algiers for a recent outrage upon the British flag and to compel him to abandon the practice of Christian slavery. The naval operations were conducted with brilliant success, the objects of the expedition were completely attained, and a death blow was given to the barbarous and piratical custom of reducing captives to slavery marriage bells and brilliant feats of arms might temporarily relieve but they could not permanently dissipate the prevailing gloom bad harvests and violent fluctuations of prices were bringing widespread ruin upon agriculturists in the hope of assisting them the legislature in eighteen fifteen prohibited the importation of wheat until the price reached eighty shillings a quarter but this afforded no relief when, as in 1816, the price fell to 52 shillings sixpence. It is easy to blame farmers for their folly in taking leases at rents calculated upon war prices, 
and to condemn landlords for extortion. But meanwhile the greatest of English industries appeared to be threatened with imminent ruin. Reports received by the Board of Agriculture in response to a circular letter issued in 1816 attest the severity of the crisis. Farmers who a few years ago were competing eagerly for farms were sending in notices to quit, and many farms were unlet. Mortgagees found it difficult to realize. Credit was collapsing. Banks were failing in all directions. Substantial farmers were becoming parish paupers. And while the producer was ruined, the consumer derived no benefit. In December 1816, wheat, which in the spring had fallen to 52 shillings sixpence, rose to 103 shillings. Agriculture had become a mere gamble. If landlords and farmers were ruined, merchants and manufacturers were in no better plight. The citizens, wrote the master of the mint, have lost all their feelings of pride and richness and flourishing fatness. Trade is gone, contracts are gone, paper credit is gone, and there is nothing but stoppage, retrenchments, and bankruptcy. Wellesley Pole did not exaggerate the gravity of the situation, nor are the causes of it obscure. The war, as we have seen, had encouraged reckless capital expenditure. Traders, as is their wont, looked no further than their noses. The inevitable happened. With the restoration of normal conditions, the continental demand for English goods rapidly slackened. Prices came down with a run. Production was paralyzed, and thousands of hands were turned adrift to swell the army of the unemployed. The crisis was particularly severe in the industries which had been stimulated by the demand for war stores. The iron and coal trades were especially depressed. Out of 34 furnaces in South Staffordshire, 24 were out of blast, and whole villages were reduced to starvation. Similar stories came from Newport, Tredegar, Mertir Tidville, and other growing towns of Monmouthshire and South Wales, whilst thousands of iron workers and colliers were suddenly thrown out of work. The natural consequences ensued. As William Coppet himself observed, when men are in distress, they are out of humor. They have not time and are not in a disposition to listen to reason. Because bread was at famine prices, the existing supplies of corn were diminished by incendiaries. Because work was scarce, machinery was smashed and factories were destroyed. From all parts of the country came reports of violence and crime. In the eastern counties there was an alarming amount of unrest and disorder. Barns and ricks were burnt to the ground, thrashing machines and other agricultural implements were publicly burned, bakers' and butchers' shops were attacked, and angry mobs demanded bread or blood. Cargoes of wheat and potatoes intended for export were seized. Immense damage was inflicted upon property, and Littleport, in the Isle of Ely, presented the appearance of a town sacked by a besieging army. Nor was the unrest confined to the agricultural counties. The Tyneside colliers, the Preston cotton weavers, the Wiltshire cloth workers, the Monmouthshire and Staffordshire iron workers, the jute workers of Dundee, all alike were in ferment demanding more employment, higher wages, and cheaper food. The agitation was not exclusively economic. It began to assume a political complexion. With the cries for more work and cheaper food, there began to mingle demands for universal suffrage and annual parliaments. Demagogues like Orator Hunt, brilliant pamphleteers like William Cobbett, added fuel to the flames, and Byron, exhausted his powers of mordant sarcasm in pouring contempt upon the government. Cobbett's political register was, at the end of 1816, reduced in price from one shilling to tuppence, and began to exercise an unbounded political influence. Political clubs sprang up like mushrooms. The Hampton Clubs, founded by Major Cartwright in 1815, began to formulate 
many of the demands afterwards embodied in the Charter. The Spencian philanthropists preached communistic doctrines to hungry mobs. In the background we can discern the more sinister figures of political conspirators and even assassins, men of the type of the Watsons and Thistlewood. In the winter of 1816, London itself was alarmed by an outbreak of disorder. On November 15th, a meeting was organized in Spa Fields, Bermondsey, to call attention to the sufferings of the distressed manufacturers, artisans, and others of the cities of London and Westminster, the borough of Southwark, and parts adjacent, and after much wild talk was adjourned to December 2nd. Rumors gained ground of an organized attack upon the government, of plots to seize the tower and the bank, and to seduce the army. Undoubtedly, there was much inflammatory language. Mobs assembled bearing tricolor badges, and men talked of a committee of public safety. On December 2nd, the adjourned meeting was held in Spa Fields. The mob, inflamed by speeches from the Watsons, made off to Clerkenwell and Smithfield, sacked a gunsmith's shop at Snow Hill, and armed with their booty, marched through Cheapside and invaded the Royal Exchange. Courageously confronted by Matthew Wood, the Lord Mayor, their further progress was arrested, and after some time order was restored. But behind the mob, serious political forces were in operation. Precisely a week after the Spa Fields meeting, the Corporation of London formally addressed the Prince Regent. They declared that, the distress and misery which for so many years has been progressively accumulating has at length become insupportable, and that the commercial, the manufacturing, and the agricultural interests are equally sinking under its irresistible pressure, and it has become impossible to find employment for a large mass of the population. They ascribed the distress and discontent to rash and ruinous wars unjustly commenced and pertinaciously persisted in, to gross extravagance in the war and peace, and above all to the corrupt and inadequate state of the representation of the people in Parliament. They begged the Regent to urge upon Parliament measures for making every practicable reduction in the public expenditure and restoring to the people their just share and weight in the legislature. The Prince Regent did not add to his popularity by the severe snub which he inflicted upon the petitioners, and as he returned from the opening of Parliament, January 28, 1817, the windows of his coach were smashed. On the reassembling of Parliament, ministers were confronted by a menacing situation. Political agitation was clearly supervening upon the social disorder arising from economic distress. Would it, under these circumstances, be wise or even possible to embark upon the path of reform? Might not concession be interpreted as weakness? Was it not imperative to begin with the restoration of social order? But would not repression drive the moderates into the arms of the extremists? The secure wisdom of posterity may suggest that the way of safety lay in a judicious combination of strong administration and timely reform, but such a policy would have demanded a precise diagnosis of the situation. No ministry could safely plunge into the sea of reform without previously ascertaining the strength and direction of the currents and cross-currents they would have to encounter. Was the country ripening for revolution? Would reform arrest or precipitate it? Were the sporadic outbreaks of disorder due to the intolerable pressure of economic distress, or evidences of a settled design to overturn the existing order? Such were the questions confronting the executive, and no fair-minded critic will be quick to blame Lord Liverpool and his colleagues if they were not answered with the assurance and wisdom which come only with a knowledge of the event. The Prince Regent's speech at the opening of Parliament, January 28th, referred to the attempts which have been made to take advantage of the distresses of the country 
for the purpose of exciting a spirit of sedition and violence. Secret committees were immediately appointed in both houses, and on February 18th and 19th their reports were laid before Parliament. The committees, after an investigation of the information at the disposal of the executive, were clearly impressed with the gravity of the situation. They held that both in London and in the provinces, notably in the manufacturing districts of Lancashire, Leicestershire, Derby, Nottingham, and Glasgow, there was clear evidence of a deliberately planned revolutionary movement. They deplored the multiplication of political clubs and societies and the dissemination of inflammatory publications which not only demanded advanced political reforms such as universal suffrage and annual elections, but aimed at the plunder and division of all property, which taught that the landowner was a monster to be hunted down and that worse than the landowners were the fund holders, rapacious creatures who take from the people fifteen pence out of every quartern loaf. In view of these reports, Sidmouth and Castlereagh had little difficulty in persuading Parliament to suspend the Habeas Corpus Act for four months, March 3rd through July 1st, and to pass further acts to prohibit the holding of seditious meetings, to prevent the seduction of the army and navy from their allegiance, and to provide for the security of the regent's person. More keenly criticized was a letter issued by Lord Sidmouth to the Lord Lieutenants, March 27th, urging the magistrates to issue warrants for the apprehension of persons charged before them upon oath with the publication of blasphemous and seditious pamphlets and writings, and to compel them to give bail to answer the charge. The circular was regarded as an insidious attack upon the liberty of the press, and though prosecutions were numerous, convictions were few. The most notorious and damaging fiasco was the prosecution on December 18th of an antiquarian bookseller named Hone, who had published certain profane parodies such as The Sinecurist's Creed. Despite the efforts of the Attorney General and Chief Justice Ellenborough to secure a conviction, Hone induced the jury to acquit him, and the popularity of the verdict was unmistakable. Meanwhile, agitation was renewed in the North and Midlands early in March. Large meetings of working men, organized in Manchester, were dispersed by the authorities, and on March 29th, some thousands of the agitators set out upon a journey to London, which, from the fact that the men carried blankets, is known as the March of the Blanketeers. The march was arrested and the men dispersed before they had got many miles out of Manchester. More serious but still abortive was an insurrection planned by a man named Brandreth in the Midlands on June 10th. Some alarm was created by the march of armed rioters in Derbyshire and Nottingham, but the rioters were easily dispersed by the yeomanry, and ringleaders were arrested and paid for their criminal folly with their lives. In consequence of these renewed disturbances, secret committees were again appointed, June 3rd, in both houses, and the committees found but too many proofs of the continued existence of a traitorous conspiracy for the overthrow of our established government and constitution and for the subversion of the existing order of society. Before the prorogation, Parliament renewed until March 1st, 1818, the suspension of the Habeas Corpus Act. End of section 3. Section 4 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 2. Peace Without Plenty, 1815-1822, to 1822, Part 2. The harvest of 1817 was an exceptionally good one, and in the autumn things quieted down. But before the year ended, the whole nation was plunged into mourning by the death and childbirth of the Princess Charlotte, November 6th, 1817. 
her death not only removed a popular princess, but rendered the succession to the crown in the direct line exceedingly precarious. Of George III's thirteen sons and daughters, not one had a legitimate child. The eldest collateral descendant, William Duke of Gloucester, was also childless. Under these circumstances, the duty of the royal dukes was obvious, and in the following year, 1818, four royal marriages were solemnized. The Duke of Clarence married the Princess Adelaide of saxe meiningen the Duke of Cambridge, the Princess Augusta of hessel cassel the Duke of Kent, the Princess Victoria of saxe coburg widow of Charles, Prince of Leiningen. While the Princess Elizabeth married Frederick, Landgrave of hesse hamburg it is significant that despite the great anxiety as to the succession, the House of Commons should have shown itself exceptionally parsimonious in making provision for the royal bridegrooms. A modest grant of £10,000 a year proposed for the Duke of Clarence was reduced to 6000 and in high dudgeon refused by him as totally inadequate. Grants of similar amount were made to the Dukes of Cambridge and Kent, in the teeth of strong opposition, while a proposal for an addition of six thousand pounds to the Duke of Cumberland, who had lately married, was actually rejected. So low had the prestige and popularity of the crown been brought by the Prince Regent and his brothers. When Parliament reassembled on January 27, 1818, the Regent was able to congratulate the country upon a marked improvement in the financial situation. A good harvest was followed by a distinct revival in trade, and that again by a subsidence of disorder. The government was able, therefore, to dispense with the exceptional powers bestowed upon the executive by the suspension of the Habeas Corpus Act. The act of the previous session lapsed on March 1st, and has never since that day been reenacted in England. It was deemed necessary, however, to obtain an act of indemnity for all those who had, in virtue of the powers conferred upon them by the Suspensory Act, detained suspects in custody or had suppressed tumultuous and unlawful assemblies. The Indemnity Act, though a natural sequel of the Suspension Act, and in accordance with precedent, was not passed without fierce debate in both houses. The necessity for such an act is a striking testimony to the way in which the principle of habeas corpus has intertwined itself with the fibres of the English Constitution. It was at this time that Parliament showed its concern for the impaired morals of the people by voting the sum of one million pounds toward the erection of new churches. At the same time, it demonstrated its steadfast adherence to the principles of Wilberforce by granting £400,000 to the Spanish government to compensate the Spaniards for their abolition of the slave trade. Having done so much for religion and humanity, Parliament could await its dissolution with serenity. Sir Francis Burdett sought to disturb its closing days by a motion in favour of universal suffrage annual parliaments, electoral districts, and vote by ballot, but he failed to secure a single vote in its favor. Parliament was dissolved on June 10th. The general election was attended with unusual excitement, over 100 constituencies being contested. The opposition could make but little impression upon the compact Tory majority but several notable fights ended in their favour. Romilly and Burdett were returned after a violent contest for Westminster. In the city, Sir William Curtis, a Tory member who had sat for 28 years, lost his seat, and three Whigs with one Tory were returned. Broom vainly attempted to win Westmoreland from the Lauters, and there were stiff fights in Wilts, Herefordshire, Devonshire, Kent, and Lincolnshire. In all, the Whigs gained about 30 votes. The recent elections plainly show 
that the people are no longer under the guidance of shallow pretenders to constitutional learning or base dealers in vulgar sedition and that even the most respectable zealots of reform have failed to estrange them from their natural leaders such was the complacent comment of a great whig organ on the results of the general election of eighteen eighteen Notwithstanding these victories in the country, the opposition was very far from being an effective parliamentary force. The Whig Party was indeed hopelessly disorganized and divided. In the House of Lords, Lord Grenville held aloof in haughty isolation. In the House of Commons, the front rank had of late been terribly thinned by the hand of death. Whitbread, to the deep regret of all good men, died by his own hand in 1815. George Ponsonby, the titular head of the Whig Party, and Horner in 1817. Sir Samuel Romilly, like Whitbread, by suicide in 1818. Tierney succeeded Ponsonby in the leadership, but Burdett and the small group of radicals owed him no allegiance, and even his nominal lieutenants were frequently in revolt. By far the ablest man in the party was Henry Broom, but his restlessness, egotism, tactlessness, and vanity, to say nothing of his unpopularity, rendered him impossible as leader. Tierney, though held up to ridicule by Creevey, was conciliatory and popular, and divided the party less than any other leader who could at the moment have been selected. When the new parliament met on January 14th, 1819, the speech from the throne reported with satisfaction a considerable and progressive improvement of the revenue. The master of the mint, Wellesley Pole, wrote in similar strain to his friend Charles Bagot, the revenue flourishes, the reductions are great, the country is quiet, and all the world is at peace. The complacency of the government was short-lived, for the year 1819 was destined to see the Peterloo Massacre and the passing of the Six Acts. But for the moment the talk was all of the currency. Sidney Smith wittily complained that he got nothing now in town but soup and bullion. On February 2nd, Tierney moved for the appointment of a committee on the state of the circulating medium and on the continuance of the Bank Restriction Act. But on the motion of the Chancellor of the Exchequer, a secret committee was preferred. Presided over by Robert Peel, and including such men as Van Sittert, Castlereagh, Canning, Tierney, Wellesley Pole, Huskisson, and Sir James Mackintosh, the committee presented its report to the House on April 5th and May 6th. Peel's reputation as a financier dates from his appointment as chairman of this remarkable committee. Born in Lancashire on February 5, 1788, he was little more than 30 at this time, the eldest son of a man who made an enormous fortune in the Lancashire cotton trade. He belonged by birth to the new aristocracy of commerce. His father, the first Sir Robert, was a first-rate businessman, a stout Tory, an enthusiastic supporter of Pitt and his policy, and a subscriber of £10,000 to the French War Fund, and the author of the first of a long series of factory acts. The elder Peel was convinced that the prosperity of England rested upon three main foundations, the Corn Laws, the Protestant Establishment, an inconvertible paper. In this creed, the younger Robert Peel was reared. Educated at Harrow and Christ Church, he was brought into the House of Commons in 1809 as member for Cashel, an Irish borough, picked up for him by his father, and burdened with only twelve constituents. Attached to the Tory party, he served his official apprenticeship as Under Secretary for War and the Colonies under Spencer Percival, and for six years, from 1812 to 1818, was Chief Secretary for Ireland in the Liverpool Ministry. In 
To Canning's chagrin, he was elected as the representative of the University of Oxford in 1817. Footnote. Peel owed his selection to the fact that he opposed, while Canning favoured, Catholic emancipation. End footnote. And in the following year, he resigned the chief secretaryship. His appointment as chairman of the Bullion Committee in 1819 was rightly regarded as an immense compliment to so young a man and marked his admission to the front rank in his party and in the House of Commons. Peel entered upon his task with an open mind. In 1810, he had voted against the proposal for the resumption of cash payments as recommended by Horner's committee, but circumstances had changed. Reference has already been made to the grave inconvenience resulting from the violent fluctuations in prices. The Bank Restriction Act was unquestionably one of the contributory causes of these fluctuations, and Peel's committee reported strongly in favor of the gradual resumption of cash payments. A masterly speech from Peel persuaded the House to a unanimous acceptance of the report. It was resolved that cash payments should be gradually resumed and that from May 1, 1823, the bank should pay its notes in gold. So strong was the position of the bank that cash payments were in fact resumed two years before the stipulated date on May 1, 1821. That the resumption inflicted some temporary hardship on individuals is not to be denied, but it is nonetheless true that few acts, if any, have contributed more powerfully to the stability of English commerce and the maintenance of English credit than the Bullion Act of 1819. This act was the only important legislative achievement of the first session of the new Parliament, but resistance to reform was clearly weakening in the House of Commons. Grattan's motion in favor of Catholic emancipation was rejected in a full house only by a majority of two, while that of Lord Archibald Hamilton, demanding a select committee to investigate the state of Scottish representation, was actually carried. On the other hand, Burdett's attempt to pledge the House to consider the question of parliamentary reform in the ensuing session was heavily defeated. Although the House of Commons declined to take the reform question seriously, the temper of the country was rapidly rising. Political agitation was, as usual, powerfully stimulated by economic distress. The improvement in trade manifested in 1818 was not maintained. Clouds again gathered on the commercial horizon. The number of bankruptcies increased ominously. Wages fell. Complaints of unemployment grew louder, and in the early summer, great meetings were held at Glasgow, Ashton-under-Lynn, Leeds, Stockport, and elsewhere. A meeting at Birmingham, held on July 12th and attended by more than 15,000 persons, adopted the novel expedient of electing Sir Charles Wolseley, a Staffordshire baronet, as legislatorial attorney and representative of Birmingham. But while the proceedings at Birmingham were tinged with farce, those at Manchester resulted in grim tragedy. On August 16th, a vast meeting took place in St. Peter's Fields, now in the very heart of the great city of Manchester. From all the neighboring districts of Lancashire and Cheshire, the men came in their thousands, many of them in regular marching order five deep all preceded by flags surmounted with caps of liberty and bearing various mottoes such as no corn laws, annual parliaments, universal suffrage, vote by ballot. The number present was roughly computed at 80,000. Hardly had the chairman Orator Hunt mounted the hustings when the yeomanry, with drawn sabres, charged into the dense throng to effect his arrest. In an instant, all was confusion. Crowds of people were trampled underfoot. Several were killed. A few were sabred to death. Three or four hundred were more or less severely injured. 
Hunt and various associates were arrested and committed for trial by the Lancashire magistrates, and after various postponements were convicted at York, not of high treason, as was originally intended, but on a charge of conspiracy to alter the legal frame of the government and constitution of these realms by force and threats, and with meeting tumultuously at Manchester with 60,000 persons armed with sticks. Hunt was sentenced to two years and six months' imprisonment, Samuel Bamford and two other defendants to a year's imprisonment. In each case they were required to find sureties to be of good behavior during a further term of five years. Meanwhile, congratulations poured in upon the victors of Peterloo. The local magistrates returned thanks to the commanders, officers, and men of all the corps who had taken part in the actions of the day, particularly expressing their gratification at the extreme forbearance exercised by the yeomanry when insulted and defied by the rioters. The regent expressed his high approbation of the exemplary manner in which the yeomanry assisted and supported the civil power, and Lord Sidmouth conveyed the message with great satisfaction. In other quarters, other views prevailed. Subscription lists were opened in London and Liverpool for the victims of the Manchester Massacre. Meetings were held at Norwich, Westminster, Bristol, Liverpool, Nottingham, and York. Some simply asked for inquiry. Others strongly censured the conduct of the Manchester authorities and the ministry. The great meeting at York was attended by Lord Fitzwilliam, who was in consequence dismissed from the Lord Lieutenancy of the West Riding. Still more significant was the action of the Common Council of London, who on September 9th asserted the undoubted right of the Englishmen to assemble together for the purpose of deliberating upon public grievances, insisted that the Manchester meeting was legally assembled and that its proceedings were orderly and peaceable, and finally expressed their strongest indignation at the unprovoked and intemperate conduct of the authorities. In view of the rising excitement of the nation, the ministry took the wise step of summoning Parliament in the autumn. It met on November 23rd, and a week later Lord Sidmouth outlined the proposals of the government. After much debate and formal protests from Lord Grey and other Whig peers, but with the entire concurrence of Lord Grenville and his friends, the six acts became law. The titles of these acts sufficiently indicate their import. They were designed, number one, to prevent delay in the administration of justice in cases of misdemeanor, number two, to prevent the training of persons in the use of arms and the practice of military evolutions, number three, for the prevention and punishment of blasphemous and seditious libels, number four, to authorize justices of the peace in certain disturbed counties to seize and detain arms, number five, to subject certain publications to the duties of stamps upon newspapers, and to make other regulations for restraining the abuses arising from the publication of blasphemous and seditious libels, and number six, for more effectually preventing seditious meetings and assemblies. Much violent criticism has been expended upon these acts, and Castlereagh in particular has been held up to the execration of posterity for the part which he took in passing them through the House of Commons. But to three out of six, the first, second, and fourth, no serious objection can be taken. The third, after remaining for some years a dead letter, was repealed in 1830. The duration of the Act for the Prevention of Seditious Meetings was expressly limited to five years, and that for the seizure and detention of arms to a little more than two. Tierney found in the proposals of the executive an evident determination to resort to nothing but force. That force is no remedy is a favorite aphorism with orators and opposition. That it is no permanent remedy is true. But it is equally true that occasions arise when its application is essential to the existence of civilized society. Whether such an occasion had arisen in 1819 is a question which the historians of today 
should be slow dogmatically to decide, at any rate against the prevailing opinion of contemporaries. Before Parliament reassembled in 1820, the longest reign hitherto recorded in English history had come to an end. Death had been busy of late in the ranks of the royal family. The Princess Charlotte died in 1817, the Queen in 1818, the Duke of Kent on January 23, 1820, and a week later, January 29th, the poor old king himself was released from his living tomb. His death evoked an outburst of affectionate loyalty from all classes of his subjects. For the last ten years, indeed, George III had been nothing more than a shade, dragging out a melancholy existence at Windsor, bereft of reason, sight, and hearing but it was not forgotten that for fifty years he had played a large if not brilliant part upon the political stage and had represented with remarkable fidelity the views not to say the prejudices of the great majority of his subjects no one can pretend that he was a great ruler but he was eminently a good man and his homely virtues and his simple life his dauntless courage and shrewd wit his untiring industry his generosity and kindliness won him general affection and respect. Little respect or affection was entertained for his successor, and whatever remnant of either sentiment survived was dissipated in the first months of the new reign. For more than a year after George the Fourth's accession, the public mind was almost exclusively occupied with the scandalous relations of the king and queen. The discussion of the queen's business, wrote Greville, is now become an intolerable nuisance in society. No other subject is ever talked of. It is an incessant matter of argument or dispute, what will be done, what ought to be done. All people express themselves tired of the subject, yet none talk or think of any other. For the moment, however, attention was diverted from the king to his ministers. On February 23rd, the country was startled by the news of the conspiracy to which for bloodthirsty folly there had been no parallel since the days of Guy Fawkes. Arthur Thistlewood and a band of fanatical associates had planned to get rid of the whole of the detested Tory cabinet at one murderous stroke. A cabinet dinner to be held at Lord Harrowby's house in Grosvenor Square on February 23rd was the occasion selected for the execution of a plot which had been long maturing. The government were in possession of complete information through one of their spies named Edwards. The ministers, instead of dining with Lord Harrowby, remained at Fife House, while the conspirators, twenty or thirty in number, were surprised in the midst of their preparations at Cato Street, Edgware Road. They offered armed resistance and slew the first constable who entered the stable where they were assembled. The police arrangements had been bungled and only nine arrests were made. The leader and fourteen associates escaped, but Thistlewood and several others were captured next morning. Brought to trial in April on a charge of high treason, all the prisoners were convicted and sentenced to death. Thistlewood and four of his accomplices were executed on May 1st. The other six were respited and transported for life. As to the guilt of the prisoners, there was and is no question. The extent of the conspiracy is more difficult to determine. Greville declares that the plan was to fire a rocket from Lord Harrowby's house after the destruction of the cabinet as a signal for a general rising, that the bank was to be attacked and the jails thrown open. Whether any such signal would have been obeyed is doubtful. The natural alarm excited by the Cato Street conspiracy was intensified in April by an insurrectionary movement in Glasgow and the neighboring districts. The organizers called upon the people of England, Scotland, and Ireland to come forward and effect a revolution by force. The force, however, was lacking, and the insurrections which took place at Bonnymuir and elsewhere were suppressed without difficulty. 
the period of lawlessness and disorder ushered in by the peace of 1815 culminated in the Cato Street conspiracy. The few remaining years of that Tory ascendancy, which had now lasted for more than half a century, were comparatively tranquil. For this there were several reasons. The worst of the economic crisis was over, and trade, abnormally stimulated by the war, was gradually restored to a more healthy condition. The reconstruction of the Liverpool Ministry in 1822 and the infusion of a more liberal element into the cabinet gave hope of reasonable and moderate reform. Some credit also must be given, though it is unfashionable to do so, to the firmness with which the principles of law and order had been vindicated by Sidmouth and Castlereagh. It was, of course, the business of the opposition to oppose, in public but in private even opponents admitted the success of their policy. Everybody agrees, wrote a strong Whig, that the doctor has done his part well. Nor must it be forgotten that in the early years of the new reign the public mind was diverted first by a court scandal of exceptional magnitude and later by absorbing questions of foreign policy. Before we can discuss the latter, a word must be said of the former. If the perspective of history were determined by contemporaries, it would be necessary to devote a whole chapter to the Queen's business. But large as this business looms in the memoirs and diaries of the day, the modern historian may compress the sordid and unsavory details into a paragraph. When the Prince of Wales in 1795 married the Princess Caroline of Brunswick, a bad man was mated to a frivolous, foolish, and unattractive woman. The marital connection hardly survived the formal marriage, and even before the birth of the Princess Charlotte, husband and wife had ceased to live together. In 1806, the Whig ministry humored their patron by appointing a secret committee to conduct a delicate investigation as to the behavior of the princess, but nothing worse than levity was proved against her, and in 1814 she withdrew to Italy. Exasperated by her exclusion from foreign courts and by the omission of her name from the English liturgy, she returned to England in June 1820 to claim her rights as queen, to annoy the king, and embarrass the ministry. Ever since the death of Princess Charlotte, her father had been increasingly anxious for a divorce, and spies had been employed to obtain the necessary evidence. On his accession to the throne, the king pressed the ministers to institute proceedings, but anxious to avoid the inevitable scandal, Lord Liverpool resisted the king's wishes, though he promised to meet them should the queen return to England. The time for the fulfillment of his promise had now come. Received by the populace with indiscriminate enthusiasm, the Queen posed as a distressed and persecuted woman. Her most valuable asset was in reality the shameless life and political unpopularity of her husband. The Whigs also were quick to perceive the opportunity of snatching a party advantage from the embarrassments of the government. Some of the opposition, wrote a Tory lady, are behaving shamefully. Not only the mob, wrote the Whig Littleton, don't be deceived by what your Tory friends tell you to the contrary, but people of all ranks and the middle classes, almost to a man, and I believe the troops too, side with the Queen. It was true. On June 6th, the King insisted that the House of Lords should institute an inquiry into his wife's conduct. Efforts at compromise conducted on the King's part by Wellington and Castlereagh on the Queen's, by Broome, her attorney, and Denman, her solicitor general, broke down on two points, the question of reception at foreign courts and on that of inclusion in the liturgy. The Lord's Committee reported that the evidence demanded a solemn inquiry, and on July 8th, Lord Liverpool introduced a bill of pains and penalties to deprive the Queen of her title and dissolve her marriage. The bill came on for second reading on August 17th, and the Queen's trial, for such in effect it was, was protracted through the autumn. An immense volume of conflicting evidence was taken. Broom conducted the defense with consummate skill, 
The second reading was carried by a majority of 28 on November 6th, the third reading only by nine. Liverpool accepted the division as a sign of defeat, and amid delirious manifestations of popular enthusiasm, the bill was dropped. I have never met anyone of any kind who believes her to be innocent, wrote Crocker to Peel. Crocker moved in Tory circles, but he probably reflected the privately expressed opinions of those best qualified to judge. Even the Queen's friends were by this time disposed to recite the prayer of the famous epigram, Gracious Queen, we thee implore, go away and sin no more. Should that effort be too great, go away, at any rate. In the following session, 1821, the House of Commons voted her an annuity of £50,000, but she did not live to enjoy it. On the refusal of the Privy Council to allow her to be crowned with the King, she foolishly attempted to force her way into the Abbey, July 19th. 1821. A few weeks later, her unhappy life came to an end, August 7th. She had already outlived her transient popularity, and the tide was turning in the king's favor. His coronation in July was not only celebrated with extravagant magnificence, but appeared to evoke some popular enthusiasm. In August, he paid a visit to Ireland, where he exerted to such good effect his undoubted powers of fascination that Lord Dudley declared that if he had stood for Dublin, he might have turned out Shaw or Grattan. Scarcely less enthusiastic, though less tumultuous, was his reception in Scotland a year later. In London, he was never seen in public during the last seven years of his life. He feared the ridicule which might be excited by his dropsical bulk, and spent most of his time with Lady Conningham at Brighton, a shameless voluptuary to the end. Lord Liverpool's ministry was severely, though perhaps undeservedly, shaken by the Queen's business. There were, moreover, indications that the period of repression was passing away, and that Parliament was prepared to resume the work of constructive legislation interrupted by the outbreak of the French Revolution. Canning left the Cabinet in January of 1821, in consequence of his inability to concur in the policy of the government toward the Queen. He was thus free to give his powerful support to Plunkett's Catholic Emancipation Bill, which was carried through the Commons in 1821, only to suffer extinction in the House of Lords. A similar fate befell Canning's own bill in 1822, designed to permit Roman Catholic peers to sit and vote in the House of Lords. While Canning and Plunkett were thus active on behalf of the Roman Catholics, Lord John Russell was pressing forward the cause of parliamentary reform. In 1820, his bill for withholding writs from Grampound, Penryn, Camelford, and Barnstable passed the Commons. His resolution in favor of reform was supported by a large minority in 1821 and in the same session his bill for the disfranchisement of Grampund was actually carried, though the peers insisted on giving the seats to the county of York instead of the borough of Leeds. In 1822 Sir James Mackintosh succeeded in pledging the House of Commons to a reform of the criminal law. These things were indicative of the rising tide of opinion, both at Westminster and in the country at large. Not less suggestive were the changes in the ministry itself. In 1822, Lord Sidmouth, who had stolidly and courageously borne the brunt of his colleagues' unpopularity, was succeeded at the Home Office by Peel. Lord Wellesley accepted the Lord Lieutenancy of Ireland. Plunkett, the strenuous advocate of Catholic claims, became Attorney General. And C. W. Wynne succeeded Bragg Bathurst at the Board of Control. In 1823, the ministry was further strengthened, especially on the financial side, by the substitution of F. J. Robinson for Van Sittert at the Exchequer and by Huskisson's appointment to the Board of Trade. But most important and most significant of all was the change at the Foreign Office and in the leadership of the House of Commons. In 1822, Castlereagh, who in 1821 had by his father's death become Marquis of Londonderry, died by his own hand. In 
Lord Liverpool promptly offered both the vacant offices to Canning. The latter had recently been persuaded to accept the Governor-Generalship of India and was just on the point of leaving England to assume his new duties. He decided, however, to accept Lord Liverpool's offer, and for the next five years Canning was the real ruler of England and all but dictator of Europe. End of Section 4Section 5 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 3 England and Europe, The Holy Alliance, Castlereagh and Canning, 1815 to 1830, Part 1. The persistent legend that English foreign policy underwent a violent deviation in 1822 is no longer accepted by competent historians. But it is none the less true that the accession of Canning to the Foreign Office was an event of real significance alike for England and for Europe. In order to gauge adequately its importance, it will be necessary to survey the course of English foreign policy since the conclusion of the war. At no period in her history have the relations of Great Britain with the continental powers been so intimate as during the decade which followed Waterloo. Such intimacy was not merely natural but inevitable. England, it was, who had formed and financed successive coalitions against Napoleon Bonaparte, who, thanks to Castlereagh, had prevented at Châtillon the disruption of the last coalition on the eve of final victory, who, thanks to Wellington, had secured at Waterloo the ultimate overthrow of the common enemy. Her minister was largely responsible for the terms of the settlement of 1815, and her general commanded the joint army of occupation, which guaranteed their execution. That England should intervene more closely and more continuously than usual in the concerns of continental Europe is therefore a matter neither for surprise nor reproach. Nor is it wonderful that the Allied sovereigns and their ministers should have welcomed this opportunity to put international relations on a more satisfactory basis. In this laudable ambition, the Holy Alliance had its genesis. Few diplomatic efforts have incurred more odium or more ridicule, and neither is wholly deserved. Its author, the Tsar Alexander of Russia, was a curious mixture of shrewdness and mysticism, of lofty ideals and calculating ambition. In its origin, the Holy Alliance was a genuine attempt to apply the principles of Christian ethics to international politics, to revive the idea of a confederacy of nations, and to rebuild the European polity upon a religious basis. According to the terms of the original scheme announced by the Tsar in September 1815, the sovereigns of Russia, Austria, and Prussia bound themselves agreeably to the words of Holy Scripture, which commands all men to love as brothers, to remain united in the bonds of true and indissoluble brotherly love, always to assist one another, to govern their subjects as parents, to maintain religion, peace, and justice. They consider themselves but as members of one and the same Christian family, commissioned by providence to govern the branches of one family. They call on all powers who acknowledge similar principles to join this holy alliance. The regent of England, not being a sovereign, was technically ineligible for membership in the alliance but he wrote to his brothers to express his cordial assent to the sublime principles enunciated by the Tsar. The sovereigns of France, Spain, and the two Sicilies subsequently gave in their adherence. Metternich regarded the whole transaction with cynical contempt. 
Castlereagh, to whom enthusiasm of any kind was unintelligible, described it as a piece of mysticism and nonsense, and was led to doubt the sanity of the Tsar. Canning was more suspicious as to his sincerity, corruptio optimi pessima, representing in its original conception a noble, if impractical, ideal, the holy alliance so rapidly degenerated as to justify the worst suspicions of Canning. In its practical working after 1818, it came to mean an attempt to direct the internal affairs of the several states by means of periodical conferences in the interests of autocracy and reaction. In the Holy Alliance itself, England, as we have seen, had no formal part, but closely connected, though not to be confounded with it, was the Quadruple Treaty, concluded on November 20th, 1815, between Great Britain, Austria, Prussia, and Russia. Specifically based upon the treaties of Chaumont, March 1st, 1814, and Vienna, March 25th, 1815, this quadruple alliance was primarily the work of Castlereagh. The high contracting parties, wishing to employ all their means to prevent the general tranquillity, the object of the wishes of mankind and the constant end of their efforts, from being again disturbed, desirous, moreover, to draw closer the ties which unite them for the common interests of their people, solemnly renewed their adherence to the treaties of Chaumont and Vienna, mutually guaranteed the Second Treaty of Paris, and finally, in order to facilitate and to secure the execution of the present treaty and to consolidate the connections which at the present moment so closely unite the four sovereigns for the happiness of the world, agreed to renew their meetings at fixed periods for the purpose of consulting upon their common interests and for the consideration of the measures which at each of these periods shall be considered the most salutary for the repose and prosperity of nations and for the maintenance of the peace of Europe. Such were the principal stipulations of the famous document which laid the foundation of the Concert of Europe and continued to exercise a great though diminishing influence upon international relations for the next thirty years. With the principle of concert it is difficult to quarrel, Yet, unless it were carefully worked and vigilantly watched, danger lurked in the scheme. That Castlereagh was not blind to the danger is clear from the warning which he addressed to the foreign missions before the close of the year. In the present state of Europe, it is the province of Great Britain to turn the confidence she has inspired to the account of peace by exercising a conciliatory influence between the powers rather than put herself at the head of any combinations of courts to keep others in check. These words suffice not merely to define the policy of Great Britain, but also to acquit Castlereagh of the charge, uncritically reiterated, of having tied England to the tail of the Holy Alliance. Canning's appreciation of the danger lurking in government by Congresses may have been more acute than Castlereagh's, and his language was certainly more emphatic, but Canning was not foreign secretary and Castlereagh was. To have broken up the European concert attained by infinite pains and not yet convicted of reactionary tendencies would have been on the part of the responsible minister an act of unpardonable levity. Castlereagh's policy was a combination of cooperation and vigilance and few can now doubt that it was statesmanlike and sound. Three years passed, and the quadruple allies found themselves in conference at Aix-la-Chapelle, September through November, 1818. The sovereigns of Russia, Austria, and Prussia were present in person. Among the accredited diplomatists were Castlereagh and Wellington, Metternich from Austria, Hardenberg and Bernstorff from Prussia, Nesselroda and Capodistria from Russia. The Duke of Richelieu 
prime minister of france was also admitted to plead for the evacuation of france by the allied troops the consideration of this question was indeed the primary purpose of the congress the treaty of paris had provided that the military occupation of France might cease at the end of three years if the Allies approved. The decision really rested with the Duke of Wellington, and the Duke advised that the army of occupation might, without danger to France herself and to the peace of Europe, be withdrawn. The Congress accepted his advice. France, backed by the great financial houses of Bering and Hope, entered into renewed engagements for the payment of the unliquidated claims of the Allies, and by the end of the year not a single foreign soldier was encamped upon the soil of France. At the same time, France was formally readmitted to the polite society of Europe, and thus the Quadruple Alliance of 1815 was converted into the Moral Pentarchy of 1818 not, however, in its original form. Three years had sufficed to confirm the suspicions of the English cabinet. The spirit of reaction had already manifested itself not obscurely in France and Germany, still more violently to the south of the Alps and the Pyrenees. The greatest circumspection was therefore displayed by the English representative at Aix-la-Chapelle, lest the alliance of 1815 should be utilized in the interests of repression. By a secret protocol dated November 15, 1818, the quadruple allies agreed to renew their engagements of 1815 as regards France and to confer on the most effectual means of arresting the fatal effects of a new revolutionary convulsion with which France may be threatened. They even provided for the disposition of the Allied forces in such an event. But there was to be no general European League which could justify regular interference in the internal concerns of independent states. On this point, the English cabinet was emphatic. Lord Liverpool had a wholesome fear of Parliament before his eyes. We must recollect, as he wrote to Castlereagh, in the whole of this business, and ought to make our allies feel that the general and European discussion of these questions will be in the British Parliament. Castlereagh, on his side, pathetically complained that the Tsar Alexander, having only passed one day in a Polish Parliament, has no very clear notions of what can be hazarded in a British House of Commons. In the result, however, the alliance of 1815 was renewed in much more general terms. The Allied sovereigns expressed their invariable resolution never to depart either among themselves or in their relations with other states from the strictest observation of the principles of the right of nations. In a protocol of the same date, November 15, 1818, it was specifically laid down that there should be no stated or periodical meetings, but that, if necessary, a meeting should be arranged ad hoc, with the further important proviso that in the case of meetings called to consider the affairs of any of the minor states, they shall only take place in pursuance of a formal invitation on the part of such of those states as the said affairs may concern, and under the express reservation of their right of direct participation therein. The weight of England, wrote Lord Stuart to Lord Liverpool, has been prodigious at this meeting. In this attempt to safeguard the smaller states from the officious benevolence of the Holy Alliance, it is not difficult to trace the hand of the British representative. Indeed, to Castlereagh, and to Castlereagh alone, Europe owed the manifest failure of the Congress of X to provide the transparent soul of the Holy Alliance with a body. The attitude maintained by Castlereagh during the remainder of his life was entirely consistent with that which he assumed during the momentous negotiations of Aix-la-Chapelle. When, for example, in 1819, 
Metternich showed his intention to employ the machinery of the German Bund for the purpose of suppressing liberty of thought and speech in the several states of the German Confederation, Castlereagh entered an emphatic protest. The Karlsbad decrees issued by the Germanic Diet at the bidding of Metternich in 1819 appeared to him to be a distinct infringement of the rights of sovereign states, and as such to be repudiated by the Allied powers. Precisely the same principles inspired his policy in regard to the insurrectionary movement which in 1820 and 1821 broke out in Spain, Portugal, and Naples, and which, but for his firmness, would probably have involved a general European conflict. In no country in Europe had the shock of reaction after 1815 been felt so violently as in Spain. Ferdinand the Seventh of all the Spanish Bourbon the most contemptible, had been welcomed back to the throne with limitless enthusiasm. But not even Spanish loyalty was proof against the combination of weakness and cruelty which he displayed. By 1820 his popularity was exhausted. The flag of insurrection was unfurled at Cadiz, and from an orgy of reaction the Spaniards characteristically plunged into an orgy of revolution. From Spain, the revolutionary infection spread to Portugal and Naples. Alexander of Russia was burning to throw a Russian army into the peninsula. Metternich was determined to restore order in southern Italy. Both hoped to obtain for their several enterprises the sanction of the Allied powers. In regard to Naples, Austria had by treaty a certain right of interference. In regard to Spain, Alexander had no rights save such as could be deduced from the principles accepted at Aix-la-Chapelle. Castlereagh was determined that the latter should not be perverted to that end. As regards Russian intervention in Spain, he was successful but against his wishes a conference to consider the whole situation met at Tropau, October 20th, 1820. At Tropau, Lord Stuart held a watching brief for Great Britain, but in the deliberations of the Congress the latter took no formal part. The policy of Great Britain as defined by Lord Castlereagh was from first to last unequivocal and consistent. If Austrian interests were threatened by events in Italy, Austria might intervene to protect them, provided that she engages in this undertaking with no views of aggrandizement, and that her plans are limited to objects of self-defense. But to anything in the nature of concerted action on the part of the Pentarchy, Castlereagh was unalterably opposed. Not that he was in any sense a friend to revolution— his primary, if not his sole consideration, was the maintenance of the peace of Europe, and that peace was, in his judgment, less likely to be jeopardized by domestic revolution than by the armed intervention of the great powers. The Tsar, however, was falling more and more completely under the influence of Metternich, and on November 19, 1820, the three eastern powers promulgated the Protocol of Tropau. This famous document set forth with startling explicitness the doctrines of the Holy Alliance. States, it declared, which have undergone a change of government due to revolution, the result of which threatens other states, ipso facto cease to be members of the European Alliance and remain excluded from it until their situation gives guarantees for legal order and stability. If, owing to such alterations, immediate danger threatens other states, the powers bind themselves by peaceful means, or if need be by arms, to bring back the guilty state into the bosom of the great alliance. Conscious, perhaps, of the alarm the declaration would be likely to excite, and certainly aware of Castlereagh's suspicious attitude, the eastern sovereigns issued an explanatory circular, December 8, 1820. They asserted that the powers have exercised an undeniable right 
in concerting together upon means of safety against those states in which the overthrow of a government caused by revolution could only be considered as a dangerous example which could only result in a hostile attitude against constitutional and legitimate governments and expressed a confident hope that the goodwill of all right-minded men will no doubt follow the allied courts in the noble arena in which they are about to enter france expressed a general assent but castlereagh on behalf of great britain declined to become a party to the measures which would be in direct repugnance to the fundamental laws of this country further in a circular dispatch of great vigour january nineteenth eighteen twenty one while admitting the individual right of austria to interfere in naples he denounced the principles enunciated at tropau on the ground that they would inevitably sanction a much more extensive interference in the internal transactions of states than can be reconcilable either with the general interest or with the efficient authority and dignity of independent sovereigns castlereagh's dispatch created a profound sensation in the continental chancelleries but despite his protest a mandate was given to austria to crush the neapolitan revolt an army of eighty thousand men marched practically without resistance upon naples the wretched king ferdinand was restored vengeance was exacted from all who had taken part in the recent disturbances and the principles of legitimacy were triumphantly vindicated while austria found congenial occupation in italy france was itching to go to the assistance of bourbon absolutism in spain on the pretext of establishing a cordon sanitaire against an epidemic of yellow fever august eighteen twenty one france gradually amassed one hundred thousand men on the pyrenean frontier the eastern courts were by no means opposed to french intervention but before it could be formally sanctioned an even more threatening cloud had appeared on the diplomatic horizon in march eighteen twenty one europe was startled by the news that the greeks under prince alexander ypsilanti had raised the standard of revolt in moldavia owing to the discouraging attitude of the czar the moldavian rising proved to be a mere flash in the pan but in moria and the aegean islands the greek revolt quickly attained the dimensions of a national insurrection the greeks made no secret of their ambition the ottoman turk was to be driven out of europe and the byzantine empire to be restored at constantinople on both sides the struggle was conducted with the utmost ferocity outrages on the one side called forth cruel reprisals on the other and it became increasingly difficult for the powers in general and for russia in particular to stand aloof the czar's position was one of peculiar embarrassment as founder of the holy alliance as partner of prince metternich in the tropau protocol he was the sworn foe of revolution as the protector of the greek church and the traditional friend of turkey's enemies he was impelled to interference on behalf of the greeks moreover russia had at the moment her own quarrel with the turk there was the utmost danger that the two quarrels in their origin distinct would merge into one and that russia would use the greek insurrection to further her own traditional ambitions such an issue would have been in castlereagh's judgment entirely repugnant to british interests and on july sixteenth eighteen twenty one castlereagh now lord londonderry availing himself for the first time of a unique privilege addressed directly to the czar a letter which adroitly turned against the czar his own principles and laid down with admirable explicitness the line which british policy was thenceforth to follow his supreme object was to stop the isolated intervention of the czar in this he was entirely successful but the atmosphere continued to be explosive 
the peace of Europe hung by a very slender thread. How long could Russia be restrained from crossing the Pruth and France from crossing the Pyrenees? How long could England refrain from recognizing the belligerent rights, if not the independence, of the Spanish colonies in South America? These were the questions which once more brought the powers into conference at Vienna and Verona in the autumn of 1822. At that conference, England was to be represented by the foreign minister himself, but until he could arrive, her interests were to be confided to the Duke of Wellington. Castlereagh, therefore, fortunately for his own reputation, drafted an elaborate memorandum which conclusively attests his own sagacity and foreshadows the policy adopted in its entirety by Canning. In the discussion on the Italian question, England was to take no part, lest by doing so she should appear to admit the justice of a proceeding against which from the outset she had protested. In regard to the Eastern question, every effort was to be made to reconcile the differences between Russia and Turkey, and then and not until then the condition of Greece might be considered. The recognition of the Greeks as a de facto government had become almost inevitable, but the British plenipotentiary was to stand aloof from any engagement with the Allies either to accept the Greek government as that of an independent state or to compel the submission of Greece herself to the port by force of arms. As regards the domestic revolution in Spain, that is a matter with which, in the opinion of the English cabinet, no foreign power has the smallest right to interfere. The case of the revolted Spanish colonies was different. Over by far the greater part of them Spain has lost all hold, and it is clear that their recognition as independent states has become merely a question of time. England, therefore, was to advocate the principle that while no help should be given to revolting colonies, every province which had actually established its independence should be recognized. But this must be a matter between Spain and England exclusively. There is to be no concert with France or Russia or any other extraneous power to effect it. Other nations may or may not come into the views which England entertains, but upon their approval or disapproval of her views, England is not in any way to shape her conduct. Finally, England is to urge the final suppression of the slave trade. The memorandum is a masterly exposition of the principles which from first to last inspired Castlereagh's policy. A strenuous insistence upon national independence, abstention from interference in the domestic concerns of independent states, and a frank recognition of the claims of new nationalities which had de facto established their independence. Adopted by Canning, these principles were asserted by him with a vigor in action to which his predecessor could not pretend. Castlereagh's course was run. Worn out by the twofold strain of parliamentary leadership and diplomatic responsibility, his mind gave way, and on August 12, 1822, he died by his own hand. He had reached the climax of his career in 1815. Always devoid of personal magnetism, the last seven years of his life had filled to the brim the cup of his unpopularity. The brutal shouts of his enemies even desecrated the closing scene in Westminster Abbey. Broom, indeed, was big enough to appreciate a fallen foe. Put all their men together in one scale and poor Castlereagh in the other. Single, he plainly weighed them down. Creevy expressed, though with characteristic malevolence, the prevailing view among his opponents. A worse, or if he had had talent and ambition for it, a more dangerous public man never existed. No English statesman has ever incurred greater or more undeserved unpopularity. His diplomacy was misunderstood, 
and it was his misfortune to be compelled in addition to bear the odium of the domestic policy of the government. The financial blunders of Van Sittert, the repressive legislation of Sidmouth and Eldon, the unsavory business of Queen Caroline, for all these things Castlereagh was of course in part responsible, and in exceptional degree was made to suffer. And impartial history has only begun to do tardy justice to his qualities. Apart from the official biography of Allison, the memory of Castlereagh was left for half a century to the mercy of his opponents. But a reaction is clearly discernible. One of the greatest of our foreign ministers, warmly testifying to his courage, patience, and faultless sagacity, has declared him to be that rare phenomenon, a practical man of the highest order, who yet did not by that fact forfeit his title to be considered a man of genius. Footnote. Lord Salisbury, Biographical Essays, Volume 149. The writer adds shrewdly and characteristically, quote, he might have maintained his policy with impunity if he would have done readier homage to the liberal catchwords of the day, if he had only constructed a few brilliant periods about nationality or freedom, or given a little wordy sympathy to Greece or Naples or Spain or the South American republics, the world would have heard much less of the horrors of his policy. End quote. End footnote. The dual position which Castlereagh had held was pressed by Lord Liverpool upon the acceptance of Canning, and thus at the age of 52, Canning became for the second time Foreign Secretary and for the first time Leader of the House of Commons. Born in 1770 and educated at Eton and Christchurch, Canning's political career had hitherto been singularly checkered. Entering the House of Commons as a disciple of Pitt, in 1793, he was appointed in 1796 to serve his official apprenticeship under Grenville as Undersecretary for Foreign Affairs. He became an Indian Commissioner in 1799, Joint Paymaster of the Forces in 1800, and in 1801 resigned office with Pitt. For the next three years he found the serious business of life in incessant intrigue against Pitt's successor and his recreation in the manufacture of squibs to be fired off against the doctor. The squibs did Addington little harm and Canning no good. On Pitt's return to power in 1804, Canning became treasurer of the navy and was thus fortunate enough to be at the Admiralty during the critical year of the naval campaign against Napoleon. He resigned on Pitt's death in 1806, and was not included in Grenville's ministry, though its popular appellation, All the Talents, could not, as Fox handsomely observed, be strictly applied to any government from which Canning was excluded. In the following year, Canning joined the Portland ministry as Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs. Castlereagh became at the same time Secretary for the Colonies and War, an office which afforded ample opportunities for friction with the foreign minister. On neither side were they neglected. Canning's first tenure of the Foreign Office, 1807-1809, to 1809, was memorable for the success with which he foiled the conspiracy of Tilsit, for the unfortunate but unavoidable bombardment of Copenhagen, and for the opening scenes of the Peninsula Campaign. Into the causes which led to the unfortunate duel between Canning and Castlereagh, and to the break-up of the ministry of which they were the main supports, it is unnecessary to enter. It is sufficient to recall the fact that while Castlereagh returned to office as Foreign Secretary in 1812 and retained that office continuously for ten years, Canning never regained a foremost place in English politics during his great rival's life. Castlereagh, indeed, with great magnanimity, offered to resign the Foreign Office in his favor on the formation of the Liverpool administration in 1812. Canning described the offer, without hyperbole, as the handsomest ever made to an individual, but he declined to accept it without the leadership in the Commons, and for four years he was out of office. 
In 1816, he re-entered the cabinet as president of the Board of Control, but his friendship with Queen Caroline rendered it difficult for him to remain a member of the cabinet while her business was under discussion, and accordingly in 1820 he resigned. All his colleagues and even the king parted with him, it would seem, with genuine regret, and the cordial letter addressed to him by Castlereagh proves that the old bitterness between these great men was largely assuaged. Liverpool repeatedly pressed Canning's claims to readmission upon the king, but the latter was obdurate, and Canning's career in English politics seemed to be definitely closed before it was well begun. It was under these circumstances that, in the summer of 1822, he accepted the governor-generalship of India and was in the midst of preparations for departure when the death of Lord Londonderry opened once more the prospect of high office at home. The idea of India had, however, by this time laid its spell upon Canning, and it was apparently with real regret that he received the offer of the whole inheritance. Anything less he had resolved to refuse. To the last day I hoped, he wrote to Charles Bagot, that the proposal made to me might be one which I could refuse. It was not, and in 1822 Canning obtained his lifelong ambition. End of Section 5《Section Six of England Since Waterloo》by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter Three: The Holy Alliance, Castlereagh and Canning, England and Europe, 1815 to 1830, Part Two. On his return to the Foreign Office, Canning was confronted by three questions of immense difficulty, the Greek insurrection and the quarrel between Russia and Turkey, the internal affairs of old Spain, and the relations between Spain and her revolted colonies in South America. To these was subsequently added a fourth, the position of the House of Braganza in Portugal and Brazil. In regard to the first three, he adopted without modification the instructions drawn up by Castlereagh. Wellington, who represented Great Britain at the Congress of Verona, told the powers that while there was no sympathy and would be none between England and revolutionists and Jacobins, England must insist on the right of nations to set up over themselves whatever form of government they thought best. Above all, there must be no concerted intervention on behalf of absolutism in Spain. The protest of Wellington averted joint action. It could not stop the intervention of France, and despite all the efforts of Canning, the Duke d'Angoulême crossed the Bidashoa at the head of 100,000 men, April 6, 1823. Within a few months, Ferdinand VII of Spain was restored to his throne and his authority, and under the protection of French troops, who remained encamped in Spain until 1827, he was able to wreak a terrible vengeance upon his enemies. Foiled in old Spain, Canning turned to the new and sought materials of compensation in another hemisphere. He was resolved that if France had Spain, it should not be Spain with the Indies, and he called the New World into existence to redress the balance of the old. The situation in South America had indeed become intolerable, for outrages unnumbered upon British ships and traders, no redress could be obtained from the Spanish government. Spain, indeed, was impotent to control the action of her colonies. With those colonies, therefore, Canning determined to deal directly, to punish the privateers, and to recognize the independence of those countries which appear to have established their separation from Spain. 
Before the end of 1823, councils were appointed to protect British interests in most of the principal towns. In 1824, Great Britain recognized the independence of Buenos Aires, Colombia, and Mexico, and in 1825 of Bolivia, Chile, and Peru. Spain was powerless to resist Canning's will, but France was not. In 1823, it was rumored that France meant to extend her intervention from the old Spain to the new. France was bluntly informed that no such intervention would be permitted by Great Britain, October 1823, and the latter's attitude was supported by the United States. On December 2, 1823, President Monroe sent to Congress the famous message in which he declared that any interference on the part of the great powers of Europe for the purpose of oppressing or controlling the destiny of the Spanish-American states, which had declared their independence, would be dangerous to the peace and safety of the United States and would be considered as the manifestation of an unfriendly disposition toward them. By 1825, the Spanish Empire in South America was all but wiped out. The language, and still more, the action of Canning sealed the doom of the Holy Alliance and ended the attempt to govern Europe by Congresses. England had got little satisfaction from Congresses. We protested at Laibach. We remonstrated at Verona. Our protest was treated as waste paper. Our remonstrances mingled with the air. Our influence, if it is to be maintained abroad, must be secure in the sources of strength at home, and the sources of that strength are in the sympathy between the people and the government. Canning's language was apt to be a trifle magniloquent, but magniloquence was not with him a substitute for action. This was proved conclusively in his dealings with Portugal. In all the complicated web of modern European history there is no more tangled skein than that provided by Portugal and Brazil. The line taken by Canning is, however, tolerably clear, and with that alone, fortunately, we are concerned. In 1807, just after Canning had foiled the Tilsit conspiracy, Napoleon had issued an edict that the House of Braganza had ceased to reign. The royal family and court made their escape in time and transferred the seat of government to Brazil. At the restoration of 1815, it was naturally expected that John VI would return to Lisbon, but he preferred Rio Janeiro, and Portugal was in effect reduced to the position of a dependency of its own colony. In 1820, the revolutionary contagion spread from Spain to Portugal, and John, in 1821, was reluctantly compelled to return to Europe to reassert his authority. In the following year, 1822, the Brazilians threw off the yoke of the mother country and proclaimed Dom Pedro, eldest son of John VI, as constitutional emperor of Brazil. Meanwhile, the successful intervention of France in the absolutist interest in Spain excited the hopes of the Portuguese reactionaries, who were led by the king's second son and heir, Dom Miguel. France was only too eager to extend her intervention from Spain to Portugal and was restrained solely by the firm attitude of Canning. The constitutionalists in Portugal applied for the assistance of English troops. This request, Canning was compelled, conformably with his principles of non-intervention, to refuse, but he sent a British squadron to the Tagus and made it otherwise clear to France and to Europe that if England refrained from interference on behalf of the one party, France must refrain on behalf of the other. The ships, moreover, were found useful when in April 1824 Dom Miguel effected a coup d'etat and virtually superseded his father. John VI went on board the Windsor Castle and from that vantage point effectually reasserted his authority. Don Miguel was exiled, order was restored, the Gallophils were deposed, 
and Canning triumphed. In 1825, Canning had the further satisfaction of bringing about a settlement of the long-standing differences between Portugal and Brazil. As a result of a conference in London, a treaty was signed, August 29, 1825, by which John VI recognized the independence of Brazil and his best beloved son, Dom Pedro, as emperor. Six months later, John VI died, March 10, 1826. The Emperor Pedro thereupon promulgated a constitutional charter for Portugal, but renounced his rights on the throne in favor of his daughter, the Infanta Maria, a child of seven, who was to marry her uncle Miguel. But the Miguelists refused the compromise and appealed for help to Spain. The party of the Regency appealed to England. To Canning, intervention was one thing. Intervention to repel intervention was another. He waited only for the assurance that Spain meant to support the Miguelists by arms. This reached him on December 8th, and four days later he announced to Parliament that an English force was on its way to Portugal. Not an hour had been lost. The precise information on which alone we could act arrived only on Friday last. On Saturday, the decision of the government was taken. On Sunday, we obtained the sanction of His Majesty. On Monday, we came down to Parliament, and at this very hour, while I have the honor of addressing this House, British troops are on their way to Portugal. In one of his most effective speeches, Canning announced to Parliament and to Europe the principle on which the government had acted. England had no wish to interfere on either side in Portugal, but neither would she permit anyone else to do so. The Holy Allies were scandalized, but Spain desisted from any further efforts to assist the Portuguese reactionaries. Canning's prompt and decisive action not only saved the liberal constitution in Portugal, but probably averted a European war. The English force remained in Portugal until April 1828. Canning was now dead. Dom Miguel had been appointed by his brother to the Regency in February of 1828, and despite his oath of fealty to the Constitution, made no secret of his intention to exchange the Regency for the Crown. Wellington, who became Prime Minister in January of 1828, had always disliked Canning's foreign policy, refused to let English troops take side in domestic broils in Portugal, and insisted on their withdrawal. No longer restrained by their presence, Miguel flung aside all dissimulation. All the ministers at Lisbon, except those of Rome and Spain, withdrew, and Portugal plunged into an orgy of reaction. Meanwhile, the Infanta Maria, dispatched from Brazil by her father in ignorance of the doings of Dom Miguel, was brought to England, where she was received as Queen of Portugal on September 1828. In England, she was joined by the leading Portuguese constitutionalists and by some 3,000 to 4,000 military refugees. Wellington, anxious to maintain the strictest neutrality, was now in a position of great embarrassment. He had only too good reason to fear that England would be used as the base of the operations against the de facto government of Portugal. Despite all his vigilance, an expedition did sail from England in January of 1829 for the Azores, but it was intercepted by an English squadron and effected nothing. Not until 1834 was the matter finally settled, when Miguel was compelled by the joint action of the Western powers to sign the Convention of Evora, by which he renounced his rights to the throne of Portugal and left the way clear for his niece, Dona Maria. Of much greater importance than the affairs of Spain or Portugal, though of less immediate interest to the diplomatists at Verona, was the development of events in Eastern Europe. Here also Canning adopted and maintained the policy defined by Castlereagh. Both statesmen were friendly to the Greek cause, but both regarded the question primarily and properly 
from the point of view of British interests, and both used every endeavour to induce Turkey to agree with her Greek adversary quickly, lest Russia should get the opportunity of fishing in troubled waters. For three years, from 1821 to 1824, the Greeks, despite fierce internal feuds, more than held their own against the Turks. But in 1824 the Sultan summoned to his aid Ibrahim Pasha, the son of his vassal Mehmet Ali of Egypt. Ibrahim occupied Crete in 1824, and in the following year crossed to the Morea, where he harried, slaughtered, and devastated in all directions. The rumor ran that he meant to carry off all the Greeks who were spared by his ferocious troops into bondage in Egypt. From the first, the Greek cause had been warmly espoused by the English people, partly from classical sentiment and partly from religious, partly from detestation of the Turk, and not least in response to the eloquence of Byron. Volunteers had gone in their thousands, not from England only, but from other Western nations and from the United States. Tidings of Ibrahim's deeds and intentions roused the Philhellenist sentiment to the highest pitch. Meanwhile, in England itself, the cause of the insurgents seemed desperate. Misolonghi fell in 1826, after a year's heroic defense, to which English volunteers materially contributed, and in the following year, despite the efforts of Lord Cochrane, General Church, and others, Athens itself was compelled to surrender. How was the progress of events in southeastern Europe regarded by the powers and peoples of the West? Metternich never diverged for an instant from the line he had from the first taken up. The Greeks were lawless rebels and must be left to their fate. Prussia, as usual, followed humbly in the wake of Austria. In France, however, the Philhellenist sentiment was not powerless, and in England and Russia it might at any moment get beyond the control of the respective governments. In March of 1823, Canning had been obliged by the same logic of events as necessitated the recognition of the South American republics to recognize the Greeks as belligerents. As in the West, so in the East, the insurgents took to piracy. British trade was suffering severely. No redress could be obtained from the nominal sovereign, and none could be asked at the hands of a non-recognized belligerent. The recognition of the belligerent character of the Greeks, as Canning explained, was necessitated by the impossibility of treating as pirates a population of a million souls and of bringing within the bounds of civilized war a contest which had been marked at the outset on both sides by disgusting barbarity. Russia resented Canning's isolated action, and in January of 1824 proposed collective intervention. Anxious to avoid encouragement to Greek nationality, she suggested that Greece, including the archipelago, should be divided into three autonomous provinces on the model of Moldavia and Wallachia, nominally subject to Turkish suzerainty, but practically under Russian protection. To settle the details, a conference was invited to meet at St. Petersburg. The port was furious when it learned the proposal, and in August 1825, the Greeks themselves addressed Canning in an equally angry protest. The plan, they complained, was one for giving them over bound hand and foot to the Turks, and they declared that they would perish to the last man rather than submit to be negotiated about on such principles. Hereupon, wrote Canning, we say halt. Sir Charles Bagot was accordingly withdrawn from the conference at St. Petersburg, but nevertheless Canning assented to a mildly worded offer of mediation, which was presented in a joint note to the combatants in March of 1825. The port, flushed with Ibrahim's victories, contemptuously refused the offer. The Greeks, in desperation, turned once more to Canning, 
placed themselves formally under British protection and begged that Great Britain would send them a king. The suggestion was, of course, inadmissible, and Canning made it clear to the Greeks that he could not depart from his policy of strict though benevolent neutrality. At this juncture, the situation was profoundly affected by the sudden death on December 1st, 1825, of the Tsar Alexander. His successor, Nicholas, was a man of different mold and temper. He had none of Alexander's western veneer, nor of his mysticism and sentiment. He was a Russian to the core. Alexander had clearly discerned the revolutionary march in the troubles of the Peloponnese. Nicholas cared even less for the Greeks than his predecessor, but he was even more indisposed to allow the port to play fast and loose with Russia. Canning was becoming convinced as to the necessity of a frank understanding with that court, the more so since Prince Liefen, the Russian ambassador in London, had expressed the wish that Canning would take the question into his own hands, since Great Britain was the only power which could bring the state of affairs in Greece to a satisfactory settlement. To this end, Canning induced the Duke of Wellington to undertake a special mission to St. Petersburg to congratulate the new Tsar on his accession, January 1826. The Duke was further charged to adjust, if possible, the outstanding difficulties between Russia and Turkey and to arrive at an understanding with Russia on the Greek question. The result of the mission was seen in the signature on April 4th, 1826, of the Protocol of St. Petersburg. By this treaty, the two powers, renouncing any augmentation of territory, any exclusive influence, or any preferential commercial advantages for themselves, agreed to offer their mediation to the port. Greece, though continuing to pay tribute to the port, was to become a virtually independent state, to be governed by authorities chosen by itself, and to enjoy entire liberty of conscience and commerce. To prevent collisions in the future, the Turks were to evacuate Greece, and the Greeks were to purchase the property of the Turks on the Grecian continent or islands. This protocol must be regarded as a political triumph for Canning and a personal triumph for Wellington, but it did nothing to adjust the outstanding differences between Russia and Turkey. In regard to these, the new Tsar was determined to brook neither dallying on the part of the port nor intervention on the part of the powers. He had already embodied his terms in an ultimatum dispatched to Constantinople, March 17, 1826, and the port, temporarily embarrassed by the mutiny of the Janissaries, was compelled to accept them in the Convention of Ackerman, October 7, 1826. As regards Greece, on the other hand, the port in the full tide of triumphant barbarity showed no signs of accepting any mediation unless backed by force. Greece had already formally applied for it. Accordingly, in September 1826, Canning proposed to the Tsar common action to enforce mediation upon the Sultan. If the Sultan remained obdurate, the two powers agreed to intimate to him that they would look to Greece with an eye of favor and with a disposition to seize the first occasion for recognizing as an independent state such portion of her territory as should have freed itself from Turkish dominion. Every effort was made to bring the other powers into line. Metternich, however, left no stone unturned to frustrate Canning's policy, even to the extent of using Backstair's influence to create mistrust between the court and the cabinet. Prussia followed Metternich's lead, but France concluded with Russia and Great Britain the Treaty of London, July 1827. The public articles of the treaty were substantially identical with the terms of the protocol, in accordance with which an immediate armistice was to be offered to the belligerents. A secret article provided that the port should be plainly informed that the powers intend to take immediate measures 
for an approximation with the Greeks, and that if within a month the port do not accept the armistice, or if the Greeks refuse to execute it, the high contracting powers should intimate to one or both parties that they intend to exert all the means which circumstances may suggest to their prudence to obtain the immediate effect of the armistice by preventing all collision between the contending parties without however taking any part in the hostilities between them a joint note was presented to the turk august sixteenth who indignantly declined mediation but by this time the control of events was passing from the hands of dallying diplomatists into those of prompt sailors the admirals in command of the british and french fleets in the levant were informed of the terms of the treaty on august seventh sir edward codrington found them difficult of interpretation was he to use force or not he appealed to the british ambassador at constantinople and satisfied with stratford canning's answer he sailed for the morea a large egyptian fleet had meanwhile sailed with reinforcements for the morea and on september seventh joined the turkish ships in navarino bay the allied fleets of england france and russia followed ibrahim was informed that none of his ships would be allowed to leave the harbour and quickly discovered that the allied admirals meant to enforce their orders foiled at sea he renewed his attack on land with increased ferocity of the atrocities he committed the sailors were all but eye-witnesses to remain passive was impossible but agreeably to instructions there were to be no hostilities the turks however opened fire the battle became general and before sundown on october twentieth the turco-egyptian fleet had disappeared the bay of navarino was covered with their wrecks the news of the battle of navarino was received with amazement throughout europe and by the english government with something like consternation the sailors had indeed cut the gordian knot tied by the diplomatists but they got no thanks in england for doing it canning was dead august eighth and wellington who after five months interval succeeded to his place made no secret of his dislike of canning's policy the turk with consummate impudence described navarino as a revolting outrage and demanded compensation and apologies even wellington was not prepared to go this length but the king was made january twenty ninth eighteen twenty eight to lament deeply that this conflict should have occurred with the naval forces of an ancient ally and to express a confident hope that this untoward event will not be followed by further hostilities the one anxiety of the new government was to preserve the independence and integrity of the ottoman empire no language could have been more nicely calculated to defeat this object. Turkey was, of course, encouraged to persist in her attitude toward Greece and to renew her quarrel with Russia. Russia was permitted and even compelled to engage single-handed in war with the Turks. Thus, all the fruits of years of diplomacy on Canning's part were carelessly dissipated in a few months by his successors. The port, meanwhile, denounced the convention of Ackermann and declared a holy war against the infidel on December 20th, 1827. Russia, though with ample professions to the powers of complete disinterestedness, accepted the challenge, and in May 1828, 150,000 Russian troops under Wittgenstein crossed the Prut. The Turks, to the amazement of Europe, made not only a stubborn but an effective resistance but in july eighteen twenty nine diebitsch by a masterly march crossed the balkans and appeared before adrianople august nineteenth constantinople was at his mercy cars and ezerum had already fallen and the sultan had no alternative but to accept 
the terms embodied in the Treaty of Adrianople. In the long history of the Eastern question, the Treaty of Adrianople is inferior only in importance to those of Canargy and Berlin. Russia restored her conquests, except the great islands of the Danube, but her title to Georgia and the other provinces of the Caucasus was acknowledged. All neutral vessels were to have free navigation in the Black Sea and on the Danube. Practical autonomy was granted to the principalities of Moldavia and Wallachia under Russian protection. Russian traders in Turkey were to be under the exclusive jurisdiction of their own consuls, while in regard to Greece, the port accepted the Treaty of London, thus virtually acknowledging its independence. The final settlement of the Greek question was referred to a conference which was to meet in London. It provided plenty of occupation to the diplomatists for some time to come, and not until 1831 was Lord Palmerston at last able to bring matters to a tolerably satisfactory issue. Greece was to be independent under the guarantee of Great Britain, France, and Russia. The frontier was, after much wrangling, fixed with some niggardliness at a line extending from the Gulf of Volo on the east to Arta on the west. The form of government was to be a constitutional monarchy, and the crown, having been declined first by Prince John of Saxony, and then, after a momentary acceptance by Prince Leopold of saxe coburg was ultimately accepted by Otto, second son of King Louis of Bavaria. Count Campodistrius, who had been virtually ruler of Greece, was assassinated in 1831, and the way was clear, therefore, for the new king, who began his ill-starred reign in 1833. The treaties of Adrianople and London close a chapter in the history of English foreign policy, and more particularly in that section of it which is concerned with the unraveling of that shifting, intractable, and interwoven tangle of conflicting interests, rival peoples, and antagonistic faiths that is veiled under the easy name of the Eastern Question. Footnote. The phrase is Lord Morley's. End footnote. The Duke of Wellington supposed that he had seen the beginning of the end of it. The Treaty of Adrianople, he declared to be, the death blow to the independence of the Ottoman port and the forerunner of the dissolution and extinction of its power. After the lapse of eighty years, few would be found to re-echo this confident prediction. The Duke, like the Tsar Nicholas, unquestionably underrated the marvellous recuperative power of the sick man and the adroitness with which he learnt to turn to account the jealousies of the powers. Those jealousies still retard the solution of a problem to which the Hellenic rising added one more factor and still mock the efforts of those who would fain give substance to the dreams though they repudiate the methods of the Holy Alliance. End of section six. Section seven of England since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 4. The Last Years of Tory Rule, 1822-1830, to Social and Fiscal Reforms, Catholic Emancipation, Part 1. An attempt was made in the last chapter to explain the part played by England in European politics during the years which followed the Napoleonic Wars. A secondary purpose was to expose the fallacy which associates the substitution of Canning for Castlereagh with a new era in English foreign policy. Despite their contrasted temperaments, the two statesmen pursued a common end. But if Canning did not introduce a new system into diplomacy, he did enforce, together with his colleagues Peel, Huskisson, and Robinson, a new spirit in domestic legislation. 
the various manifestations of that new spirit it is the purpose of the following pages to disclose it is usual to date the era of reform from the accession of the whig party to power in eighteen thirty then as often it happened that a powerful stimulus was given to legislation by the electoral success of a party long excluded from office but the causes of reform and reaction go far deeper than mere party oscillations and cannot be satisfactorily explained by party triumphs in this case the period of stagnation closed not in eighteen thirty but in eighteen twenty two the era of reform was coincident not with the formation of lord grey's administration but with the reconstruction of that of lord liverpool the change of ministerial personnel in 1822 and 1823 was as we have seen comprehensive and significant canning it will be remembered succeeded londonderry not only at the foreign office but in the leadership of the house of commons peel with a reputation immensely enhanced by his skilful conduct of currency reforms replaced lord sidmouth addington at the home office the support of the grenville whigs was conciliated by the appointment of c w wynn as president of the board of control and the hopes of the catholics were naturally raised by lord wellesley's acceptance of the lord lieutenancy of ireland and still more by plunkett's appointment as attorney-general even more clearly indicative of impending change of policy were the appointments to the exchequer and the board of trade van sittert most incompetent of financiers was raised to the peerage as lord bexley and receded into the chancellorship of the duchy of lancaster f j robinson replaced him at the exchequer and was in turn succeeded at the board of trade by william huskisson exceptionally strong in general administrative ability few cabinets since the inception of parliamentary government have contained three more prominent financiers than peel huskisson and robinson while canning himself as his speeches and essays abundantly prove had a firm grip upon economic principles the influence of these men is clearly discernible in the legislation promoted by the reconstructed ministry quite apart however from changes in ministerial personnel reforms of a drastic nature could not have been much longer delayed during the last thirty years scarcely a single remedial measure had been placed upon the statute book for this legislative stagnation no one in england was to blame twenty-five years had been more than fully occupied by the struggle against revolutionary and napoleonic france pitt an ardent administrative reformer had wisely though reluctantly put aside a congenial task for something even more immediately important it is unwise as wyndham said to repair one's house in the hurricane season so pitt felt and his reforming work upon which he had made an excellent beginning during his first nine years of office was postponed to a more convenient season upon twenty-five years of war there had supervened five years of economic distress and social agitation the hurricane was still blowing though from a different quarter once more reform was postponed but since eighteen twenty there had been a marked improvement in the situation the worst of the commercial and financial crisis was obviously over trade revived social order was restored and men's minds turned hopefully toward the prospect of legislative amelioration several questions of first-rate importance insistently demanded a solution the parliamentary successes of lord john russell eighteen twenty to eighteen twenty one reinforced by the yorkshire petition of eighteen twenty three proved that the question of electoral reform could not be much longer postponed 
the inclusion of Canning and Plunkett in the ministry compelled Lord Liverpool to continue to treat Catholic emancipation as an open question. The inclusion of Huskisson was a pledge of fiscal reform. Mackintosh was exposing the ghastly barbarities of the criminal code. Wilberforce and Foxel Buxton, those of slavery. In the world of industry, the combination laws pressed with peculiar severity upon wage earners, and some readjustment of the relations between capital and labor were imperatively required. The first question with which the new ministers elected to deal was the scandalous condition of the criminal law. Peel's tenure of the Home Office was memorable for its amendment. Derided by Disraeli as a burglar of other men's ideas, Peel certainly possessed, in exceptional measure, the faculty of bringing to legislative fruition the seeds sown by others. In the reform of the criminal law, Romilly planted, Mackintosh watered, Peel reaped the legislative harvest. The conditions of things before wise men began their crusade was nothing short of appalling. For no fewer than two hundred offences, the death penalty could still be legally inflicted. Procedure was antiquated and defective. The innocent were sometimes convicted. The guilty constantly escaped. The severity of the law, of course, defeated its own object. It blunted the moral conscience of the nation. It obliterated the distinction between offences trivial and grave. It encouraged serious and persistent crime. It failed to deter the casual offender. Criminal procedure was reduced to a farce. Juries naturally refused to convict for petty offenses when conviction might cost the offender his life. Poachers and shoplifters were sentenced to death by the score, but rarely suffered the death penalty. Of 655 persons, indicted for shoplifting between 1805 and 1807, 113 were sentenced to death, but not in one case was the penalty enforced. On the other hand, between 1811 and 1818, over 100 persons went to the gallows for the crime of forgery. But even before the efforts of the legislative reformers humane practice had outrun barbarous precept. During the last three-quarters of a century, only twenty-five crimes out of a possible two hundred had actually evoked the extreme penalty. But it was high time that the law should be brought into accord with practice. As a result of many years' labor, Romilly carried two trifling amendments, and on his death in 1818, Sir James Mackintosh kept the question well to the fore. In 1822, the House of Commons pledged itself, at an early period of the next session, to take into its serious consideration the means of increasing the efficiency of the criminal code by abating its rigor. This pledge was handsomely redeemed by Peel. During his first tenure of the Home Office from 1822, to 1827, no less than 278 acts were repealed, and such of their provisions as were still valuable were reenacted in eight new statutes. One hundred felonies were, by a stroke of the pen, removed from the category of capital offenses, and before he finally left the Home Office in 1830, he had the satisfaction of knowing that the death penalty could no longer be pronounced much less enforced, except upon offenders convicted of serious crime. This was Peel's most substantial achievement as Home Secretary, but it was not the only one. He abolished benefit of clergy and criminal offenses. He removed various scandals and anomalies in the marriage laws. He improved the condition of the jails. He reformed criminal procedure he consolidated and amended no less than 66 acts relating to the constitution and functions of juries, and finally he associated both his names imperishably with the establishment of a new police force in the metropolis, 1829. 
it will not be forgotten that during his second tenure of the Home Office from 1828 to 1830, Peel was also leader of the House of Commons and in that capacity was responsible for the Catholic Emancipation Act. But apart from that, his legislative record is sufficiently remarkable. Peel's industry and enthusiasm were contagious. While he was busy at the Home Office, Robinson and Huskisson, steadily backed in the House by Canning, were effecting changes of the first magnitude in the commercial system of the country. Robinson, best known by the sobriquet of Prosperity, was a sound economist and a capable administrator. His colleague deserves to rank among the greatest financiers this country has produced. Born in 1770, William Huskisson was returned to the House of Commons in 1796 and served his apprenticeship at the Treasury under Pitt. On the latter's death, he attached himself to Canning, with whom he resigned in 1809. Restored to office as Minister of Woods and Forests in 1814, he quickly established his reputation as one of the first financial authorities in the House. His pamphlets and speeches gave him an incontestable claim to a place on the Bullion Committee of 1819, and also upon the committee which was appointed in 1821 to consider the question of agricultural distress. On the reconstruction of the ministry, he might naturally have aspired, as Liverpool frankly explained to the king, to the highest financial post. But Canning induced him to accept the combined offices of Treasurer of the Navy and President of the Board of Trade with the promise speedily fulfilled of admission to the cabinet. His influence upon his colleagues, and particularly upon Robinson, was soon apparent. Order and simplicity were introduced into the national accounts. The sinking fund, dear to the heart of Van Sittert, was shorn of its objectionable features, and only the realized surplus was applied to it. A large amount of taxation was remitted, the expenses of revenue collection were sensibly reduced, the national debt was diminished at the rate of some six millions a year, and finally, advantage was taken of the improved credit of the country to effect a conversion of the 4% annuities. For these excellent results, the credit belongs primarily to Robinson, but even more important were the commercial and fiscal reforms initiated by Huskisson himself. For the most adroit financier can effect little when the creation of national wealth is retarded by a vicious commercial system. To remove burdensome restrictions upon trade, to stimulate production, to encourage exchange, to develop by every means in his power the economic resources of the country, these were the objects which Huskisson set himself to achieve. The navigation or trade law still lay at the roots of the old commercial system, though large inroads had already been made upon their integrity. Passed in 1651, 1660, and 1672, they continued for nearly 200 years to form the foundation of British commercial policy. Stripped of technical details, these acts provided that no merchandise should be imported into England, Ireland, or any British plantation from Asia, Africa, or America in any but English-built and English-owned ships navigated by an English commander and manned by a crew of which at least three-fourths were Englishmen. From European countries, goods might be imported in English ships thus defined or under discriminating duties in ships belonging to the country in which the goods were produced. Aimed primarily at the mercantile supremacy of the Dutch, it cannot be denied that these acts attained their object and contributed largely to the commercial and naval ascendancy of Great Britain. They won, moreover, unstinted praise from Adam Smith, who was magnanimous enough to prefer political to commercial considerations. 
on ireland no doubt the trade laws pressed hardly until the union but to the plantations they were not in earlier years at least a disadvantage every effort it is true was made to secure for the mother country the primary advantages of colonial trade but it is not clear that the colonies suffered by the process this much at any rate may be said in defence of the system assailed by huskisson it was avowedly inspired by consideration of power not by consideration of plenty it regarded security rather than wealth it preferred defence to opulence it was in harmony with the prevailing ideas economic and political and it secured its end under it england and her dependencies increased mightily in power and did not apparently lack plenty moreover as time went on and occasion demanded much of its apparent harshness towards the colonists was mitigated in practice by a prudent carelessness on the part of authority to this slackness george grenville was the disastrous exception his conscientious discharge of duty lost us our first colonial empire the successful revolt of the thirteen colonies dealt a mortal blow at the old system excluded from its benefits and exposed to its disadvantages the americans retaliated in kind retaliation led to negotiations and by the treaty of eighteen fourteen the ships of the two countries were placed reciprocally upon the same footing in the ports of england and the united states and all discriminating duties chargeable upon the goods which they conveyed were mutually repealed but apart from our own colonies the face of america was changing rapidly brazil became independent of portugal and the spanish colonies were throwing off the feeble but galling yoke of the mother country in a great speech delivered on march thirty first eighteen twenty five huskisson agreed that these changes placed our own colonies at a relative commercial disadvantage and that the old commercial system must be abandoned if the political connection was to be maintained by legislation passed in eighteen twenty two a large but in their view insufficient measure of freedom had been granted to the colonies the reciprocity act of eighteen twenty five extended the same principle to foreign countries power was given to the king in council to conclude reciprocity treaties and to discriminate still further against countries which declined them under this act treaties were concluded with all the important countries of the world including our old rival the netherlands but though largely deprived of their sting the navigation act still remained upon the statute book and by an act of eighteen forty five were actually consolidated and reenacted but it was an expiring policy against the prevailing spirit of laissez faire such restrictions could not even theoretically stand and in eighteen forty nine they were entirely swept away thus was the policy of huskisson carried to its logical conclusion that an immense impulse was thereby given to the overseas trade of great britain is undeniable but it remains an open question whether in the process provisions still of some value to national security were not unnecessarily sacrificed but the relaxation of the navigation laws was only a part of the general commercial policy of huskisson a whole-hearted theoretical free trader he was convinced that national prosperity would be most effectually promoted by an unrestrained competition not only between the capital and the industry of different classes in the same country but also by extending that competition as much as possible to all other countries but he proceeded cautiously duties not exceeding thirty per cent were substituted in some cases for absolute prohibition in others for exorbitant but ineffective duties thus foreign manufactured silk and foreign gloves articles hitherto prohibited 
but to be bought in every shop, were admitted at a duty of 30%. On cotton goods, a uniform duty of 10% was substituted for duties varying from 50% to 75%. On linens, a fixed duty of 25% for duties varying from 40% to 180%. On woolens, 15% for 50% to 67.5%, and so on. Iron, copper, zinc, tin, lead, earthenware, glass, paper, bottles, printed books, and many other articles were brought into Huskisson's comprehensive schedule. But imports were by no means to be free. Huskisson was a tariff reformer, not a tariff abolitionist. A tariff was devised primarily with a view to revenue, incidentally to afford some measure of protection to the home producer, and some preference to the colonies, and not least to kill the smuggling trade. Let the state, said Huskisson, have the tax which is now the reward of the smuggler, and let the consumer have the better and cheaper article, without the painful consciousness that he is consulting his own convenience at the expense of daily violating the laws of his country. But while the state and the consumer were his first consideration, the interests of the manufacturer were not forgotten. If, under the new tariff, he had to face foreign competition, the simultaneous reduction of duties on raw materials gave him a better chance of facing it successfully. Other changes were about the same time effected. Bounties on exports were gradually abolished laws forbidding the emigration of artisans and providing for the regulation of wages in the Spitalfield silk industry were repealed. And most important of all, a serious effort was made to relieve the increasing tension between labor and capital by the repeal of the combination laws. The English law had always regarded trade combinations of all kinds with extreme disfavor as conspiracies in restraint of trade. From the time of Edward I to that of George IV, legislation directed against such associations had been practically continuous and conspicuously inoperative. In 1823, the statute book contained from 30 to 40 enactments designed to prevent associations either of employers or employed. It was not, however, until the last years of the 18th century, when the economic results of the Industrial Revolution began to be felt, that trade unions, as now understood, became obtrusive. In 1800, a strenuous attempt was made by the legislature to crush them once for all. Under the act of that year, any artisan who combined with others to advance his wages, to decrease the quantity of his output, or to interfere with the management of the business rendered himself liable to imprisonment. In a word, the strike was a crime, the trade union was an unlawful association. During the next twenty years, more particularly during the period of trade depression after 1815, the relations of labor and capital became steadily worse. The repeal of the Spitalfields Act and of the act prohibiting emigration brought the whole question to the notice of Parliament, and a select committee appointed in 1824 reported that the combination laws had not only not been efficient to prevent combinations either of masters or workmen, but on the contrary it had a tendency to produce mutual irritation and distrust, to give a violent character to the combinations, and to render them highly dangerous to the peace of the community. In accordance with the recommendation of the committee, a law was passed repealing all the existing acts against trade combination and leaving masters and workmen alike absolutely free to combine. Hume and Francis Place, a radical tailor, were responsible for this measure. Huskisson regarded it as too sweeping. His fears were speedily realized. The immediate results were disastrous. Several strikes occurred, accompanied by considerable violence and disorder, and in 1825, 
it was found necessary to pass a further act which declared that combinations had been found injurious to trade and commerce dangerous to the tranquillity of the country and especially prejudicial to the interests of all who were concerned in them the common law of conspiracy was consequently reaffirmed a very limited right of combination was conceded but penalties were prescribed for violence threats intimidation molestation or obstruction by any person for the purpose of forcing a master to alter his mode of business or a workman to refuse or leave work or of forcing any person to belong to or conform to the rules of any club or association the general effect of this act was to render trade unions non-legal but not necessarily criminal associations as such they were excluded from the benefits of the friendly societies act and their funds were left at the mercy of dishonest officials in this unsatisfactory position they remained for more than forty years labor troubles though serious in themselves did not seriously retard the general economic recovery the wisdom of the measures promoted by robinson and huskisson were speedily vindicated by results gloomy prognostications were unfulfilled and on the meeting of parliament in eighteen twenty five ministers were greeted with a chorus of congratulations our present prosperity said the mover of the address in the house of lords was a prosperity extending to all orders all professions and all districts the debate in the lower house was an echo of that in the upper and both were endorsed by the judgment of a highly competent contemporary observer nearly all property has risen greatly in pecuniary value and every branch of internal industry was thriving agricultural distress had disappeared the persons employed at the cotton and woolen manufactures were in full employment the various departments of the iron trade were flourishing on all sides new buildings were in progress of erection and money was so abundant that men of enterprise though without capital found no difficulty in commanding funds for any plausible undertaking a detailed statistical investigation substantiates these glowing generalizations but only a few examples can here be quoted the official value of the exports which in eighteen twenty was forty eight million nine hundred and fifty one thousand five hundred and thirty seven pounds rose by eighteen thirty to sixty nine million six hundred and ninety one thousand three hundred and three pounds imports in the former year were thirty two million four hundred and thirty eight thousand six hundred and fifty pounds in the latter forty six million two hundred and forty five thousand two hundred and forty one pounds the imports of foreign wool which amounted in eighteen twenty to less than ten million pounds in eighteen thirty exceeded thirty two million pounds the number of spinners employed in the manufacture of cotton rose in ten years from sixty eight thousand two hundred and fifty seven in eighteen twenty one to one hundred and thirty five thousand seven hundred and forty two similar illustrations of expanding prosperity might be almost indefinitely multiplied end of section seven Section 8 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 4 The Last Years of Tory Rule, 1822 to 1830, Social and Fiscal Reforms, Catholic Emancipation, Part 2 the pace was at first too rapid when trade is booming manufacturers have no time to think they act and apparently to the end of time will act as though the sun of prosperity would shine forever as though cyclical disturbances were unknown phenomena to the improvidence of honest trade was added the folly and knavery of wild financial speculation 
to the excitement thus engendered there had been no parallel since the bursting of the south sea bubble no scheme was too fantastic to secure the support of the unwary over one hundred and seventy four million pounds of capital was subscribed for new companies during the year eighteen twenty four and the beginning of eighteen twenty five four hundred thirty five petitions for private bills were presented to the session of eighteen twenty five and no fewer than two hundred and eighty six became law money was exceptionally cheap and banks and discounters were ridiculously complacent the inevitable results ensued as the year eighteen twenty five went on the all too familiar symptoms of the coming storm began to manifest themselves demand slackened stocks accumulated prices came down with a run banks took alarm confidence was shaken credit contracted and by the end of the year england was in the throes of a terrible financial crisis on december fifth the great banking house of sir peter pole and company suspended payment as they kept the accounts of forty-four country banks the shock thus given to credit was tremendous in the next few weeks seventy-eight banks including five great london houses closed their doors the mint and the bank of england did all they could to mitigate the severity of the crisis sovereigns were coined and issued at the rate of one hundred and fifty thousand a day but the bank itself was saved mainly by the accidental discovery of seven hundred thousand one-pound notes after this the violence of the storm abated but the government felt compelled to propose legislation to prevent if possible its recurrence the circulation of notes under five pounds was prohibited in england after february fifth eighteen twenty nine footnote scotland successfully resisted the prohibition of small notes a result due largely to the letters of malachi malagrother in which sir walter scott showed himself no unworthy successor to swift End footnote. and an important measure was passed to give greater security to country banks hitherto under the charter of the bank of england no private bank might have more than six partners all restrictions of this nature were now removed in the case of all banks except those within sixty-five miles of london despite urgent pressure the government refused in the true spirit of benthamite laissez-faire to issue exchequer bills but they persuaded the bank to advance three million pounds to merchants upon the security of their merchandise these means did much to restore confidence to capitalists but little to alleviate the sufferings of the wage earners these sufferings during the winter of eighteen twenty five and eighteen twenty six were acute on the whole they were borne on the testimony of the king's speech with exemplary patience but nevertheless riots were reported from many manufacturing centres from norwich bradford trowbridge dudley carlisle and all parts of lancashire in a single week over one thousand power looms were smashed in blackburn in the neighbourhood and throughout lancashire the destruction of fixed capital was great prolonged drought in the year of eighteen twenty six added to the general discomfort and in fear of deficient harvests the government hurriedly adopted two remedial measures by the first wheat stored in bonded warehouses was allowed to come into market on payment of a duty of ten shillings per quarter by the second the government was authorized temporarily to open the ports to a limited amount five hundred thousand quarters of foreign oats and other grain having passed these bills parliament was dissolved on june second the general election created little excitement but the two questions most in agitation were the corn laws and the catholic claims a brief autumn session was opened on november fourteenth in order to give ministers an indemnity for further though temporary infringement of the corn laws 
before Parliament reassembled, the Duke of York, most kind and best-natured of princes, passed away, January 5th, 1827. The king was anxious to succeed his brother as commander-in-chief, but Lord Liverpool insisted that the Duke of Wellington should have the post. It was his last exercise of authority as prime minister. Before the session was a week old, he was struck down by apoplexy, February 17th, and though death was not immediate, he never recovered sufficiently to take any further part in politics. It was said of him with truth by the American minister that if he was not the ablest man in his cabinet, he was essentially its head. His mortal illness not only dissolved the cabinet, but broke up the party which for years past had been kept together only by his authority and tact. Upon whom would his mantle fall? I think somehow, wrote Creeby, it must be Canning, after all, and that then he'll die of it. In both respects, Creeby's forecast was accurate but Canning's succession was by no means a foregone conclusion. It was settled only after weeks of negotiation and intrigue, and it smashed into fragments the party to which he belonged. That Canning was incomparably the ablest man in the cabinet and in the party goes without saying, but he had no strong political connection. His Catholic sympathies were not popular in the country. His liberal views were repugnant to the upper house, and his brilliant wit did not conciliate the lower. He rarely, it was said, delivers an important speech without making an enemy for life. Because he talked so well, men thought him a knave, as they thought Castlereagh a fool because he talked so badly. Eight Duke signed a remonstrance to the king against his appointment as prime minister, and when it is remembered that Tory peers returned over 100 members to the House of Commons, the strength of the forces opposed to Canning will be appreciated. The day-to-day -day details of the struggle which ensued may be followed by the curious in the correspondence and diaries of J.W. Crocker, who was behind the scenes. They are more interesting than edifying. Conscious of his own claims, Canning informed the king, in plain terms, that the substantive power of a prime minister he must have, and what's more, must be known to have. But conscious also of his isolation in his own party, he advised the king to form an anti-Catholic ministry without him. The king, with a just appreciation of Canning's value at the Foreign Office, suggested that Canning and Peel should serve under the Duke of Wellington. Canning declined, and on April 10th received His Majesty's commands to form a government and kissed hands as First Lord of the Treasury and Chancellor of the Exchequer. Of the members of the late cabinet, Peel, Eldon, the Duke, Lord Bathurst, Lord Melville, and Lord Westmoreland refused to serve in the new. Canning was consequently compelled to look to the Whigs for general support, though Lord Lansdowne and Tierney were the only prominent members of that party who entered the cabinet. Robinson, raised to the peerage as Lord Goderich, became colonial secretary with the leadership of the House of Lords. Lord Dudley went to the Foreign Office. Sturges Bourne kept the Home Office warm for Lord Lansdowne until July. Lord Harrowby retained the presidency of the Council, and Huskisson that of the Board of Trade. Of the new appointments, the most interesting were those of Copley, who, as Lord Lyndhurst, accomplished the amazing feat of ousting Lord Eldon from the Woolsack, and Palmerston, who, retaining the secretaryship of war, for the first time entered the cabinet. He seldom quitted it during the next thirty-five years. Canning survived the attainment of his honorable ambition only long enough to taste the bitterness of power. 
a chill caught at the duke of york's funeral fastened upon a constitution already undermined his opponents gave him no peace peel stood aside in dignified aloofness but the tory underlings literally hunted him to death in the house of commons and in the lords he was attacked with cruel acerbity by the leading peers he managed with huskisson's help to carry through the commons an ingenious measure providing for a sliding scale on imported corn but it was so emasculated by the lords at the instance of wellington that it was withdrawn the broken session ended on july second on august fourth canning was seized with mortal illness and on the eighth he died at chiswick canning's reputation rests primarily upon his foreign policy proclaimed to the world in language not devoid of bombast it was none the less conceived on sound lines and executed with unusual vigour in a sense larger than he knew he called the new world into existence to redress the balance of the old his contemporaries in europe clung to the outworn formulas and absolutist principles which had dominated diplomacy in the eighteenth century and had inspired the settlement of eighteen fifteen it is to the eternal credit of canning to have perceived that the edifice built upon these foundations could not stand more than this he understood as few did that the ideas and forces which had emerged from the revolutionary chaos ideas which continental statesmen were anxious only to repress were fundamentally conservative in essence among these the most potent was that of nationality and upon this canning's policy was founded hence his memory as a diplomatist links itself with those of the great constructive statesmen the cavours the bismarcks whose work is characteristic of the nineteenth century as a domestic reformer he must be classed with the enlightened statesmen of the pre-revolutionary epoch the pitts darandas and turgot to reform in the narrower electoral sense he was opposed of administrative reform he was a keen advocate the causes of religious equality of slave emancipation of free trade of free labor lost in canning one of their best and most effective friends goderich carried on canning's administration during the recess there was some shuffling of places and some new men were introduced but as the ministry was practically stillborn the details are unimportant goderich after a fruitless effort to allay ministerial squabbles and jealousies resigned on january eighth eighteen twenty eight the duke of wellington succeeded to the premiership and for a few months presided over a cabinet which differed little in composition from that of his predecessors the most important changes were the return of peel to the home office with the lead of the commons and the appointment of goulburn to the exchequer but the canningites were not comfortable and in the summer a considerable reconstruction was effected to the undisguised relief of the duke huskisson tendered his resignation as colonial secretary huskisson indeed was willing to be over persuaded but the duke promptly closed negotiation it is no mistake it can be no mistake it shall be no mistake dudley palmerston grant and lamb followed huskisson's example the weakness of the new government in foreign policy has been already exposed their domestic policy now claims consideration but it cannot be understood without a clear appreciation of the position of their chief the great duke did not regard politics with the eye of the ordinary politician principles might be eternal but positions were to be maintained only so long as they were tenable office meant to him not the achievement of ambition nor even a grasp upon opportunity but the fulfilment of grim duty 
Without this knowledge, his conduct in high office might appear eccentric, not to say unprincipled. In reality, no politician was ever more simply and transparently conscientious. It was his duty to serve his king, whether in the camp or in the Senate, and no fear of criticism, no dread of inconsistency could deter him from doing it. The two years of Wellington's administration were memorable for three large measures of reform. The Test and Corporation Acts enacted during the Anglican fervor of the Restoration required every holder of office, civil or military, to receive the sacrament according to the rites of the established church. Ever since 1727, following an example set by the sagacity of Walpole, an indemnity bill had been enacted annually by Parliament, and thus dissenters had been relieved of all penalties for violation of these laws. For a hundred years, therefore, the acts had been inoperative, but they still galled the pride, though they did not hinder the ambition of the Protestant dissenters. In 1828, Lord John Russell carried against the government a motion in favor of their repeal, Wellington and Peel bowed to the sense of the House, and despite bitter opposition from Sir Robert Ingalls and Lord Eldon, the sacramental test was abolished. There was, however, substituted a declaration apparently void of offense that office holders would do nothing to injure or subvert the Protestant established church. The same session witnessed the enactment of a corn law identical in principle with that which in the previous year Wellington's amendment had destroyed. A sliding scale was established under which a duty of 25 shillings 8 pence was imposed when the price was at or below 64 shillings and the duty diminished to 1 shilling when the price rose to 73 shillings. The sliding scale proved, however, only modestly successful. It put too large a premium upon speculation. But the government were now confronted by a problem even more difficult than that of the Corn Laws. On the resignation of the Canningites, Mr. Vesey Fitzgerald was appointed to succeed Mr. Charles Grant at the Board of Trade. Fitzgerald was personally and politically one of the most popular men in Ireland, but he was, of course, a Protestant. Daniel O'Connell, though a Catholic, resolved to oppose his re-election for County Clare, and that resolution marked a turning point in the history of Ireland. But its significance must not be exaggerated. It is sometimes assumed, if not asserted, that now for the first time the assault was delivered against the virgin fortress of Protestant ascendancy. As a matter of fact, the outworks had been carried a generation ago, only the citadel remained untaken. By successive acts of the Irish legislature passed between 1774 and 1792, most of the provisions of the penal code had been repealed and most of the Catholic disabilities had been removed. By the Act of 1793, the Catholics were even admitted to the parliamentary franchise. Certain disqualifications remained. No Catholic could sit in Parliament, nor become a sheriff, nor rise to the highest posts in the army or at the bar. But these pressed not so much upon the Catholic masses as upon the classes loyal for the most part to the English connection. Pitt intended that a final and complete measure of emancipation should be a concomitant of the act of union, but for that avowed intention the opposition to the union would have been less easily overcome. Pitt, however, counted without his sovereign. The king refused all concessions to the Catholics, Pitt resigned, and the healing measure was deferred until it was too late to heal. The Catholic question was not, however, permitted to slumber, either in the imperial parliament or in Ireland. Motions were perpetually made in the House of Lords by Lord Grenville, Lord Donamore, and Lord Wellesley. 
in the commons by Grattan, Plunkett, and Canning. Canning carried the house with him in 1812, and thenceforward, thanks mainly to the influence of Castlereagh, the question was officially regarded as an open one in the Liverpool cabinet. It was in Ireland, however, not at Westminster, that the decisive battle was fought and won, and the victory was due primarily to the genius of a single individual, Daniel O'Connell. O'Connell was, of all Irish leaders, incomparably the greatest. He was magnificently endowed by nature for the part he had to play. A Herculean frame, a keen intellect, a lambent humor consummate eloquence, a voice at once sonorous and capable of the finest shades of expression, an enthusiastic temper, tenacity and adroitness combined, above all, a perfect appreciation of Irish character. Born in 1775, O'Connell became in 1810 secretary to the Catholic Committee, and in 1823 founded and organized the Catholic Association suppressed by the government in 1825 as an unlawful combination and confederacy. The association was ingeniously reconstituted by O'Connell and made its power felt in the Waterford election of 1826 when it broke down the political ascendancy of the Beresfords. Still more clearly was its power demonstrated in 1828. O'Connell's triumphant return for County Clare created throughout Ireland intense excitement and compelled the Wellington government to face a situation which, by general admission, was fundamentally changed by that event. To refuse to Catholics the abstract rights of citizenship was one thing, to decline to allow a duly elected Catholic to take his seat in the House of Commons was another. Peel realized the dilemma in which the government was placed. Lord Anglesey, their Lord Lieutenant, warned them that the hope of maintaining tranquility in Ireland depended upon the forbearance and the not very determined courage of O'Connell, and urged them, much as he abhorred the idea, of truckling to the overbearing Catholic demagogues to utilize the momentary calm to adjust the question. By the end of the session of 1828, Peel had convinced himself that the Catholic question must be settled once for all, but he decided, and with obvious propriety, that for him to remain a member of the government which must settle it was impossible. Moved, however, partly by his sense of the gravity of the crisis, partly by his loyalty to the Duke, above all by his conviction that he alone could carry an Emancipation Bill through Parliament, he consented, perhaps to the detriment of his own reputation, to withdraw his resignation. Parliament met on February 5th, 1829, and learned, to their amazement, that the King recommended them not only to take into deliberate consideration the whole condition of Ireland, but also to review the laws which impose disabilities on His Majesty's Roman Catholic subjects. To this speech the king had given a reluctant assent and stipulated that the relief bill should not be introduced until the Catholic Association had been suppressed. A bill to effect this object was passed rapidly through both houses, but before the royal assent was given, the association voluntarily dissolved itself. The time had now come for the fulfillment of the pledge given in the speech from the throne. On March 3rd, the king made a final effort to avert surrender. The ministers consequently resigned, and the king eventually and reluctantly gave way. On March 5th, Peel rose as a minister of the king and sustained by the just authority which belongs to that character to vindicate the advice given to his majesty by a united cabinet. The bill passed its second reading in the Commons by a majority of 180 and in the Lords by 105. In the lower house, Peel made a gallant attempt to defend the bill upon its merits. To the peers, Wellington bluntly commended it as a preferable alternative to civil war. 
I am one of those, he said, who have probably passed a longer period of my life engaged in war than most men, and principally, I may say, in civil war, and I must say this, that if I could avoid by any sacrifice whatever even one month of civil war in the country to which I am attached, I would sacrifice my life in order to do it. Such language from the great soldier could not fail of its appeal. Protests were signed by the Duke of Cumberland, Sidmouth, Eldon, and thirty-six other peers, but before the middle of April the bill became law. It contained various supposed securities against the spread of Roman Catholicism, but as regards civil rights it was a large and generous measure. Roman Catholics became eligible for almost all offices, civil, military, parliamentary, and municipal, save those of Regent, Lord Lieutenant, Lord Chancellor of England or Ireland, and one or two others. But this politic and generous concession was immediately followed by a measure of wholesale and, as it seemed, penal disfranchisement. Emancipation had been won by the votes of the forty-shilling freeholders. Their triumph was short-lived, for by a second act of 1829 the qualification in Irish counties was raised to ten pounds, and the electorate was thus reduced from two hundred thousand voters to twenty-six thousand. It is true that for thirty years the forties had been regarded as practically nothing more than a part of the livestock upon the estate of the landlord, who created them for his own purposes. But in 1826, and still more conspicuously in 1828, the cattle had strayed from the fold. The weapon, said Peel, which the landlord has forged with so much care and has heretofore wielded with so much success has broken short in his hand. The disfranchising act was the result of this miscarriage. Broom regarded it as the high price, the all but extravagant price of emancipation, but he was willing to pay it. In Ireland it was regarded, and small wonder, as a surreptitious attempt to cancel the effects of emancipation and to redress the balance in the interests of the ascendancy party. Less intrinsically important, but not less irritating, were the slights inflicted upon O'Connell himself. Despite his eminence at the Irish bar, he was markedly passed over in the distribution of silk, and even more unfortunately, he was compelled, before taking his seat, to seek re-election for County Clare. He was not opposed, and the re-election rendered necessary by technicalities was hardly more than formal, but it gave the agitator an opportunity which he did not neglect. In my person, he declared, the county of Clare has been insulted. To you is due the honor of having converted Peel and conquered Wellington. Such language may sound mere bombast to Englishmen. In Ireland, it had its effect. Thanks in part to the adroitness of the agitator, in part to the tactlessness of the English ministries, emancipation did little to allay discontent in Ireland. Conceded in a reluctant spirit, footnote, Peel's personal position is disclosed frankly and fully in his memoirs, volume one. Emancipation involved a painful sacrifice to him and some discredit to the University of Oxford. Peel felt bound to resign his seat and failed to secure re-election against Sir Robert Ingalls. He immediately secured a seat at Westbury, End footnote. and carried with irritating concomitance, a healing measure may well fail to heal. Granted to Ireland in 1801, emancipation might have served to consolidate the Union. Wrested from England in 1829, it was destined to inaugurate the agitation for repeal. Neither the king nor his ministry long survived the act of Catholic emancipation. Apart from questions of foreign policy already discussed, there was nothing in the remaining years of the king's reign to demand the attention of the historian. On June 26th, 
1830, George the Fourth died after a prolonged illness, and his brother, the Duke of Clarence, succeeded to the throne as William the Fourth. The change of sovereigns was opportune. A bad man and a bad king, George the Fourth died unregarded and unrespected by his subjects. His successor, bluff, genial, and kind-heartedly eccentric, was commended to them alike by his profession and by his personality. And times were such that the cause of monarchy needed all the adventitious aid he could command. Before the new reign was many weeks old, the July Revolution had broken out in France, the old Bourbon monarchy had been finally overthrown. A severe blow had been struck at the principle of legitimacy, and therefore at the European settlement founded upon it. Louis Philippe had been installed as a citizen king, Charles X was in exile, and half Europe was in a state of turmoil and insurrection. The events passing in France exercised an immense influence upon England and upon Europe, but the history of that reaction belongs to a new reign and a new ministry. For the long spell of Tory administration was at an end, and Lord Palmerston, not Lord Aberdeen, was responsible for the protection of British interests during the critical years which followed upon the Revolution of 1830. The Parliament elected in 1826 was dissolved in consequence of the death of George IV on July 24, 1830. The general election took place amid signs of unusual excitement. The government lost 50 seats. Broom was returned without trouble or expense to himself for Yorkshire, and two of Peel's brothers were defeated. On November 2nd, the new Parliament was opened by the King in person, and Wellington at once made it clear that no measure of parliamentary reform could be expected from the existing administration. The attack was immediately opened in both houses all along the line, and on November 16th, the Ministry, having already suffered defeat on the question of the new civil list, announced its resignation. The formation of the new government was entrusted to Lord Grey. The resignation of Wellington and Peel in 1830 closes a great epoch in English history. England had been ruled by a succession of Tory ministries virtually without break for 60 years. Their rule was coincident with the most momentous period of modern history, a period which witnessed the loss of our first colonial empire and the beginning of a second, the French Revolution and the Napoleonic Wars, the Irish Union and Catholic Emancipation, the Industrial Revolution and the birth of a new England. The overthrow of the Wellington administration was in the nature of things. The Tory party had ceased to stand for the old principles and was exhausted in personnel. In the pre-reform era, the swing of the party pendulum was more deliberate than now, but it was nevertheless perceptible at half-century intervals. Moreover, Peel and Wellington had made the fatal error of encouraging foes at the expense of friends. The old Tories were disgusted at the great betrayal of 1829. The new Whigs were stimulated to fresh hopes by the obvious weakening in the resistance to reform the accession of a new sovereign with Whig sympathies, the overthrow of the legitimist regime in France, the manifestations of liberal tendencies in Italy and Germany and Belgium, all these contributed to the overthrow of the old regime in England. But the vital issue which in 1830 divided parties was that of parliamentary reform. Wellington bluntly refused to touch the question. In his famous speech in the House of Lords, he said emphatically that he was not only not prepared to bring forward any measure of this nature, but he would at once declare that as far as he was concerned, as long as he held any station in the government of the country, he should always feel it his duty to resist such measures when proposed by others. Footnote. For the whole of the speech, see Hansard, Third Series, Volume 152. 
the speech is almost an echo of Paley's words. We have a House of Commons composed of 558 members, in which number are found the most considerable landowners and merchants of the kingdom, the heads of the army, the navy, and the law, the occupiers of great offices in the state, together with many private individuals eminent by their knowledge, eloquence, and activity. If the country be not safe in such hands, in whom may it confide its interests? Does any new scheme of representation promise to collect together more wisdom or to produce firmer integrity? Moral Philosophy, Volume 2, page 220, and footnote. That speech sealed the fate of the old Tory party and definitely closed the half-century of Tory rule. End of Section 8《Section 9 of England Since Waterloo》by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Book Two, The Reign of the Middle Classes, 1832 to 1867. Chapter Five, The Rule of the Whigs, Parliamentary Reform and After. 1830 to 1833, Part 1. The supreme issue between parties at this moment was that of parliamentary reform. It was therefore appropriate that on the resignation of Wellington and Peel, the formation of the new ministry should be entrusted to Earl Grey. Born in 1764, the scion of an ancient Northumbrian house, and the oldest son of a distinguished soldier, he entered the House of Commons as member for his native county in 1786. In 1792 he became the most influential spokesman of the Society of Friends of the People, and thence onwards for forty years was the foremost advocate of parliamentary reform. In 1792, 1793, and 1797 he brought forward motions in the House of Commons only to encounter a solid phalanx of opposition inspired to reaction by the dread example of France. But despite his long political career, Lord Grey had little administrative experience, less than two years at the Admiralty and the Foreign Office, 1806 and 1807, represented the sum of his official life. Nevertheless, he was obviously marked out as the chief of a reform ministry, and the king's choice merely ratified general expectation. With four exceptions, his colleagues in the cabinet were all peers, and the exceptions were not far removed from that order. Edward Geoffrey Stanley, eldest son of Lord Stanley, who was heir to the earldom of Derby, became chief secretary for Ireland. Lord Altrip was Chancellor of the Exchequer. Mr. Charles Grant, afterwards Lord Glenelg, was President of the Board of Control. And Sir James Graham, a great territorial magnate, was First Lord of the Admiralty. The Secretaryships of State were all entrusted to Canningites. Lord Palmerston, Foreign. Lord Goderich, War and Colonies. And Lord Melbourne, Home. Huskisson also would doubtless have been included in the new ministry, but for his death by accident at the opening of the Manchester and Liverpool Railway, September 15, 1830. His absence seriously weakened Gray's government in the Department of Finance. With the possible exception of the Foreign Secretary, the most masterful personality in the cabinet was Henry Broom, now elevated to the peerage and the woolsack. Footnote. As Lord Broom and Vox, Vox et praetaria nihil, as the wits had it, Revel's comment is characteristic. The joy is great and universal. All men feel that he is emasculated and drops on the woolsack as on his political deathbed. Once in the House of Lords, there is an end of him, and he may rant 
storm and thunder without hurting anybody. End footnote. Lord Grey's own boast in regard to his cabinet is said to have been that in acreage it surpassed any previous record. Whiggism was certainly dying hard. The situation which confronted Lord Grey's ministry was not devoid of difficulty. In Ireland, O'Connell had already unfurled the flag of repeal, and the troops had been called out, October 1830, to suppress the disturbances which marked the inauguration of the new agitation. In England, there were ominous signs of a recrudescence of the recent epidemic of social disorder. Luddites and Rick Burners were again to the fore. Every post, writes Greville, brings fresh accounts of conflagrations, destruction of machinery, association of laborers, and compulsory rise of wages. Cobbett and Carlyle write and harangue to inflame the minds of the people, who are already set in motion and excited by all events which have happened abroad. Footnote. Richard Carlyle, a well-known secularist lecturer. End footnote. The new ministry had not been in office two days before they found it necessary to issue a proclamation offering large rewards for the discovery of offenders, rioters, or burners, and promising all the Lord Lieutenant's assistance in the suppression of disorder. Hampshire, Wilts, Berkshire, and Buckingham were particularly conspicuous for crime and disturbance, and in December no less than 1,000 rioters, 700 of whom came from Hans and Wilts, were brought to trial before a special commission at Winchester. In January, Carlyle was convicted at the Old Bailey of addressing inflammatory language to the laboring classes and was sentenced to two years' imprisonment and a fine of 200 pounds. Cobbett, arraigned on a similar charge, escaped punishment owing to the postponement of his trial for six months. By that time, the panic caused by agrarian disorder had abated, and public interest was concentrated upon the fate of the Reform Bill. For some large measure of parliamentary reform, the time was clearly ripe. It is true that there had been in recent years some slackening in the intensity of the demand, for whereas the year 1821 had produced a crop of 19 petitions in favor of reform, and the year 1823 no less than 29, the years between 1824 and 1829 had produced none at all. Commercial prosperity is a pure solvent of political agitation. But in 1830, prosperity was once more waning, and interest in purely political questions was quickened by the outbreak of revolution in France. In July, the legitimist monarchy, which had been restored by the bayonets of the Allies in 1815, finally tottered to its fall. Charles X was driven into exile, and Louis-Philippe, Duke of Orléans, thanks mainly to the support of the Parisian bourgeoisie, was installed as the citizen king. The shock thus given to the principle of legitimacy was felt in greater or less degree in most of the European states, in Poland, Italy, Germany, and most of all in Belgium. Great Britain felt it least, but even here it gave renewed impulse to the cry for parliamentary reform. That cry could no longer be stifled or ignored. Not since the middle of the 15th century had there been any general enactment in regard to the electoral franchise and the act of Henry VI, confining the county franchise to 40 shilling freeholders, had been reactionary and restrictive. The Tudors had greatly increased the number of the House of Commons by bestowing representation on Wales and by the creation of numerous parliamentary boroughs, many of them towns of considerable importance. The Stuarts followed suit, but since the revolution of 1688, there had been no alteration either in the franchise or in the distribution of seats in England and Wales. But in the half-century before 1830, a new England had, as we have seen, come into being. Population, which had been thin and scattered, was not only increasing with great rapidity, but also shifting in distribution. 
towns which in Tudor and Stuart times had been important centres of trade were decaying into hamlets, villages were growing into cities. The counties north of the Trent, which down to the 18th century were mostly poor and thinly populated, were becoming the centres of industrial activity. Bradford-on-Avon was yielding pride of place in the woolen trade to Bradford-on-Air. Manchester and Liverpool, Leeds and Birmingham were quickly attaining to the preeminence which they have never since lost. But electoral changes had not kept pace with economic development. Of the 203 parliamentary boroughs in 1831, no less than 115 were contained in the ten maritime counties between the Wash and the Severn and the county of Wilts, and of the 115, no less than 56 were on the tideway. But this distribution, as Mr. Porritt points out, presents no paradox when the social and industrial conditions of England up to the reign of Elizabeth are borne in mind. Any anomalies which had arisen were of comparatively recent origin, but they were sufficiently glaring. Such places as Old Sarum, Newton, Isle of Wight, Gatton, Bramber, Bossany, Burlston, Hedden, Brackley, Tregony, some of them hardly distinguishable hamlets, returned two members apiece. Manchester, Birmingham, Leeds, Sheffield, Wolverhampton, Halifax, Bolton, and Bradford returned none. The vagaries of the electoral franchise were not less bewildering than those of the distribution of seats. The county members were elected on a uniform franchise by the 40-shilling freeholders. But in the boroughs, the utmost variety prevailed. In some, known as Scott and Lot boroughs, all ratepayers were entitled to vote. In others, only the hereditary freemen. In others, only members of the municipal corporation. In others, potwallopers. Footnote. All persons with a hearth of their own. And footnote. While in others, the franchise was attached to the ownership or occupation of particular houses known as ancient tenements. But it is noticeable that even in boroughs where the franchise was theoretically wide, it was in practice narrow and confined. Thus in Gatton, where it was enjoyed by all freeholders and Scott and Lot inhabitants, there were only seven qualified to exercise it, and in Tavistock, only ten. In the whole of England, Wales, Ireland, and Scotland, out of 16 million people, there were only 160,000 electors. It was alleged in 1793 by the Society of the Friends of the People that out of 513 members for England and Wales, 70 were returned by boroughs which had practically no electors at all, 90 by boroughs with less than 50, and a further 37 by towns with less than 100 voters apiece. According to another calculation, 254 members were said to represent an aggregate constituency of less than 11,500. Bad in England, things were even worse in Ireland and Scotland. Out of the 300 members in the Irish House of Commons, 216 represented boroughs or manors, and of these, 200 were elected by 100 individuals and nearly 50 by 10. In Scotland, the 66 boroughs contained in the aggregate 1,450 electors. Edinburgh and Glasgow had 33 apiece, while the county of Butte, out of a population of 14,000, possessed 21 electors, of whom only one was resident. It was the restriction of the franchise which threw such enormous power into the hands of the government of the great territorial magnates and the Indian nabobs, and which contributed in large measure to the almost universal corruption prevailing in the borough constituencies. A vote was a possession far too valuable to be parted with except for a high consideration and it has been estimated that prior to 1832, not more than one-third of the members of the House of Commons represented the free choice even of the limited bodies of electors then entrusted with the franchise. 
Sidney Smith, writing in 1821, declared that the country belongs to the Duke of Rutland, Lord Lonsdale, the Duke of Newcastle, and about twenty other holders of boroughs. They are our masters. The statement was grossly exaggerated, but it had in it more than a semblance of truth. The Duke of Newcastle did in fact return eleven members, Lord Lonsdale nine, Lord Darlington seven, and the Duke of Rutland, the Marquis of Buckingham, and Lord Carrington six apiece. In 1780, the Duke of Richmond declared that not more than 6,000 men returned a clear majority of the House of Commons. A petition presented in 1793 on behalf of the Friends of the People by Gray declared that 357 members were returned by 154 patrons, of whom 40 were peers. According to the detailed analysis of Oldfield, no less than 487 out of 658 members of the House of Commons were, in 1816, nominees. Of the English members, 218 were returned by the nomination or influence of 87 peers, 137 by 90 powerful commoners, and 16 by the government itself. Of the 45 Scotch members, 31 were returned by 21 peers, the remainder by 14 commoners. In Ireland, 51 were returned by 36 peers and 20 by 19 commoners. Allowing a considerable margin for exaggeration in these various estimates, it is impossible in face of them to maintain that the pre-reform system was representative in anything but the crudest sense. Gross corruption alike in the constituencies and among the elected or nominated representatives was the inevitable corollary of such a system. To the sale and purchase of seats, the term cannot in fairness be applied. A seat was as much a marketable commodity in the 18th century as an advowson in the 19th, and the legitimacy of the transaction was recognized alike in Pitt's Reform Bill of 1785 and the Act of Union of 1800. In each case, the value of a seat was estimated at over 7,000 pounds. Nor was this excessive, for sums far in excess of this amount were frequently spent on a parliamentary contest. Thus, in 1768, the Bentinks and the Lowthers spent 40,000 pounds apiece in contesting the counties of Cumberland and Westmoreland, while at York in 1807, the expenses of Lord Milton and Mr. Lascelles are said to have amounted in the aggregate to the astounding sum of £200,000. Repeated attempts were made to restrain these abuses, but with very imperfect success, and long before 1830 it had become obvious that nothing would really avail to cleanse the Aegean stable short of a drastic redistribution of seats and a wide extension of the franchise. In 1780, the Society for Constitutional Information, anticipating by 60 years the famous points of the Charter, demanded universal suffrage and equal electoral districts. Pitt, in 1785, gave ministerial sanction to a scheme of extinguishing some of the rottenest of the boroughs by compensating their owners and distributing their representatives among the counties and some of the largest towns. To admit the principle that a borough was property, saleable and purchasable, was perhaps inexpedient, though it subsequently served to oil the wheels of the Irish Union, and the rejection of Pitt's bill meant the postponement of reform for nearly half a century. No one could think seriously of reform while France was involved in revolution, still less while the energies of the nation were concentrated upon defeating Napoleon. But the flood pent up for twenty-five years burst all barriers after 1815 with results already described. Throughout the autumn and winter of 1830 and 1831, there was a continuous agitation in favor of reform. The seed sown in many soils during the last half-century was rapidly ripening for harvest. The philosophical radicalism of the utilitarians, the work of Bentham, of James and John Stuart Mill, 
of Hume and others, the democratic liberalism of Francis Place, the communism of Robert Owen. All these were bearing fruit in the ferment of opinion and the political organization which immediately preceded the Reform Bill of 1831. The first work of the Gray Ministry was to appoint a committee to draft a bill to amend the representation of the people in England and Wales. The committee consisted of two members of the Cabinet, Lord Durham and Sir James Graham, Lord Duncannon, the Chief Government Whip, and Lord John Russell. To these, as they were approaching the end of their labours, the Duke of Richmond was added. Creevey declares that of the bill which is known to history as his, Lord Grey knew not one syllable till it was presented to him already cut and dry. This myth has been finally exposed by the publication of Graham's memorandum on the proceedings in the Committee of Four. The original draft proposed by the committee was substantially amended by the cabinet, who, number one, struck out the vote by ballot, retained septennial as against quinquennial parliaments, and, number three, substituted ten pounds for the proposed twenty-pound rating qualifications in boroughs. On March 1st, Lord John Russell, though not yet a member of the cabinet, laid the ministerial proposals before the House of Commons. They proved to be more drastic than even the most sanguine radicals had dared to hope. The first feature of the bill was a large measure of disfranchisement. Sixty boroughs with less than 2,000 inhabitants apiece, returning in the aggregate 119 members, were to be totally disfranchised. The United Boroughs of Weymouth and Malcolm Regis were to lose two of their four members. Forty-seven other boroughs with more than 2,000, but less than 4,000 inhabitants, were to lose one member apiece. Thus, 168 seats were placed at the disposal of the government. Enfranchisement was on an adequate but less generous scale. Seven of the largest unrepresented towns, like Manchester and Birmingham, were to get two members apiece. Twenty more were to get one. The London boroughs were to get eight. Fifty-seven were to go to the English counties, three to Ireland, five to Scotland, and one to Wales. The net reduction in the numbers of the House was to be sixty-two. As to voting qualification, there was an immense simplification. In the boroughs, there was to be a ten-pound rating qualification, and freemen were to retain their votes. In the counties, copyholders and fifty-pound tenants were added to the old forty-shilling freeholders. The bill passed the second reading by a majority of only one. Before it was committed, General Gascoigne carried, by a majority of eight, an instruction that there should be no diminution in the total number of representatives of England and Wales. On this rebuff, the ministry declared upon an immediate appeal to the country. On April 22nd, Parliament was dissolved in hot haste by the King, and amid the wildest excitement, a general election was held. The issue was as nearly isolated as it ever can be in English politics. The bill, the whole bill and nothing but the bill, was the rallying cry of the Whigs. Their triumph was complete, and they came back with a majority of more than a hundred. The reform bill, with only a few minor changes, was reintroduced by Lord John Russell on June 24th, and on July 7th it was read a second time by a majority of 136, 367 to 231. The Tories fought it for two months in committee, but before the end of September it was sent up to the Lords, backed by a majority, substantially undiminished. The Lords, after nearly a week's debate, threw it out, October 8th, by a majority of 41. 199 to 158. The action of the Lords is said to have brought the country to the verge of revolution. There were serious riots in several of the large towns, notably in Derby, Nottingham, Worcester, Coventry, and most serious of all in Bristol. It is difficult to believe that these were the work of the classes about to be enfranchised. The Reform Bill, however, was looked upon only as an installment. 
the political principle once admitted was to be the lever for far-reaching social and economic change. Behind the utilitarians were the Owenites. Social revolution was to come in the wake of political reform. The Whigs might persuade themselves that a measure so generous and comprehensive would be accepted by all parties as a final settlement. The Tories knew better. So did the Radicals, the Chartists best of all. Not otherwise can we explain the disturbances in the autumn of 1831. Commercial and agricultural distress and the dread of pestilence. Footnote. Cholera appeared in November. End footnote. Doubtless added fuel to the flames, but the conflagration was due to a mass of economic and social discontent which had been accumulating during the last half century. That discontent found, as we shall see, cold comfort in the clauses of the Act of 1832, but the immediate cry was for the bill. Parliament was reopened on December 6th. A week later, Lord John Russell introduced his third reform bill, this time in a shape considerably altered. The disfranchisement clauses were decidedly less rigorous and were based not only on the principle of population, but upon the number of inhabited houses and the contribution of the town to the assessed taxes. More important still, the numbers of the house were to remain unchanged. The bill passed rapidly through all its stages in the House of Commons, and before the end of March was launched upon its perilous voyage to the Lords. Would the ship reach port safely? In no responsible quarter was it believed that the Lords would yield without coercion or the certain prospect of its application. If they gave the bill a second reading, it would only be with the intention of emasculating it in committee. Under these circumstances, some of the Cabinet were in favour of obtaining from the King an immediate guarantee that he would assent, if necessary, to the creation of a sufficient number of peers to carry the bill. The king, however, demurred. Lord Grey himself was reluctant, and the majority of the cabinet decided to await events. In the Lords, thanks to the attitude of the waverers, the bill was read a second time, April 14th, by a majority of nine, 184 to 175. But on May 7th, Lord Lyndhurst, carried by a large majority, 151 to 116, a motion in favor of postponing the clauses with Schedule A, dealing with the disfranchisement of the smallest boroughs until the rest of the bill had been approved. The situation foreseen by Lord Durham, Sir James Graham, and other stalwarts in the Cabinet had actually arisen, and the Cabinet now advised the King to create as many peers as might ensure the success of the bill in all its essential principles. The king, though in favor of extensive reform, was strongly opposed on principle to the coercion of the peers and regretfully accepted the proffered resignation of the ministry. The House of Commons expressed its confidence in the retiring ministry by a large majority, and the country was profoundly agitated by the crisis. The king turned to Lord Lyndhurst, to Manners Sutton, then Speaker of the House of Commons, and to the Duke of Wellington. Neither Lyndhurst nor Manor Sutton could form a ministry, but the Duke was willing to try in order to save the sovereign from the indignity of having so gross a violation of the Constitution imposed upon him. But everything really depended upon Peel. No ministry could now avoid a large measure of reform. Not even to save the King and the Lords was Peel prepared to pledge himself to this. Negotiations broke down, and on May 14th, the Duke advised the King to recall Lord Grey. For his own part, the Duke promised that in order to save His Majesty's personal honour as to the creation of peers, he would remove all pretense for such a creation by withdrawing his opposition. Greville's appreciation of the personal conduct of the two leading actors in this episode is not very wide of the mark. Peel acted right from bad motives, the Duke wrong from good ones. 
The Grey Ministry was reinstated, and the King, in writing, granted permission to Earl Grey and to his Chancellor, Lord Broom, to create such a number of peers as will be sufficient to ensure the passing of the Reform Bill, first calling up peers' eldest sons. The battle was won. The opponents of the bill in the House of Lords withdrew, and on June 7th the bill received the royal assent. The same session witnessed the passing of similar bills for the reform of the representation in Scotland and Ireland. The changes effected by this legislation in its final shape may now be summarized. First, as regards disfranchisement, 56 boroughs with less than 2,000 inhabitants were totally disfranchised. Of these, 55 had two members each. One, Higgum Ferrers, had one. Weymouth and Malcolm Regis lost two of their four members, and 30 boroughs with less than 4,000 inhabitants lost one of their two members. Thus, 143 seats were surrendered. These were redistributed as follows. 65 to English and Welsh counties, 44 to 22 English boroughs to each, 21 to single-member boroughs, 8 to Scotland, 5 to Ireland. The total numbers therefore remain unchanged at 658. In the boroughs, a uniform 10-pound household franchise was established with the reservation of the rights of resident freemen in corporate towns. In the counties, the old 40-shilling freeholders were reinforced by copyholders and long leaseholders, and by tenants at will, paying a rent of £50 a year. In Scotland, the county franchise was given to all owners of property of £10 a year and to certain leaseholders, in Ireland, to owners as in England, and £20 occupiers. The final and total result was the addition of some 455,000 electors to the roll, in addition which more than tripled the electorate. In the towns, political power was vested mainly in the merchants, manufacturers, and shopkeepers. In the counties, in the landowners and farmers. In addition to the clauses defining the franchise and the distribution of seats, the Act of 1832 provided for the formation of a register of voters for the division of constituencies into convenient polling districts, and for the restriction of the polling to two successive days. End of Section 9《Section 10 of England Since Waterloo》by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 5 Parliamentary Reform and After, 1830 to 1833, Part 2. That the Reform Acts of 1832 constituted a great political and parliamentary achievement will be denied by none. Before, however, an attempt is made to estimate its real and permanent significance, a few words may be said as to the part played in the struggle by individuals. Throughout the whole crisis, the king's behavior was, by general consent, admirable. Not only was his conduct entirely correct in the constitutional sense, but he bestowed much time and thought in going over every part of the plan, examined its bearings, asked most sensible questions. Lord Grey himself bore similar testimony. The king's noble conduct is indeed a just theme for praise, and entitles him to all our gratitude and all our zeal in his service. To the general principles of the bill he gave a cordial assent, as to the means by which it was forced through one branch of the legislature, he had grave misgivings. How far they were justified is still a matter of controversy. In the Commons, the lion's share of the work fell to Lord John Russell, ably supported by Lord Altrip, but in the Cabinet they were strongly backed both by Graham and Lord Durham but neither the king's closet nor the cabinet nor the commons was the scene of the real conflict over reform. 
the key to the position was in the House of Lords. It was the Lords, not the monarchy, nor the commons, who were fighting for their political lives. For a century and a half the peers, partly in their own chamber, still more through their nominees in the lower house, had been the real rulers of England. In 1832 they were called upon to surrender a trust which they had administered, on the whole with conspicuous fidelity and success, albeit by methods which the public opinion of today regards as indefensible. That they were blind to the new forces, political, social, and economical, which the last half-century had generated, may be imputed to them for stupidity, but not for unrighteousness. Nor can it be denied that their estimate of the results to be apprehended from reform was nearer the mark than that of their opponents. Lord Grey himself represented his proposals as aristocratic. His colleagues hoped that an effectual check would be opposed to the restless spirit of innovation. The Whigs generally believed that the bill was at once conservative and final in its terms. Nothing would have amazed them more than to learn that they were opening the floodgates to the tide of democracy. Neither the Whig aristocracy, who introduced the first reform bill, says a philosophical writer, nor the middle class, whose agitation forced it through, conceived it to be, even implicitly, a revolutionary measure. The power of the crown and of the House of Lords were to be maintained intact, the House of Commons was to be more representative, but not more democratic than before. The change was regarded as one of detail, not of principle, in no sense a subversion of the Constitution, but merely its adaptation to new conditions. The Duke of Wellington judged it far more shrewdly. There is no man who considers what the government of king, lords, and commons is, and the details of the manner in which it is carried on, who must not see that government will become impracticable when the three branches shall be separate, each independent of the other, and uncontrolled in its action by any of the existing influences. It is true that the full force of the shock administered in 1832 was not felt for at least two generations. Despite organic change, the government of England continued to be aristocratic in personnel at least until 1867. Nevertheless, it is a sound instinct which assigns to 1832 the real point of transition from aristocracy to democracy. The changes of 1867 and 1884 were implicit in the earlier revolution. That these changes were neither foreseen nor intended by Lord Grey and his colleagues is true, but it is nothing to the point. They opened the gates. The capture of the citadel was merely a question of time. The instinct, therefore, which led the Lords to resist to the last the proposals of reform was, from their own point of view, perfectly sound. With the passage of the bill, their political death warrant was signed. That an extensive measure could have been much longer deferred, few people on either side believed, and events have more than justified the general belief. Though reform was inevitable, the act by which it was accomplished was open to grave criticism. That it cruelly disappointed the hopes of the working classes was conclusively proved, firstly by the Chartist agitation, and secondly by their refusal to support Cobden and Bright in their crusade against the Corn Laws. Neither then nor later had the Whigs any intention of satisfying democratic aspirations. Still less did their bill satisfy the philosophical liberals. It was based not on principle, but on expediency. It darned and patched. 
it abolished some of the more flagrant abuses, but it left innumerable anomalies. It broke the principle of aristocracy without admitting that of democracy. Representation was based neither on numbers nor wealth nor education. Worst of all, in view of the philosophers, no effort was made to secure representation for minorities. Nonetheless, the Whigs had a great achievement to their credit, and if in 1848 the epidemic of revolution left us scatheless, we must thank the legislation of 1832 not less than that of 1846. No time was lost in testing the temper of the new constituencies. After an interval no longer than was needed for the arduous work of registration, Parliament was dissolved on December 3rd, and the elections began forthwith. In some places rioting occurred, but on the whole the new machinery worked smoothly, and the elections were conducted without serious disturbance. The polls went, as was to be anticipated, strongly in favor of the ministerialists. Order Hunt was defeated at Preston, where, as in other ancient boroughs, the effect of the Reform Act was to circumscribe the constituency, and Cobbett, though afterwards returned for Oldham, failed to secure election at Manchester. It is difficult to state with precision the disposition of parties in the new Parliament. No two contemporary estimates agree. Nor is this remarkable, for party lines were a good deal blurred. The Conservatives, to adopt the name by which Crocker had recently rechristened the Tory party, numbered something between 143 and 167. The ministerialists are variously estimated at anything between 382 and 491, the latter figure including all who were not Tories. But the Radicals numbered 71 and the Repealers 38, and both were in opposition to Lord Grey's government. It was deemed wise, in view of the crowd of inexperienced members, to have an experienced speaker in the chair. Manners Sutton was therefore re-elected, though not without opposition from a handful of Radicals and Repealers, led by Coppet and O'Connell. Despite the Speaker's authority, there was, however, much confusion at the beginning of the session. For two nights and a half, says Crocker, the vehemence and disorder was so great that people began to think the National Convention was begun. Things gradually settled down, but the outer aspect of the House corresponded to a real disintegration and confusion of parties. The most remarkable feature of the new Parliament was the way in which Peel, with amazing rapidity and dexterity, re-established his personal position. You will be placed in a new, and I fear painful, position in the House of Commons. So Lord Aberdeen had written to him on the eve of the session. The prediction was entirely falsified by the event. Before the session was over, Peel was the real master of the House. The fate of government was and he knew it in his hands. Crocker was right. Peel played his game with consummate adroitness. Despite their great majority, the ministry was from the outset weak and rapidly grew weaker. But Peel kept them in for two reasons. They were doing his work, and there was no possible alternative. What are we doing? he wrote to Crocker on March 5, 1833, at this moment, we are making the Reform Bill work. We are protecting the authors of the evil from the work of their own hands. It was, as we shall see, no idle boast. The King opened Parliament in person on February 5th, but his speech, despite the solemnity and significance of that occasion, was singularly colourless. There was some reference to the affairs of Portugal, Holland, and Belgium the Parliament was reminded of its anxious duty to promote, by all practicable means, habits of industry and good order among the labouring classes of the community, 
and of the expiration of the charters of the East India Company and the Bank of England. But the bulk of the speech was devoted to Ireland. Irish questions were indeed destined to dominate not only the speech, but the session and the parliament. Before proceeding to discuss them, it may be well to deal with other legislative achievements of the session. The East India Company had lost its commercial monopoly in India in 1813, and the opportunity was now taken for completing the work then begun. The charter was renewed for another twenty years, but only on condition that the company confined itself to the task of political administration. The monopoly of the China trade was to be abandoned. Trading operations in India were to cease. Europeans were to be allowed to settle in India without hindrance, and natives were to be admitted to office. To compensate for the loss of its commercial privileges, the company was to receive for 40 years an annuity of £630,000 charged upon the revenues of India. A legal member was at the same time added by the appointment of Macaulay to the Governor-General's Council. The Charter of the Bank of England, last renewed in 1800, was to lapse in 1833. It was now renewed for a further term of 21 years, but the conditions were considerably modified and Parliament reserved to itself the right to revise them after 11 years. Despite strong opposition, the Bank of England was permitted to retain its most cherished privilege. It remained the banker of the government. It alone, among the London joint stock banks, was allowed to issue notes and these notes, except at the bank of issue, were to be legal tender. The last provision was erroneously interpreted as a partial return to incontrovertibility. As a fact, it represented a concession to the country banks and an attempt to avoid a recurrence of the dangers, more particularly the drain of gold revealed in 1825 through 1826. The convertibility of Bank of England notes remained, however, entirely unimpaired. Two useful legal reforms stand to the credit of the Lord Chancellor. One for the abolition of fines and recoveries greatly simplified the conveyance of land. The second was an act for the better administration of justice in His Majesty's Privy Council. The Long Parliament, in its zeal against the Star Chamber, and other prerogative courts, had swept away the greater part of the judicial business of the council, but the latter still retained the supreme appellate jurisdiction for the oversea dominions of the crown. The multiplication of colonies and dependencies restored to the council an importance of which the long parliament had never dreamt. Moreover, in 1832, the High Court of Delegates established as the Supreme Court for Ecclesiastical Causes by Henry VIII, was abolished, and its jurisdiction was transferred to the Privy Council. But the procedure of the latter was haphazard. Accordingly, in 1833, its judicial functions were transformed to a committee consisting of the President of the Council, the Lord Chancellor, and such Privy Councillors as held or had held high judicial office, including, in ecclesiastical cases, such archbishops and bishops as were privy councillors. The constitution of the court was further amended in 1871 and again in 1876. Since 1833, its business has rapidly increased with the development of the oversea dominions and it now occupies a position of immense importance in the machinery of empire. In ecclesiastical affairs, its jurisdiction has not been unchallenged. The first session of the first reformed parliament is memorable in the history of elementary education. Down to 1833, the whole responsibility for the education of the children of the poor had been assumed by the churches. The Church of England had done its work since 1811 through the National Society, founded by Andrew Bell, the British and Foreign School Society, 
founded by Joseph Lancaster, and maintained for the most part by the liberality of nonconformists, had been in operation three years longer. The budget of 1833 provided for a treasury grant of £20,000 a year in aid of elementary education. By a treasury minute, August 30th, 1833, the administration of the money was entrusted to the two societies already named. None of it was to be spent on the erection of schools, and no grants were to be made unless they were met by at least an equal amount of voluntary contributions. Though not in itself imposing, the grant laid the foundations of a gigantic edifice. The Treasury grant for education was not the only evidence of concern for the welfare of the rising generation. Of even greater immediate significance was the acceptance of Lord Altrip's factory bill. During the last thirty years, the conscience of the nation had been increasingly alive to the scandals connected with the employment of children in factories. Under the apprentice system, parish apprentices were sent from the workhouses to the factories, there to be used up as the cheapest raw material in the market. The evils, moral and sanitary, connected with this white slavery compelled the intervention of the state. Thanks mainly to the efforts of the first Sir Robert Peel, the Health and Morals Act was passed in 1802. The Act laid down certain sanitary regulations and provided that the children should not be kept at work for more than 12 hours a day, but it applied only to legal apprentices. The result was to stimulate a traffic, in some cases still more hideous, because more unnatural, between the mill owners and the parents. Instead of parish apprentices, said Sir Robert Peel, the children of the surrounding poor are preferred, whose masters, being free from the operation of the former Act of Parliament, are subjected to no limitation of time in the prosecution of their business though children are frequently admitted there to work 13 or 14 hours a day at the tender age of seven years and in some cases still younger. Parliament could not resist this demand for investigation, especially when urged by such a representative cotton spinner as the first Sir Robert. The Commons appointed a committee in 1816, the Lords in 1819, and as a result, the Second Factory Act, 1819, was passed. No children under nine years of age were to go into a factory. For children under 16, the hours were limited to 12 and night work was prohibited. But the Act referred only to cotton mills. Further restrictions were imposed by Sir John Hobhouse's Act of 1825, which provided for definite meal times and a quarter holiday on Saturdays. The next stage was marked by the ten hours agitation initiated by Richard Ostler and Michael Thomas Sadler. Sadler introduced but failed to pass a ten hours bill in 1831. At the general election of 1832, this eminent Tory philanthropist was defeated at Leeds, and the parliamentary leadership of the movement was assumed by Lord Ashley, better known later as the Earl of Shaftesbury. Ashley reintroduced the Ten Hours Bill early in the first session of 1833. The government favoured councils of delay, but defeated in the House, adopted Ashley's bill, and in a modified form passed it into law. Lord Altrip's Act as it is generally designated, introduced several new principles into factory legislation. A distinction was drawn between children aged 9 to 12 and young persons 13 to 18. Children were not to work more than 9 hours a day, or more than 48 a week, and were to spend 2 hours a day in school, the thin edge of the half-time wedge. Young persons were limited to a 69 hours week, and neither for them nor for children was night work permitted. 
for the first time inspectors were appointed to see that the provisions of the act were enforced for a middle-class parliament this was not a bad beginning the cotton spinners did not like it but they were compelled to give way the benevolent interest of the new parliament was not confined to the white slaves at home of the rich legislative harvest gathered in this session the most memorable crop was the act for the abolition of slavery throughout the british colonies the question had long been kept before the mind and conscience of the country by a band of pure-hearted philanthropists such as clarkson william wilberforce zachary macaulay and fowl buxton pitt and fox lent their powerful support in the house of commons and in eighteen o seven the traffic in slaves was legally prohibited in eighteen twenty three fowl buxton introduced a motion in favour of the gradual abolition of slavery itself and canning in the same year issued a circular intended to secure the better treatment of slaves the immediate result of this movement was not favourable to discipline in the west indies the planters were infuriated and talked of independence the slaves became restless and unruly in eighteen thirty three the government grasping the nettle firmly decided on total emancipation all children under six years of age were to be freed immediately all who should hereafter be born were to be born into freedom slavery was to cease on august first eighteen thirty four and the slave owners were to be compensated by a loan of fifteen million pounds but between slavery and freedom there was to be an intermediate period of legal apprenticeship lasting for twelve years during this period the freed slaves were to work for their former masters during three-fourths of their working week or day in return for maintenance during one-fourth of their time they were to be free to work for hire this well-meant but complicated compromise did not stand before the bill passed the intermediate period was reduced from twelve years to seven and ultimately it lasted only four instead of a loan of fifteen million pounds the planters received an out-and-out -out compensation of twenty million pounds of the ultimate economic effects of emancipation this is not the place to write but it cannot be doubted that the free traders and abolitionists were over sanguine the act of eighteen thirty three was based primarily not on economic but on moral grounds at the cost of real self-sacrifice the nation deliberately determined on an act of righteousness and benevolence nor was the appropriate reward withheld end of section ten section eleven of england since waterloo by john arthur ransom marriott this librivox recording is in the public domain Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter Six, Irish Affairs, O'Connell and the Whigs, eighteen thirty-three to eighteen thirty-seven, Part One. From the foregoing record of fruitful legislative activity, it needs something of an effort to turn to the Irish policy of the Whig government. But now and for many sessions to come, Ireland filled the stage at Westminster and determined the fate of more than one ministry in 1832 the new electorate in ireland returned 38 repealers and 67 unionists but of the latter 37 favored the extinction of tithes thus the country as an irish writer points out had declared strongly against the tithes and for the union the irish executive was committed by lord grey to lord anglesey as lord lieutenant and mr stanley as chief secretary during the critical years eighteen thirty to eighteen thirty three the latter was the virtual ruler of ireland stanley was a man of brilliant parts unsurpassed in debate a vigorous administrator 
clear-sighted within a limited range and transparently honest but he was absolutely devoid of that insight and imagination which are essential to a statesman who governs a dependency though thrice a conservative prime minister stanley was a typical whig he was a devout and unquestioning believer in the english system of government and firmly convinced that its adoption was alone sufficient to secure to all the various races of mankind social happiness and political contentment to ireland he offered this blessing in the exact spirit of cromwell's proclamation of sixteen forty nine we come by the assistance of god to hold forth and maintain the lustre of english liberty in a nation where we have an undoubted right to do it wherein the people of ireland if they listen not to such seducers as you are may equally participate in all benefits to use liberty and fortune equally with englishmen if they keep out of arms that any irishman should be blind to the lustre of english liberty or slow to avail himself of liberty and fortune in an english sense is what no genuine englishman has ever been able to understand and such lack of understanding is probably an important part of the equipment of a governing race stanley was typically devoid of it if the irish would keep out of arms and refuse to listen to seducers like o'connell all would be well after thirty years of stagnation in domestic politics the englishman was about to set his house in order if irishmen would behave nicely their house should be put in order too they too should have an extended franchise and municipal self-government a reformed poor law and a national system of education but the irony of the situation was that for whig reform of the english type extended to ireland with the best intentions the average irishman cared nothing during the decade that followed upon catholic emancipation interest in ireland was concentrated upon one question presenting itself under various aspects what was emancipation intended to mean did it mean merely the admission of a few catholic gentry to the parliament at westminster or the inauguration of a catholic administration in ireland would it secure the abolition of a system under which a literal tenth of the produce of all the poorest land in ireland went to the support of a wealthy heretical and alien church what is the irish question asked mr disraeli one said it was a physical question another a spiritual now it was the absence of the aristocracy then the absence of railways it was the pope one day potatoes the next during the early thirties the answer to this question was unequivocal the irish question was tithes to the irish peasant tithe was hateful on many grounds it was an english institution never having been known in ireland until the synod of cashel in 1175 it was a badge of protestant ascendancy never having been exacted until the reformation and it was a perpetually recurrent drain upon his scanty material resources thus the injury was partly material and partly moral tithe was at once a drain upon his purse a seer upon his conscience no such argument availed for the episcopalian farmer but the protestants episcopalian and presbyterian alike had managed in large extent to evade the impost tithe was of course only part of a larger question the position of the established church in ireland was entirely anomalous it was magnificently endowed to put its revenues at eight hundred thousand pounds a year would probably be an understatement yet despite its endowments and despite the penal legislation of the eighteenth century its adherents were proportionately fewer than they had been two centuries before 
In 1834, the population of Ireland was close to 8 million. Of these, 6,427,712 persons were Roman Catholics. 852,064 were Protestant Episcopalians. 642,356 were Presbyterians, while 21,808 adhered to other forms of Protestant descent. The Church of the 800,000 Protestant Episcopalians was established and endowed. The Church of the 600,000 Presbyterians was endowed, but not established. The Church of the 6 million Catholics was neither established nor endowed. On an Irish Sabbath morning, says Sidney Smith, the bell of a neat parish church often summons to worship only the parson and an occasionally conforming clerk, while two hundred yards off a thousand Catholics are huddled together in a miserable hovel and pelted by all the storms of heaven. The immediate object of the Catholic peasant, however, was to get rid of the payment of the tithe. In 1830, war was proclaimed. Let your hatred of tithe be as lasting as your love of justice. Such was the advice of the Catholic Bishop of Kildare, Dr. Doyle. Advice of this kind rarely falls upon deaf ears in Ireland. The fuel was already gathered. It needed but a spark to ignite it. By 1831, all Ireland was ablaze. Payment of tithes, says a contemporary account, was almost everywhere refused. The usual system of threats and murder was again set in motion. The clergyman dared not ask. The willing occupier dared not pay. At the end of 1831, committees were appointed in both houses to investigate the question, the committees recommended, number one, an immediate grant by government to the distressed clergy, and number two, a scheme for the extinction of tithes and their commutation for a charge upon land. On these lines, Lord Grey's government legislated in 1832. An act was passed authorizing the government to advance a sum not exceeding £60,000 to the Irish clergy and to reimburse themselves by collecting the arrears from the tithe payers. Later in the year, Stanley obtained the sanction of Parliament to a second measure, making tithe composition compulsory and permanent. Both measures were violently opposed by O'Connell. The first, he declared, would make the Lord Lieutenant tithe proctor general for all Ireland. The second would only perpetuate abuses while both would serve to buttress an institution which was hopelessly rotten and unsound. Meanwhile, the social condition of Ireland was going from bad to worse. The legislation of 1832 had served only to accentuate bad feeling. No tithes could be collected. A widespread system of boycotting was initiated. The executive was powerless, and by the end of the year, Anarchy was everywhere triumphant. Such were the circumstances under which the general election of 1832 was held. O'Connell definitely unfurled the banner of repeal, and Ireland returned 45 members pledged to sustain him in his demands. The King's speech of 1833, after foreshadowing a tithe commutation bill, and a bill dealing with the Protestant establishment, proceeded. But it is my painful duty to observe that the disturbances in Ireland, to which I adverted at the close of the last session, have greatly increased. The spirit of insubordination and violence has risen to the most fearful height, rendering life and property insecure, defying the authority of the law, and threatening the most fatal consequences if not promptly and effectually repressed. The debate on the address was bitter and protracted. That crime was rife in Ireland, O'Connell did not deny. But crime was due not to agitation, but to misgovernment. O'Connell was answered by Stanley, and the answer of Stanley may be compressed into a sentence. 
a government to be loved must first be feared. Reform come coercion and undying resistance to repeal. This was the program of the ministry. On February 12th, Lord Altrip introduced into the House of Commons a bill dealing with the temporalities of the Church in Ireland. It was a large measure involving, as originally drafted, a considerable dose of disendowment. Opinion, however, was not ripe for the acceptance of the principle of appropriation, and this part of the bill was subsequently dropped. The remainder of it, after a stormy passage, became law. Two archbishoprics and eight bishoprics were suppressed. First fruits and church cess were discontinued. Many sinecures were abolished. Some ecclesiastical incomes were reduced and a commission to deal with the surplus revenues of the church was appointed. But on the main question, victory rested with the ascendancy party. Revenues were to be redistributed, but not alienated. On February 15th, a coercion bill was introduced by Lord Grey into the House of Lords. It was admittedly of the severest character. Greville describes it as a consomme of insurrection gagging acts, suspension of habeas corpus, martial law, and one or two other little hards and sharps. Immense powers were committed to the Lord Lieutenant, and Ireland was to be temporarily governed by martial law. The debate in the Commons revealed the fact that the Ministry was divided as to the expediency of the measure. Altrip's speech in introducing it was singularly ineffective but Stanley, in a great speech, saved the bill. Despite the opposition of repealers and radicals, the bill became law in April. The session, however, sorely tried the cohesion of the government, and before its close, the ministry was reconstructed. Lord Wellesley succeeded Lord Anglesey as Lord Lieutenant, while Stanley was replaced as Chief Secretary, first by Hobhouse and afterwards by Littleton. Footnote, Lord Wellesley's son-in-law, and footnote. But Stanley's promotion to the colonial office involved no change in the Irish policy of the administration. In opening the session of 1834, the King was able to congratulate Parliament upon a great improvement in the state of Ireland, that his words were not merely due to official optimism is proved alike by the private correspondence of the time and by the public statistics of Ireland. Crime and outrage had undoubtedly diminished. The castle had regained the upper hand, but the causes of social disorder remained. Against the Union and against tithes, the agitation was waged without remission. The King's speech referred to both questions. It announced such a final adjustment of the tithes as may extinguish all just causes of complaint without injury to any institution in church or state. At the same time, it declared His Majesty's unalterable resolution to maintain inviolate, by all the means in his power, the legislative union. The action of the ministry was unequal in resolution and consistency to the words of the king. There was indeed no faltering with the question of the Union. On April 22nd, O'Connell moved for a select committee to inquire and report on the means by which the dissolution of the Parliament of Ireland was effected, on the effects of that measure upon Ireland, and on the probable consequences of continuing the legislative union between both countries. The motion was defeated by a majority of 523 to 38. In regard to the church problem, the ministry was less fortunate. The tithe question was still far from settlement, and behind the tithe question loomed the whole question of the Irish establishment. Late in 1833, Littleton had induced Parliament to vote £1 million to the distressed tithe owners and to authorize the government to collect the arrears. Early in 1834, a bill was introduced for the commutation of tithes into a land tax payable to the state at the rate of 80% of their previous value. In 
in the course of the debate ministers were challenged on the larger question of appropriation the challenge was variously answered by stanley and lord john russell the dissension of the cabinet stood revealed to the world johnny in more senses than one had indeed upset the coach the government agreed to the appointment of a commission to inquire into the whole question of the position of the irish church on this stanley resigned sir james graham the duke of richmond and the earl of ripon formerly lord goderich went with him the cabinet was temporarily patched up but their troubles were by no means at an end hopelessly divided on the principle of appropriation they were still more divided on that of coercion stanley's act of eighteen thirty three was to expire on august first some members of the cabinet were opposed to its renewal at any rate in its entirety lord wellesley was prepared to rule without it littleton undertook to manage dan his management however was so clumsy as to bring the whole government down like a pack of cards the cabinet insisted on the renewal of the coercion act o'connell declared that he had been tricked by littleton littleton was obliged to resign altrip followed lord grey refused to go on without altrip and on july ninth his own resignation was announced the reform ministry was at an end the great ship had gone to pieces on the irish rocks the immediate cause of the disaster was clearly the indiscretion of littleton but the essential causes went much deeper the ministry as a whole had no clear mind on the irish question and in policy they were divided for the actual course of administration stanley whether at the castle or at the colonial office was primarily responsible with the best intentions in the world stanley cannot be described as a sympathetic administrator and he was cordially disliked by the irish members but whatever his shortcomings stanley knew his own mind he cannot be blamed for not knowing the minds of littleton wellesley altrip and lord john this double-mindedness was fatal to the ministry of lord grey and their failure in ireland was neither unaccountable nor undeserved to the general record of failure there was however one exception stanley must have full credit for having done more than any other individual to lay the foundations of a national system of education his bill was based upon the principle of a combined literary and a separate religious education a board was to be constituted by the lord lieutenant composed partly of protestants and partly of catholics the board was to appoint teachers authorize school books and to superintend the whole system of national elementary education even the suspicion of proselytism was to be banished four days a week were to be devoted to combined moral and literary one or two to separate religious instruction finally the parliamentary grant was to be withdrawn from the kildare street society and bestowed upon the national board stanley's act has been the basis of elementary education in ireland from that day to this though the whole spirit of its administration has been altered stanley contemplated a mixed system to this idea the whole genius of the irish people roman catholics and protestants is irresistibly opposed and in this case the national genius has proved itself too strong for legislative intention and enactment throughout the length and breadth of ireland with very small exceptions the school system is to-day not mixed but strictly denominational during the last months of lord grey's ministry ireland claimed a large but not an exclusive share of public attention apart from ireland the session of eighteen thirty four was memorable on the one hand for a great legislative achievement and on the other for the evidence it afforded as to the existence of a new force in english politics 
with the former we shall deal presently as to the latter a word must be said at once the legislation of eighteen thirty two even more conspicuously than that of eighteen twenty eight footnote repeal of the test and corporation acts and footnote made the protestant dissenter a really effective political force it was clearly manifested in the new parliament already in eighteen thirty three the house of commons had permitted mr pease the first quaker elected for one hundred and forty years to take his seat on making an affirmation in the same session an act was passed to enable quakers moravians and separatists on all occasions to substitute an affirmation for an oath in eighteen thirty four the dissenters petitioned for the exclusion of the bishops from the house of lords and indeed for the complete separation of church and state a bill for the admission of dissenters to university degrees passed the commons but was rejected in the lords other bills for the relief of dissenters from church rates for the removal of restrictions upon the celebration of marriages in dissenting chapels and for the commutation of english tithes did not get so far few legislative achievements have had a more significant bearing upon the social and moral life of the people than the poor law amendment act of eighteen thirty four for this legislation the whig ministers are entitled to unstinted credit no government seeking only popularity would have touched the question no government genuinely concerned for the social and economic welfare of the people could have evaded it the great poor law of elizabeth had conferred upon the indigent poor two rights upon the impotent the right to maintenance upon the lusty and able-bodied the right to be set on work appropriate to an era of paternal despotism and economic transition the act might have wrought much mischief but for the wisdom of administrators an amendment of seventeen twenty two imposed a salutary restraint upon careless methods of relief and virtually insisted upon the workhouse test the last years of the eighteenth century witnessed a lamentable lapse from sound principles the administrators of that day were not however without excuse it was a time of economic transition of high political excitement and of terrible suffering among the poorest class but the remedies applied proved even worse than the disease they led to the wholesale pauperization of the rural laborers gilbert's act of seventeen eighty two effected the first breach in good administration though permissive in terms it was widely adopted and its principles were still further enforced and rendered compulsory by the act of thirty six george the third seventeen ninety six the workhouse test was abolished work was found for the workless and allowances were made in aid of wages lax administration was even more responsible than panic legislation for the wholesale demoralization which ensued it guaranteed to every laborer not merely his life but a living more plentiful than he could obtain in the open labor market it undertook that his means should increase with the increase of his family it acknowledged the duty of saving him from suffering irrespective of his own merits or demerits it gave practically to everybody who asked it charged not only the weak upon the strong but the stupid on the skilful the lazy upon the industrious the drunken upon the sober the dissolute upon the chaste the honest upon the dishonest this terrible impeachment can be proved to the hilt from the report of the commission appointed by lord grey's government in eighteen thirty two the commissioners including such men as dr blumfield bishop of london dr sumner bishop of chester nassau senior sturges bourne and edward chadwick arrived at conclusions which can only be described as appalling economic dislocation and social degradation went hand in hand 
expenditure which in 1701 amounted to about £900,000, rose in 1802 to over £4 million, pounds, and ultimately, in 1818, reached the gigantic total of £7,870,000, or 13 shillings, 4 pence per head of population. Outdoor relief was given in a bewildering variety of forms, by providing gratuitous house room, by money relief in lieu of labor, by parish employment, by the roundsman system, by the labor rate system, and most commonly of all by make-up or bread money, by an allowance, that is, in aid of wages. In some parishes the poor rate exceeded twenty shillings in the pound. Farms were thrown up, land went out of cultivation, Landlords, farmers, and laborers were involved in a common ruin. The wrong inflicted upon the laborers who remained self-supporting and independent was incalculable. The debasement of the rest was matched only by their discontent. Legislation followed immediately upon the report of the commissioners, and neither came a moment too soon. The assent given to the Bill of 1834 was almost unanimous, only twenty votes were recorded against the second reading in the Commons, and thirteen in the Lords. The general principle of the Act was that the situation of the person receiving relief should not on the whole be made really or apparently so eligible as the situation of the independent labourer of the lowest class. The control of poor relief was vested in a board of three commissioners, upon whom immense discretionary powers were conferred. They were to have power to order the erection of workhouses, the formation of unions of parishes, and the drafting of regulations for outdoor relief. In each union, the law was to be administered by a board of guardians, consisting in part of members elected by the ratepayers and in part by the justices of the peace. The law of settlement was relaxed and the bastardy law amended. The core of the act was the appointment of poor law commissioners. The first commissioners were the Right Honorable Franklin Lewis, Mr. Nichols, and Mr. Shaw Lefebvre, and it was these men who, together with their secretary, Mr. Edwin Chadwick, gave the color to the Act of 1834. The act itself was hardly more than a cadre Everything depended on the discretion of the board. For the success or failure of the act, the commissioners and their secretary, not the legislature, were responsible. They saved England from the gravest social and economic danger to which it had ever been exposed. Their work, in particular the abolition of outdoor relief for the able-bodied and the reimposition of the workhouse test, was subjected to severe criticism. They themselves were denounced as the Bashaws of Somerset House, as concentrated icicles. Tory Democrats, like Disraeli, combined with radicals, like Cobbett and the all-powerful Times, to assail the poor law Bastilles, and to abuse the poor man's robbery bill. The remedies applied were indubitably caustic but not more caustic than the gravity and prevalence of the disease demanded. No rosewater surgery, to use Carlyle's phrase, could have sufficed. Financial ruin and moral degradation had stared us in the face. To have saved rural England from bankruptcy was much. It was still more to have restored to the English poor their moral dignity and economic independence. End of section 11. Section 12 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 6 Irish Affairs, O'Connell and the Whigs, 1833 to 1837. Part two. The Poor Law Amendment Bill was proposed by Lord Grey's Ministry. Before it became law, 
Lord Grey had resigned, and Lord Melbourne had become Prime Minister. But the life of the new ministry was from the first precarious. Such strength as it possessed was due mainly to Lord Altrip's personal hold upon the House of Commons. By what was virtually a party plebiscite, Lord Altrip was induced to return to the Cabinet in the lead of the House. The Derby Dilly, with its three insides, remained in opposition. Coalition with Peel and Wellington, though suggested by the King, was wisely declined on both sides. Lord Melbourne, therefore, retained most of the colleagues of Lord Grey. Weak in Parliament, the new ministry was not in favour at court. The King never gave it his confidence and took the first opportunity of dispensing with its services. The opportunity came in November of 1834 with Lord Altrip's succession to the peerage. A new leader had to be found for the Commons. Lord John Russell was proposed, but the King told Melbourne that Russell would make a wretched figure and that Abercrombie and Rice were worse than Russell. On November 15th, the town was electrified by the news that Melbourne's government was at an end. The mystery, which for a long time enshrouded the circumstances attending Lord Melbourne's dismissal, has not even now been entirely dissipated. It is long since a government has been so summarily dismissed, regularly kicked out, in the simplest sense of that phrase. Such was Greville's first impression, and it has been very generally accepted. But it has now become clear that Melbourne himself felt that the main prop of the government was removed by Altrip's succession to the peerage that he intimated to the king the probability of a break-up of the cabinet on the Irish church question, and that he was personally glad to be out of it. Palmerston's account of the matter is entirely corroborative. We are turned out, turned out neck and crop. Melbourne wrote to the king to say that as when he first took his present office, he had represented the influence of Altrip in the Commons as one great foundation of the strength of the government. Now that Altrip was removed to the Lords by the death of his father, he deemed it his duty toward the King to ask whether he wished him to propose arrangements for supplying Altrip's place, or whether he preferred asking advice from other quarters. One of Lord Melbourne's biographers goes so far as to say that the King did what his minister invited him to do. Be this as it may, two things are certain, that the king was anxious to be rid of his ministers, chiefly from apprehensions as to their church policy, and that the prime minister was not sorry to be free of the troubles which he saw immediately ahead of him. Lord Melbourne himself bore the king's summons to the Duke of Wellington. The duke advised his majesty to entrust the formation of a ministry to Peel, but Peel was at the moment in Rome, and in the meantime the Duke became Secretary of State for all departments. The Great Seal was transferred to Lyndhurst, but for some weeks the Duke was literally sole minister. On December 9th, Peel, having travelled post-haste from Rome, kissed hands as First Lord of the Treasury. Negotiations were opened with Stanley, Graham, and other seceders from the late Cabinet, but by preconcerted arrangement the latter declined them. Peel, therefore, had to rely entirely upon conservatives. He himself took the chancellorship of the Exchequer, the Duke took the Foreign Office, Goulburn the Home Office, and Lord Aberdeen war in the colonies. Lyndhurst again became Lord Chancellor. Peel decided not to meet Parliament, but to appeal to the electorate, and on December 30th, Parliament was dissolved. The election that ensued is remarkable chiefly for the address issued by the Prime Minister to the electors of Tamworth. That manifesto marked an epoch in the history of English parties. It laid the foundations of the new conservatism. In it, Peel definitely accepted the Reform Bill as a final and irrevocable settlement of a great constitutional question nor was he opposed to the spirit of the act, if properly understood and wisely interpreted. If by adopting the spirit of the Reform Bill, it is meant that we are to live in a perpetual vortex of agitation, 
that public men can only support themselves in public estimation by adopting every popular impression of the day by promising the instant redress of anything that anybody may call an abuse, I will not undertake to adopt it. But if the spirit of the Reform Bill implies merely a careful review of institutions, civil and ecclesiastical, undertaken in a friendly temper, combining with the firm maintenance of established rights, the correction of proved abuses, and the redress of real grievances. In that case, I can, for myself and my colleagues, undertake to act in such a spirit and with such intentions. The education of the country to the new conservatism was, however, a work of time. The general election of 1835 raised the strength of the conservatives from 150 to 270, but not until 1841 did they find themselves in a clear majority. The new parliament met in temporary quarters at Westminster, both houses having been destroyed by fire during the recess. The opposition carried an amendment of the address, but only by a majority of seven, and Peel decided that he would carry on the government until Easter. But whatever government was in office, Ireland, and particularly the tithe question, demanded immediate attention. Sir Henry Harding, Peel's chief secretary, brought forward a measure which was a simplified edition of Littleton's Bill of 1834. The urgency and magnitude of the evil render it, said the chief secretary, absolutely necessary that Parliament should attempt to rescue society in Ireland from the disorganized state into which it has been thrown by the tithe question. Intimidation has been carried to such an extent as to render it utterly impossible to proceed with the collection of these dues. The Whigs, however, were determined not to allow the Tories to legislate on the tithe question without concurrently affirming the principle of appropriation. The whole question was formally raised by Russell. On the clear issue thus joined, the ministry was decisively defeated, and on April 8th, Peel resigned. Melbourne came back to office, but for the next five years, O'Connell was in power. Melbourne's second ministry did not differ widely in personnel from his first. Lord Palmerston returned to the Foreign Office. Charles Grant, afterwards Lord Glenelg, became Colonial Secretary, and Lord John Russell, with the lead of the Commons, went to the Home Office. Spring Rice became Chancellor of the Exchequer, and Lord Lansdowne resumed the Presidency of the Council. One significant change was made. Broom, whose restless vanity had contributed not a little to the fall of the government in the previous autumn, was not invited to return to the Woolsack, and until January 1836 the Great Seal was in commission. Lord Cottenham, Pepys, was then appointed. The session of 1835 witnessed the enactment of one measure of first-rate importance. For the last three centuries the government of English towns had been growing more and more oligarchical and more and more corrupt. Vested from early times in the general body of rate-paying burgesses, town government gradually passed into the hands of a corporation, consisting generally of a mayor, alderman, and common councillors. These governing bodies were, as a rule, self-elected, and their importance was enhanced by the fact that in them was vested in many cases the right of returning members to Parliament. The creation of new boroughs by the Tudors and Stuarts led to a great increase in the number of these close corporations. Charles II and James II made a determined effort to bring all the corporations under the direct influence of the crown. The effort was attended by very partial success and was one of the contributory causes of the Revolution of 1688. But the abuses connected with municipal government were intensified rather than diminished during the 18th century. The rapid increase of many towns in wealth and population the enhanced significance of parliamentary representation gave to the oligarchical corporations an additional importance. A place on these exclusive bodies was eagerly sought for the pecuniary advantages it conferred. The report of a commission appointed in 1833 revealed a scandalous condition of affairs. 
local administration as now understood was the last thing with which the governing bodies concerned themselves many of the corporations possessed considerable corporate property derived from land lease of tithes tolls of markets and fairs octroi duties and fees in many they administered specific trusts in all they exercised valuable patronage it is hardly too much to say that it was the prevailing rule that all the property and most patronage was administered with a single eye to the advantage of the administrators the revenues of the corporation are variously employed a great part is usually absorbed in the salaries of their officers and entertainments of the common council and their friends it is not often that much of the corporate property is expended on police or public improvements in some towns large sums have been spent in bribery and other illegal practices of contested elections during the election of eighteen twenty six the corporation of leicester expended ten thousand pounds to secure the success of a political partisan and mortgaged some of their property to discharge the liability incurred few corporations admit any positive obligation to spend the surplus of their income for objects of public advantage at cambridge the practice of turning the corporation property to the profit of individuals was avowed and defended it is small wonder that the commissioners found it necessary to report that the existing municipalities neither possess nor deserve the confidence or respect of his majesty's subjects and that there prevailed a distrust of the self-elected municipal councils whose powers are subject to no popular control any discontent under the burdens of local taxation while revenues that ought to be applied for public advantage are diverted from their legitimate use and are sometimes wastefully bestowed for the benefit of individuals sometimes squandered for purposes injurious to the character and morals of the people the provisions of the act of eighteen thirty five were of a drastic character the constitutions of nearly all the old corporate boroughs one hundred and seventy eight in number except london were remodelled on a uniform plan the government was vested in a mayor aldermen and councillors the latter to be elected by all inhabitant householders who for the past three years had been raided to the relief of the poor to the corporation was entrusted all the ordinary duties of local administration and in particular the raising and expenditure of borough funds these funds were to be subject to independent audit the corporations had already lost by the act of eighteen thirty two their exclusive privilege in regard to parliamentary elections and the act of eighteen thirty five was a natural corollary of that great measure inspired by a similar spirit it achieved similar results it registered the first and therefore the most important step in the democratization of local government in england an irish municipal bill was introduced in eighteen thirty six and again in eighteen thirty seven on both occasions it passed through the house of commons but was defeated in the lords not until eighteen forty did it become law under its provisions fifty-eight corporations were abolished and ten were reconstituted on the basis of a ten-pound franchise the same franchise had been adopted in the scotch act of eighteen thirty three apart from municipal reform the legislative energies of the second melbourne ministry were almost entirely concentrated upon ireland early in eighteen thirty five o'connell defined the terms on which he was prepared to keep the whigs in office the question of repeal would be allowed to remain in abeyance provided that the whigs would press to a successful issue three measures the appropriation of the surplus revenues of the irish church to national purposes an extension of the irish suffrage and a sweeping reform of the irish corporations these terms formed the basis of the lichfield house compact compact says russell there was none but an alliance on honourable terms of mutual cooperation undoubtedly existed the whigs remained as before the firm defenders of the union 
O'Connell remained as before the ardent advocate of repeal, but upon intermediate measures on which the two parties could agree, consistently with their principles, there was no want of cordiality. Nor did I ever see cause to complain of O'Connell's conduct. The more straightforward course would have been to give O'Connell the office he undoubtedly desired. Broom, it is certain, urged this course upon the ministers. Equally certain is it that whether Melbourne himself was prepared for it or not, the king's hostility to his admission was immovable. Under a keen sense of disappointment, O'Connell behaved, as Greville put it, admirably well. It is intended, he writes, to leave O'Connell out of the arrangement and at the same time to conciliate him and preserve his support. In this, they, the ministers, have succeeded. O'Connell had his consolations. He missed indeed the opportunity for which he is said to have longed, the opportunity of proving to the Protestants of Ireland that when in power he could and would do them justice. But at any rate, he could secure his co-religionists from injustice. If he was not himself in office, he had approved those who were. Lord Mulgrave became Lord Lieutenant, Lord Morpeth Chief Secretary. The law offices were placed in sympathetic hands, but the man who gave the tone to the Melbourne O'Connell administration was the Under Secretary Thomas Drummond. Whatever the verdict on his policy may ultimately be, Drummond himself was by general admission one of the most striking figures in the history of British rule in Ireland. The difficulties confronting Drummond in Ireland were not slight. Throughout the country and among all classes the spirit of lawlessness was dominant, the tithe war was being waged with undiminished bitterness, faction fights were common, disorder was rife, justice was condemned, and the whole administrative system was utterly demoralized. Drummond's first work was to establish confidence in the administration of justice and inspire respect for law. Extraordinary powers he disliked and disclaimed. Coercion, he believed, to be demoralizing, alike to the subject and to ruler. But implicit obedience to the ordinary law he was determined, as far as in him lay, to exact, and from all parties. That Drummond was entirely successful in the restoration of social order in Ireland cannot be asserted. He did all, perhaps, that even-handed administration could effect. But he was not master of the legislative machine at Westminster, nor could he by a stroke of the pen work a revolution in the economic conditions of the people whom he ruled. All that man could do he did. He urged upon his superiors the pressing need of agrarian legislation, and he worked with superhuman energy to develop the industrial resources of the country. In popular imagination Drummond lives, as the author of the famous aphorism, now happily a commonplace, Property has its duties as well as its rights, a reminder originally addressed to the magistrates of Tipperary. But his rule was brief. Worn out with labors physical and mental, Thomas Drummond died in 1840. To say that he made mistakes is merely to affirm that he was human. Overhaste is the common fault of the idealist. Idealist and overhasty Drummond was. Nevertheless, his rule is a bright chapter in the sombre volume of Irish history. While Drummond was toiling in Dublin, the Melbourne government was industriously occupied in ploughing the sands at Westminster. The situation was no doubt difficult for the ministers, and especially for Lord John Russell. They had come into power on the principle of appropriation. Footnote that is, the appropriation of the surplus revenue of the Irish established church in Ireland to secular purposes. End footnote. O'Connell, who kept them in power, had declared that that one word was worth the whole bill. To drop appropriation would have been hardly decent. To carry it through the House of Commons was difficult. To carry it through the House of Lords was soon found to be impossible. Bill after bill was rejected in the latter house. Ministers might storm, the peers smiled. 
they were in an impregnable position for behind them was the solid body of english opinion the whigs depended upon o'connell the conservatives relied upon england under these circumstances to fill up the cup is only to drink to political disaster apart from appropriation morpeth might have carried a satisfactory tithe bill in eighteen thirty five all parties had assented to the principles the burden was to be transferred in appearance at any rate from occupier to owner the clergy were to lose some portion of their money but to gain in security not however until eighteen thirty eight were these principles actually embodied in legislation in that year ministers decided on a frank abandonment of appropriation and the house of lords whose victory if temporary was complete passed the bill tithes were henceforth commuted into a permanent rent charge at the rate of seventy five per cent of their nominal value and the large advances made to the clergy in lieu of arrears amounting in all to a million of money were wiped out the act was virtually identical with harding's bill of eighteen thirty five and its passing constituted a humiliating defeat for its authors and a triumph for their opponents the same session witnessed the passing of an irish poor law in ireland as in most roman catholic countries there had been hitherto no legal provision for the relief of the poor but about eighteen thirty the terrible distress existing among the irish peasantry attracted the attention of the imperial parliament various schemes for the amelioration of their lot were proposed and in eighteen thirty three a commission was appointed to inquire into the whole subject language is too weak to describe the appalling state of things which their report revealed the root of the difficulty was the same as that which confronts us in india today. population had multiplied with astonishing rapidity comparatively good government had removed the natural check while the stimulus had been supplied by priests and landlords in three-quarters of a century the population of ireland had nearly trebled for six months out of the twelve one-third of this population or two million three hundred eighty five thousand people were on the verge of starvation something had to be done but what the commissioners recommended a variety of palliatives emigration public works model agricultural schools reclamation of waste bogs and the like but they shrank and herein they were thoroughly representative of irish opinion from a poor law on the english lines the government regarded the report as inconclusive and the recommendations as inadequate they therefore sent over to ireland mr nichols an english poor law commissioner to make further inquiries in six weeks he had presented his report and on that report the government framed their bill the whole country was to be divided into unions each union was to be administered by a board of guardians consisting in part of ex officio in part of elected members for these boards no minister of religion was to be eligible there was to be no law of settlement workhouses were to be erected the workhouse test was to be absolute there was to be no outdoor relief indoor relief was to be given only to the destitute the irish act was the english act of eighteen thirty four stripped of the settlement principle and of outdoor relief for four years it was administered by english officials the act was amended in eighteen forty three and again in eighteen forty seven mainly in an english direction it has never been popular in ireland but on the whole it has achieved a fair measure of success the contents of this chapter afford sufficient evidence that during the first decade of whig rule ireland was seldom far from the surface of english politics but before the irish poor law bill and the tithes commutation bill became law an event of first-rate importance occurred in england on june twentieth eighteen thirty seven william the fourth died the crown of hanover devolved upon his brother the duke of cumberland and that of great britain and ireland upon his young niece princess victoria End of section twelve
Section 13 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 7. The First Years of the New Reign, 1837 to 1841, Part 1. The young princess who was now called to ascend the throne was the only child of her parents. Her father was Edward, Duke of Kent, 1767 to 1820, the fourth son of George III. Her mother was Victoria Mary Louisa, 1786 to 1861, daughter of Francis, Duke of saxe coburg salfeld and widow of the Prince of Leiningen by whom she had a son and a daughter. The Duke of Kent was a man of considerable ability and high character, a keen soldier, and unlike his father and brothers, a robust liberal. He was genuinely interested in the movement for the abolition of slavery, was zealous for popular education, and voted for Catholic emancipation. He died at a comparatively early age, just before his father, in 1820, leaving his widow and infant child in circumstances which were almost straitened. The Duchess of Kent was a woman of strong, not to say stern, character, and brought up her daughter both strictly and well. From her earliest years, the young princess was trained in habits of order, punctuality, obedience, and self-sacrifice. Her education was undertaken largely by the Duchess herself, assisted by Miss Leitzen, the Reverend George Davies, and a large staff of masters for special subjects. Her political education, up to her accession to the throne, she owed mainly to her maternal uncle, Prince Leopold of saxe coburg who, but for the untimely and lamentable death of the Princess Charlotte, would himself have been Prince Consort of England. Footnote, King of the Belgians, 1831, and footnote. But though docile and considerate, the princess from her early years instinctively formed an independent judgment on any question that concerned her. Prince Leopold she regarded as a second father, and the long series of letters which passed between them proves how well her confidence and affection were justified. In 1827, the death of the Duke of York rendered the ultimate succession of the princess almost certain. On the accession of the Duke of Clarence in 1830, she became heir presumptive, and in recognition of this fact, Parliament voted to the Duchess of Kent an extra £10,000 a year. Seven years later, the death of William the Fourth brought the Princess Victoria to the throne. Just eighteen at the time of her accession, Queen Victoria was confronted with a difficult, not to say a perilous, situation. Canada was in rebellion, and the language of contemporaries proves that they regarded its separation from Great Britain as a contingency by no means remote. Ireland was not far removed from the state of Canada, while in England the Chartist agitation was just coming to a head. Worst of all, the position of the monarchy was far from secure. Under George III, the throne was popular but not respected. Under George IV, it was neither. William IV restored its popularity but not its dignity. It was therefore the first task of Queen Victoria to re-establish the monarchy in the affections and respect of her people in general, and in particular to conciliate the support of the middle classes, who since 1832 had become the dominant power in the state. Consequently, it was supremely fortunate that the Queen, by a providential gift of temperament, thoroughly understood the middle class point of view a fact demonstrated in a thousand ways during the next half-century. The young queen was fortunate in the personality of her first minister. Lord Melbourne cannot be counted among the greatest of English statesmen, but he has one supreme title to our gratitude, 
he guided Queen Victoria wisely, gently, and firmly in the paths of constitutional monarchy. The Queen was an apt pupil, but from the first hour of her reign the force of her own personality was apparent in all she did. Her journal of June 20th, 1837, reads thus, At nine came Lord Melbourne, whom I saw in my room, and of course quite alone, as I shall always do all my ministers. He kissed my hand, and I then acquainted him that it had long been my intention to retain him and the rest of the present ministry at the head of affairs, and that it could not be in better hands than his. I like him very much and feel confidence in him. He is a very straightforward, honest, clever, and good man. How fortunate I am, she wrote to King Leopold, to have at the head of my government a man like Lord Melbourne. He is of the greatest use to me politically and privately. The young queen had need of all the help and encouragement which Melbourne could give her. His own position, however, was far from assured. In the general election which ensued, the conservatives still further improved their position, numbering 312 as against 273 in the previous Parliament. England and Wales gave them a clear majority of 20 against the ministers, but Scotland and Ireland redressed the balance. Even with Radicals and O'Connellites, however, the ministerialists could claim only a majority of 34. A short autumn session was devoted to the settlement of the new civil list, the result is of historic significance as marking the climax of that gradual change which had been in progress since the Revolution. Down to that time there had been no discrimination between the revenue of the crown and that of the nation. The institution of the civil list under William III was the first attempt to clear up the confusion. The process then begun was carried further under his successors, the total sum voted to the crown was gradually diminished, but with each diminution the crown was relieved of charges which belonged more properly to Parliament. George II received the hereditary revenues with a parliamentary guarantee that if they fell short of £800,000 a year, the deficiency would be made good by Parliament. George III placed the hereditary revenues for the first time at the disposal of Parliament, and accepted in return the minimum civil list of his predecessor of £800,000 a year. William IV, on his accession, surrendered to Parliament not only the hereditary revenues, but also certain miscellaneous and casual sources of revenue. In return, he received a civil list of £510,000 a year, divided into five departments, to each of which a specific annual sum was assigned. At the same time, the civil list was further relieved of various extraneous charges. The process was completed on the accession of Queen Victoria. The civil list was then fixed at £385,000 a year, distributed as follows. Number one, privy purse, £60,000. Number two, household salaries, etc., £131,260. Number three, royal journeys, etc., £172,500. Number four, royal bounty, £13,200. Number five, unappropriated, £8,040. The Crown still continued to enjoy the revenues of the Duchies of Lancaster and Cornwall, the latter being part of the appanage of the Prince of Wales. All other hereditary revenues were surrendered by the Queen to the nation, and the nation made an exceedingly good bargain. In 1837, the hereditary revenues amounted to less than £250,000 a year. In 1900, they were worth £452,000 a year, more than sufficient to pay the whole civil list. But the arrangement was in reality no less advantageous to the crown than to the nation. The sum voted to the queen proved indeed, in the later years of the reign, inadequate to the maintenance of the royal state, but the crown had its reward. 
increase in national expenditure could no longer be ascribed either to the extravagance of the court or to its desire to exercise illicit political influence. After the settlement of the civil list, Parliament was adjourned until February, but grave news from Canada led to its reassembling on January 16th. For some time past, the condition of Canada had given rise to considerable anxiety. Many causes combined to excite discontent, more particularly in Lower or French Canada, but foremost among them was the constitutional difficulty. To understand this, a brief retrospect is necessary. The Canada which passed under the dominion of Great Britain in 1763 was French. Twenty years later, there was superadded a British Canada, due largely to the immigration of the United Empire Loyalists, the expelled Tories from the colonies, which had cast off the British connection and become the United States. Between French and English, Roman Catholics and Protestants, friction before long arose. This Pitt attempted to assuage in his Canada Constitutional Act of 1791, and for the time being with success. Under this Act, Canada was divided into two colonies, Upper and Lower, Ottawa and Quebec. In each, there was to be a governor, assisted by an executive council and a bicameral legislature, a council of nominees, and an elected House of Representatives. In each, land was set apart for the endowment of the dominant church. For a time, things went well, and in the War of 1812, the Canadians demonstrated their loyalty to Great Britain as they had in the War of American Independence. But the Constitution of 1791 had one crucial defect. The executive was in no way responsible to the legislature. This defect, combined with fiscal and ecclesiastical difficulties, ultimately led to the breakdown of the Constitution. In Lower Canada, in particular, there was a prolonged conflict between the Assembly and the Executive. Having no influence in the choice of any public functionary, no power to procure the removal of such as were obnoxious to it on merely political grounds, and seeing almost every office in the colony filled by persons in whom it had no confidence, the Assembly had recourse to that ultima ratio of representative power, to which the more prudent forbearance of the Crown has never driven the House of Commons in England, and endeavoured to disable the whole machinery of government by a general refusal of the supplies. In Upper Canada, the same root difficulty existed, but not being complicated by racial differences, it presented itself in a less accentuated form. Led by a young Frenchman, Louis J. Papineau, a vain and self-seeking rhetorician, the French party in Lower Canada raised the standard of independence, 1837. A party in Upper Canada, led by William Lyon Mackenzie, followed suit. In both colonies, the rebellion was ultimately suppressed without difficulty, but not before it had compelled the attention of the home government to the menacing condition of affairs in British North America. Hitherto, the English ministry had been disposed to minimize its significance. Early in 1838, however, they decided to suspend the Canadian Constitution and to send out Lord Durham as High Commissioner. From a personal point of view, Durham's mission to Canada was a fiasco, but the report in which he embodied his views of the problem and prescribed remedies for its solution is the most valuable state paper ever penned in reference to the evolution of colonial self-government. Lord Durham recommended the union of the two provinces, an increase in the numbers of the Legislative Council, a civil list for the support of the officials, a reform of municipal government, and above all, that the colonial executive should be made responsible to the colonial legislature. We are not now to consider the policy of establishing representative government in the North American colonies, 
that has been irrevocably done. The Crown must consent to carry on the government by means of those to whom the representative body has confidence. And again, the responsibility to the united legislature of all officers of the government, except the governor and his secretary, should be secured by every means known to the British Constitution. The governor should be instructed that he must carry on his government by heads of departments in whom the united legislation shall repose confidence, that he must look for no support from home in any contest with the legislature except on points involving strictly imperial interests. Durham's report is rightly regarded as the Magna Carta of colonial self-government. The home government accepted frankly and unreservedly the principles it enunciated and made it the basis of their policy. But unfortunately for himself, Durham was less circumspect in action than sagacious on paper. He had hardly set foot in Canada, May of 1838, when he outraged local feeling by the appointment of new and untried men to his executive council. That there was something to be said for a fresh start, for a council free from the influence of all local cabals, is undeniable, and Charles Buller has said it well. The proceeding was not an excess of the dictatorial powers with which Lord Durham was endowed, but that three out of four councillors should be his own private secretaries was regarded as an abuse of them, and worse was to come. On June 28th, the dictator issued an ordinance proclaiming an amnesty for all who had taken part in the late rebellion, with twenty-three exceptions. Of these, eight who had pleaded guilty of high treason, were exiled to Bermuda, and fifteen others, including Papineau, who had fled from Canada, were forbidden to return to it on pain of death. A loud outcry against these high-handed proceedings arose both in the colony and at home. The deportation of criminals to Bermuda was illegal, and the imperial government therefore decided to disallow the ordinance though they accepted a bill to indemnify the author of it. Lord Melbourne was aghast at Lord Durham's indiscretion. His conduct, he wrote to the Queen, has been most unaccountable. But to censure him now would either be to cause his resignation, which would produce great embarrassment and might produce great evil, or to weaken his authority, which is evidently most undesirable. Durham was deeply hurt at the disallowance of the ordinance, and in the proclamation announcing its disallowance, he justified his own conduct and censured that of the ministry at home. Having thus added to his original indiscretion, he determined to resign. On November 1, 1838, he left Canada, and on landing at Plymouth, he boasted that he had effaced the remains of a disastrous rebellion. As a matter of fact, there was some recrudescence of insurrection in both provinces immediately after his departure, but Sir John Colburn suppressed it with the loss of 45 British soldiers killed and wounded. The Durham Report was published in 1839, and the government, both in administration and legislation, acted forthwith upon its recommendation. To Poulet Thompson, Lord Sydenham, who succeeded Lord Durham as Governor-General, Lord John Russell wrote thus, Your Excellency must be aware that there is no surer way of earning the approbation of the Queen than by maintaining the harmony of the executive with the legislative authorities. In 1840, the Union Act was passed. It provided for the Union of Ontario and Quebec, for a Parliament of two chambers, a legislative council of not fewer than twenty persons nominated by the Crown for life, and an elected House of Representatives, and for a civil list. Of the responsibility of the executive there was, curiously enough, no mention. The English practice was implicitly presupposed, but not until the governorship of Lord Durham's son-in-law, Lord Elgin, was the principle explicitly affirmed. In 1847, formal instructions were sent to the governor, 
to act generally on the advice of the executive council and to receive as members of that body those persons who might be pointed out to him as entitled to be so by their possessing the confidence of the assembly thus was the central doctrine of lord durham's report definitely and finally accepted as the ruling principle of canadian government the same principle has since been extended to all the more important colonies in the british empire lord durham's brilliant but erratic career was closed by death in eighteen forty lord melbourne declared that he was raised one hardly knows how into something of a factitious importance by his own extreme opinions by the panegyrics of those who thought he would serve them as an instrument and by the management of the press the principal author of the reform bill of eighteen thirty two and of the canadian report of eighteen thirty nine whatever his obvious failings can hardly be so lightly dismissed footnote this is not the place for a discussion of the difficult question of the authorship of the durham report wakefield thought it buller wrote it durham signed it represents one estimate End footnote the government of canada was not the only problem which troubled the first years of the queen's reign on may eighth eighteen thirty eight the london working men's association published a summary of their demands in a document subsequently known as the people's charter the points on which they insisted were six annual parliaments manhood suffrage vote by ballot the abolition of the property qualification for members of parliament payment of members according to the wholesome practice of ancient times and equal electoral districts this program was an exact reproduction of that which had been adopted in seventeen eighty by the society for constitutional information a society founded by major cartwright and horne took and patronized by charles james fox chartism though newly baptized was clearly therefore no new thing the matter of chartism said carlyle is weighty deep-rooted far-extending did not begin yesterday will by no means end this day or to-morrow what then was the genesis and meaning of the movement which reached a climax in eighteen thirty eight and eighteen thirty nine chartism said carlyle again means the bitter discontent grown fierce and mad the wrong condition therefore or the wrong disposition of the working classes of england is the condition of the english working people wrong or is the discontent itself mad like the shape it took not the condition of the working people that is wrong but their disposition looking more closely we can discern that the chartist movement represented a mass of accumulated discontent evoked by three causes social economic and political the most serious feature of that day was the entire dislocation of social life due to the rapid increase in the wealth of the middle class and the consequently widening gulf between employers and employed down to the great industrial revolution england had been in a very real sense a community the events of the previous half-century had unhappily dissolved that community and had shattered the human ties which had bound man to man and class to class as a result england had become a mere aggregation of atoms disorganized discontented and antagonistic thus in eighteen forty five disraeli wrote of two nations between whom there is no intercourse and no sympathy who are as ignorant of each other's habits thoughts and feelings as if they were dwellers in different zones or inhabitants of different planets in the picture which he drew in sybil there may have been exaggeration but it was the exaggeration of a truth substantiated from such different quarters as mary barton yeast and alton locke not less serious than the social estrangement was the economic depression of the working classes also due to the industrial changes of the last half century a series of mechanical inventions had given a marvellous impetus to production 
wealth was increasing with unprecedented rapidity, foreign trade was advancing by leaps and bounds, but the artisans and laborers complained that for them things were not better but worse, that trade was more shifty, employment less constant, that wages were stationary or falling, and that food was getting dearer day by day. There was wealth in abundance and created, as they thought, mainly by their labor, and yet many of them were starving. The problem seemed to be inscrutable. In the midst of plethoric plenty, the people perish. End of section 13. Section 14 of England Since Waterloo by John Arthur Ransom Marriott. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Pamela Nagami. Chapter 7. The First Years of the New Reign, 1837 to 1841, Part 2. But this was not all. Chartism had yet another side. Primarily, indeed, it was a political movement due to the disappointment of the working classes at the limited scope of the Reform Bill of 1832. For the Reform agitation, Chartists had, as we have seen, supplied the driving power. They looked not unnaturally for some share of the political spoils. They got nothing out of the Reform except the lever for future agitation. Hence, when the anti-corn law movement was inaugurated by Villers and Cobden and Bright, it was denounced by the Chartist leaders as a middle-class maneuver. If you give up your agitation for the Charter to help the free traders, said Thomas Cooper, they will not help you get the Charter. Don't be deceived by the middle classes again. You helped them get their votes, but where are the fine promises they made to you? and now they want to get the Corn Laws repealed, not for your benefit, but for their own. We need not inquire as to the justice of the indictment. The words sufficiently indicate the temper of the Chartists and explain the nature of their demands. Those demands, as we have seen, were exclusively political. That they were stimulated by Lord John Russell's declaration in 1837 that the Whigs meant the Reform Bill to be a final settlement is certain. It was a challenge to which the Chartists responded from a hundred platforms. Great meetings were held at Birmingham, Manchester, and elsewhere with the result, almost inevitable in such movements, that the leadership fell into the hands of the more violent party. Early in 1839, a national convention met in London, and then the schism between the moral force and the physical force Chartists reached a climax. Some of the moderates withdrew, and the lead was definitely assumed by men like Stevens and Fergus O'Connor, who were determined to attain their objects at the cost, if need be, of armed insurrection. Meanwhile, a monster petition embodying five out of the six points, was presented to the House of Commons, June 14, 1839, by Mr. Thomas Atwood, one of the members for Birmingham. A month later, July 12th, the House refused even to consider it. Once more, Lord John expounded the Whig view as to the finality of the Reform Bill and taunted the Chartists, not unjustifiably, with demanding constitutional revision as a prelude to communism. There had already been serious rioting in Birmingham on July 4th, and three days after the refusal of the House to consider the petition, it was resumed on a more menacing scale, July 15th. Still more serious was the outbreak among the Monmouthshire miners in the autumn. Irritated by the arrest of Henry Vincent, the Chartist Demosthenes, and the harsh treatment meted out to him in Monmouth jail, the miners determined on his forcible release. Led by John Frost, an ex-mayor of Newport, who had been lately dismissed from the magisterial bench for seditious speeches, the miners planned an attack on the town in prison. 
the attack miscarried the rioters were dispersed by a few dozen soldiers and special constables thirty chartists were killed many were wounded and their leader frost and two companions were arraigned for high treason were convicted and sentenced to be drawn hanged and quartered the sentence was commuted to one of transportation for life and frost was permitted in eighteen fifty six to return from van diemen's land to england by that time even the echoes of the chartist riots had passed away the disastrous fiasco of the battle of newport marked the collapse of physical force chartism the petition was presented again to the house in eighteen forty two and for a third time presented and rejected in eighteen forty eight in the latter year the moral force party were the victims of a fiasco not less signal than that which eight years before had arrested the physical force movement chartism was literally laughed out of court nevertheless carlyle was right the matter of chartism will by no means end this day or to-morrow of their political program most of the points have been already attained and already political power has been employed for the adjustment of those economic and social conditions in which from the first chartism found its nidus the chartist agitation was only one of the many embarrassments by which the melbourne ministry was beset the anti corn law league came into being under the leadership of villers and cobden in eighteen thirty nine the radicals and tory socialists spared no efforts to foment the agitation against the new poor law bastilles the repeal movement was definitely inaugurated in ireland in eighteen forty but it was a colonial question which actually led to their resignation the abolition of colonial slavery naturally created friction between the west indian planters and the home government in april eighteen thirty nine the government introduced the bill to suspend the constitution of jamaica for five years and to vest dictatorial powers in a governor and two or three commissioners the bill was carried only by a majority of five and the ministry feeling it to be impossible to force it through committees announced their resignation to the girl queen the resignation of her first prime minister caused acute pain a fact which she had no mind to conceal either from the outgoing or the incoming ministers but she steeled herself to send for the duke who persuaded her to confide the formation of a ministry to peel both to wellington and peel the queen ingenuously confessed her confidence in lord melbourne who had been to her quite apparent the duke was sympathetic peel seemed to her such a cold odd man she can't make out what he means the queen as she wrote to melbourne don't like his manner after oh how different how dreadfully different to that frank open natural most kind warm manner of lord melbourne peel's lack of sympathy in manners was largely responsible for the difficulty which ensued having succeeded in securing the assistance not only of wellington but of sir james graham and lord stanley he laid a list of his proposed cabinet before the queen and at the same time intimated that it would be necessary to change the household officers including some of the ladies the queen took alarm and flew to melbourne for advice and on it she acted peel insisted that it was essential that he should have that public proof of your majesty's entire support and confidence which would be afforded by the permission to make some changes in that part of your majesty's household which your majesty resolved on maintaining entirely without change that the household officers in parliament should be changed was accepted as axiomatic the queen understood peel to demand in addition that all her ladies should be changed as well this course she conceived to be as contrary to usage as it was certainly repugnant to her feelings as a result the queen declined to give way peel resigned his commission and to the great and undisguised joy of the queen the melbourne ministry was reinstated lord ashley's testimony to the entire good feeling of peel is conclusive 
I am sure that no parent ever felt toward his own daughter a more deep sense of duty and affection than he did toward Queen Victoria. But that the Queen should be surrounded by Whig ladies, relations, and friends of the late ministry seemed to him both unconstitutional and unreasonable. It is now clear that Peel would have been satisfied with some changes. The Queen, as regards the ladies, would have none. On resuming office, the Whig cabinet took the unusual step of putting on record and communicating to the Queen the following minute, that for the purpose of giving to an administration that character of efficiency and stability, and those marks of the constitutional support of the Crown, which are required to enable it to act usefully for the public service, it is reasonable that the great offices of the court and the situations in the household held by members of either House of Parliament should be included in the political arrangements made on a change of administration. But they are not of opinion that a similar principle should be applied or extended to the offices held by ladies in Her Majesty's household. It should be added that it was not long before the Queen learned to give her entire confidence to Peel, and that sixty years later she remarked to Sir Arthur Bigg, her private secretary, I was very young then, and perhaps I should act differently if it was all to be done again. It was no lust for office which brought Lord Melbourne back, but a sheer sense of chivalry, an unwillingness to abandon his sovereign in a situation of difficulty and distress. It was not, as we have seen, a bed of roses to which he returned. In the House of Commons the ministry was palpably weakening. They carried their new speaker, Mr. Shaw Lefebvre, against the Tory nominee, Mr. Gulburn, only by a majority of 18, and during the recess the cabinet was reconstructed. Mr. Charles Grant, who had become Lord Glenelg in 1835, retired from the colonial office. Lord John Russell took his place and was succeeded at the Home Office by Lord Normanby. Lord Clarendon joined the Cabinet as Privy Seal and Lord Morpeth as Chief Secretary. Baring succeeded Spring Rice as Chancellor of the Exchequer, Macaulay, Lord Howick as Lord Secretary, and Henry Labouchere, Pula Thompson at the Board of Trade. But no reconstruction could permanently restore the waning popularity of the ministry. The adoption of penny postage, though provided for in the budget of 1839, redounded not to the credit of the ministers, but of Rowland Hill. The reduction of the stamp duty on newspapers to one penny, 1836, the permission given to dissenters to celebrate their marriages in their own churches, 1836, the abolition of the use of the pillory and the removal of a number of crimes from the category of capital offenses, all these contributed sensibly to social well-being. Even more important was the creation in 1839 of a new committee of the Privy Council to supervise elementary education a measure accompanied by an increase of the grant from £20,000 to £30,000 and by the appointment of inspectors. But the most pressing need, a supply of trained teachers, was not met. Russell did indeed propose the establishment of a government normal school, but the opposition of the church party was so fierce that the proposal was dropped. Even stripped of this clause, the bill was carried only by a majority of two. Less contentious, but not less significant, were two changes calculated, if not designed, to bring members of Parliament more directly under the control of their constituents. In the old Houses of Parliament, destroyed by fire in 1834, there were no facilities for parliamentary reporters. To report speeches made in Parliament was then, as it always had been and still is, a breach of privilege, but the practice had long been tacitly permitted. In the new parliamentary buildings, special provision was made for reporters, and in 1840, legislative protection was accorded to their reports. In 1837, Messrs. Hansard, the printers to the House of Commons, 
were sued by a certain J. J. Stockdale for a libel contained in a parliamentary paper. The courts decided in favor of Mr. Stockdale, and consequently in 1840 an act was passed providing that on the production of a certificate from the Lord Chancellor or the Speaker, certifying that the publication was under the authority of either House, the courts should stay proceedings. Thus the last barrier to the publication of debates was removed. One other step in the same direction was taken in 1836, when the House of Commons for the first time authorized the publication of division lists, an example followed by the Lords in 1857. Not by such achievements, unobtrusive though solid, is the life of a ministry prolonged. In 1840, public interest was largely concentrated on the marriage of the young queen, and in connection with this matter, her Whig friends made more than one blunder. The queen's choice of her cousin, Prince Albert of saxe coburg gotha to be her consort was largely due to the good offices of King Leopold, the uncle of both parties. Prince Albert and his elder brother were invited to visit England in 1836, and the princess wrote ecstatically to King Leopold about the charms of the young prince. On November 23, 1839, the Queen formally announced her engagement to the Privy Council, and on the opening of Parliament, January 16, 1840, repeated the announcement. It was received with mingled feelings by the nation. Everyone sympathized with the Queen in the prospect of a marriage of affection. But there were in some quarters strange misgivings. The ultra-Tories, wrote Stockmar, are filled with prejudice against the prince, and they give out that he is a radical and an infidel. The Whigs committed various inexcusable blunders. In announcing the marriage, they omitted to state the fact that Prince Albert was a Protestant. A foolish turmoil arose in Parliament. Was the prince a Roman Catholic or an infidel? It is difficult to understand Wellington's conduct in this matter, and still more difficult to defend it. But not less indefensible was the blundering of the ministers. Stockmar had satisfied them as to the facts, and they had simply neglected to pass on the assurance to Parliament. With equal folly and carelessness and in defiance of the express advice of Stockmar, they avoided an understanding with the opposition leaders as to the amount of the prince's annuity. The ministers proposed £50,000, the sum enjoyed by the Queen's consort of George II, George III, and William IV. Colonel Sibthorpe, an ultra-Tory, moved to reduce it to £30,000. He was supported by the Radicals and by Peel, and carried his motion by a majority of 104. This was a serious rebuff to the ministry and a source of profound and natural annoyance to the Queen. A third difficulty remained. The Queen wished her husband to have the title and precedence of King Consort. The ministers insisted, perhaps rightly, on following the precedent of Queen Anne's reign, but in the bill for the naturalization of the prince a clause was inserted giving him precedence on all occasions next after the queen. Again the Whigs were likely to suffer defeat, and again for lack of preliminary negotiations with their powerful opponents. Stockmar, acting as the prince's representative, insisted that further rebuff must be avoided. The clause was withdrawn, and the Queen subsequently bestowed precedence on the Prince by an order in Council. On February 10th, 1840, the marriage took place in St. James's Palace with great splendor and amid every sign of popular approbation. Later in the year, an act was passed, unopposed, save by the Duke of Sussex, naming the Prince Regent should the Queen die leaving issue. The life of the Whig ministry was ebbing fast, but they suffered as much for their virtues as their sins. Nothing in their career did them more honor than the Poor Law and the Factory Act. But the former was denounced as inhumane alike by Radicals and Tories, 
while the latter alienated the liberal manufacturers. Nor did they derive much credit from their Irish policy. From the Irish peasant it evoked little gratitude, and among the English middle classes it created mistrust. Moreover, the country now enjoyed the luxury of an alternative. The old Tory party had reeled for a time under the shock of 1832. Thanks, however, to the masterly sagacity and patient skill of Peel, the phoenix of conservatism arose before long from the ashes of Toryism. The Tamworth Manifesto, conceived with admirable judgment, had reassured the country and reconstructed the party. Not since 1835 had the Whigs been really masters in their own house. Six weary and humiliating years of office they had endured, but without tasting the sweets of power. To what a position had they now come? The right honorable member for Tamworth, said Mr. Leader, the liberal member for Westminster, governs England. The honorable and learned member for Dublin governs Ireland. The Whigs govern nothing but Downing Street. Their Irish taskmaster had extorted a modicum of legislative work and in return had been loyal to the compact, but his patience was exhausted and his own foothold insecure. It was otherwise with Peel. His position was improving every day. For years past, he had held the Whigs in the hollow of his hand. Except for the Queen's natural reluctance to part with her ladies, the Whigs would have been ousted in 1839. Lord Melbourne's chivalry induced him to resume the irksome task, but the final release was now at hand. The bill for the removal of the Jews' civil disabilities, though it passed the Commons, was rejected in the Lords. The government was defeated on the budget in May, and at the beginning of June, Peel carried by a majority of one a vote of no confidence. The government appealed to the country, the elections went heavily against them, and on the assembling of the new parliament, amendments to the address were carried against the ministry in both houses, in the Lords by 72, in the Commons by 91. In Ireland, O'Connell's party was shattered. Barely a dozen repealers regained their seats, and not a single recruit was found. O'Connell lost his seat in Dublin, his son was defeated in County Carlow. On August 30th, the Whig ministers announced their resignation, and the Queen entrusted the formation of a new government to Sir Robert Peel. With characteristic chivalry and good sense, Lord Melbourne strove to reconcile the sovereign to her new ministers. His success may be counted as his final act of service to his Queen and country. He led the opposition in the House of Lords until in October 1842 he was prostrated by a stroke of paralysis. In 1846 he was sufficiently recovered to attend a meeting of peers at Lansdowne House, and though personally opposed to the repeal of the Corn Laws and moved to profound indignation by Peel's conversion, he advised the peers not to oppose repeal. He suffered a transient pang of disappointment at being left out of the Russell ministry in 1846, but his health, as he himself acknowledged, was unequal to office, and in 1848 the end came. His work was done. To him the Queen had served her political apprenticeship. Never forgetful of the lessons he taught, she had now found advisers who were worthy of the confidence she reposed in them. Among these, the most constant was naturally Prince Albert. Of his judgment, temper, and discretion, Melbourne formed the highest opinion, and on relinquishing office he felt a great consolation and security in the reflection that he left the Queen in a situation in which she had the inestimable advantage of such advice and assistance. He had the further satisfaction before his death of seeing the new reign fairly launched upon a voyage if not of unruffled calm, at least of unprecedented prosperity. End of section 14